Hi, this is Regina Y. Favors with the theme of Setback and Interview with the Hitman, which was released in 2012. And so I want to look at understanding how a character's narrative history frames plot setbacks and give special uh, attention to attachment theory, which is a psychology concept. And so the interesting thing about this film that I noticed after watching it probably two or three times is that the main character, whose name is Victor, walks through a lot of doors from uh, childhood to adulthood until he is finally um, assassinated by his lover. And so I thought that was interesting. I We're still going to uh, discuss the theme of setback, but I want to look at how the character's narrative history, his background leading to adulthood, uh, frames the setbacks that the writer-director plots. And the way that the writer-director plots these setbacks is through flashbacks. So we are introduced to the character of Victor as a child, then we are pushed forward to him as an adult, then we flash back to him as a child again, and then we get other elements of him as an adult uh, when he um, is operating as an assassin under assignments, also when he meets his lover, Bethesda, and then when he is forced to eliminate some of the other assassins who were hired or who were expected to kill him. And so I thought it was very interesting to focus on the doors aspect in terms of looking at the uh, the switch in timelines, um, the plot development in terms of that uh, central character of Victor, and then of course his narrative history, how that is plotted throughout the movie. So the writer-director is Perry Bandal. So I, I feel like he did a very good job with this uh, film. I am not offering a critique, however. I am offering a film analysis. So this is theme of setback, an interview with a hitman. Um, understanding how a character's narrative history frames plot setbacks with special topic on attachment theory. Um, please like the video, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notification button if you are interested in further topics. Again, theme of setback and interview with the hitman, understanding how a character's narrative history frames plot setbacks with special topic on attachment theory. This film analysis is subject to fair use. And so let's get into the plot summary. So Interview with the Hitman explores Victor's, and he is played by Luke Goss, who also played in Blade 2, Hellboy 2, Death Race 2, and One Night with the King. Victor's narratives as a professional Romanian hitman who is interviewed by a disgraced film director eager to regain some semblance of his career and respectability. Victor begins the interview with how he became an assassin, who he worked for, the betrayal from his mentor, and how he met Bethesda. Victor thrives as a hitman until he is forced to make decisions that are counter to his initial goal of becoming a mob enforcer, later desiring to get out of the business, fall in love, and raise his own child. He makes a series of decisions that reveal a change of heart. However, he is prevented from accomplishing his, de his desire coming full circle to the root of his first kill. Victor's narrative leads to discovery of his mortality. By the end of interview with the hitman, Victor involuntarily leaves a legacy for his unborn son. So here are your learning objectives. By the end of this discussion, you will be able to do the following. So summarize the plot, outline Victor's roles as child, mob enforcer, lover, and father. Create character description, descriptions of the main character and one or more supporting characters. Define attachment theory, apply one or more attachment examples to Victor, and then apply the theme of setback to one or more frame analysis. So remember, we're looking at this frame by frame. This particular film analysis does not utilize um, film clips due to 
trademark and copyright restrictions. So we're only going to look at a frame by frame analysis. Also, the subsequent learning objectives relate to uh, the seven stages of setback that I that I outline in my book, Overcoming Setback: Five Keys for Exiting for Entering and Exiting Correction, which I will uh, place on Amazon August 2021. And so the seven stages are missed opportunity, punishment, pain, correction, recovery, restoration, and advance. And these are the seven stages to get you out of setback. Many times we tend to uh, survive. We live in survivor's mode, but we don't have as a vision overcoming the setback. That means getting out of it, crossing the finish line. So missed opportunity, punishment, pain, correction, recovery, restoration, advance. These are all the seven stages that will help you to uh, look at your missed opportunity, what was the missed opportunity in terms of maybe an instruction or an actual opportunity, and then the punishment you felt, the pain that resulted from that, the correction process, which can take longer than pain, even though when we are in pain, we tend to think it takes longer. The recovery is recovering from that bad thinking, right, concerning that missed opportunity. Restoration is that uh, time, that season where you need a mentor, and then advance, that that forward and continuous movement. I think people stay in setback because they don't have a vision to advance beyond setback. If you have a person who is in prison, they are in setback. And if you have a person who exit prison all the time and come back and forth, you know, go back and forth in prison, they are in a perpetual setback. And so, uh, and then of course, if you have someone who is in prison for life, that is your life setback. So these are your seven stages we will explore at the end of this film analysis. So I wanna get into the narrative structure, the three plots before we get into the analysis. So I feel like there are three main plots and they relate to Victor. But in thinking about Bethesda's decision to set up Victor, um, that might actually be also the main plot. So the three main plots is Victor's decision to become a mob enforcer. He does that from a child. Victor's decision to attack the system that raised him. So um, he has a change of heart later in the film to the point that uh, when he is betrayed, he has to, has to go out on a run, has to go on a run, and then um, he positions himself to be an enforcer for another boss, but then later changes his mind and says he can't risk it. And then after that, um, um, more betrayals. And he, I think he changes his mind about the system when he, um, he meets Bethesda. And so Victor's decision to trust Bethesda is one of those main plots that really turns the whole plot on his head because we, we will learn later that Bethesda has set up Victor this whole time and that she's the one who uh, reveals the fact that he's still alive and uh, sells him out to um, um, his previous mob boss, his previous my boss and then and then this all comes ahead at the end of the movie when she shoots him so then Bethesda's decision to set up Victor the interviewer the interviewer's brother and any and all related mob members responsible for the death of her family is a plot in which the whole movie hangs and because it's because we get Victor at the beginning, we we just automatically assume that it's really about him. But you could argue that it is also about Bethesda. So I feel like there are three main plots, but I also think that the uh, plot by Bethesda to set up Victor and everyone related uh, and contributed to the death of her uh, family could also be a possible main plot. So this is analyzing interview with a hitman using setback as a theme. So we get this image first of a gun, and this is young Victor holding a gun. 
and um, he is about to shoot. Uh, he's already, by the time we get this image here, he's already shot the father. Uh, he's shot the wife and he's on his way and he's in the process of shooting the uh, two young girls, which he does not shoot. But I thought this image of the gun of the young boy, of a young boy holding the gun and making a decision to shoot two young people who, who look like him in terms of age, that he will be okay to point a gun at them. Uh, not understanding the full implications, you could say that when when the father makes fun of him and mocks him for being a mob enforcer at his young age to come and get the money that he owes to uh, the mob, uh, he mocks him and says, who are you, you know, essentially to, uh, to come here and enforce any money out of me, laughs at him, then you could, you could reason that, okay, he shoots at the uh, the father, pulls the gun, and um, that's his way of getting back at him. But it was the wife who was trying to reason with her son, I mean, with her husband, about the money that he owed. And he, she was sort of like the person who was the uh, peacemaker in that moment, and he still shot her. So that lets you know on some level that, uh, of course, he is immature, immature in his thinking. But... Um, but a mob enforcer doesn't have uh, the wherewithal or the care or concern uh, to say, well, just because the wife is on my side and trying to get the money out of her husband to pay me, I shouldn't kill her. He's a mob enforcer. And regardless of whether uh, he can be sympathetic to one or more parties in this moment is really beside the point. And that's why you're going to see that this very immature young man is willing to kill the father, willing to kill the, the mother or the wife, and willing to kill the kids. But when he gets older, his heart changes. He's not, he may pour in a gun, but he's not so uh, willing to, um, to pull the trigger. There are some people that he does pull the trigger on because of their betrayal. And, he, and, and, and it's almost like he has no choice but to pull the trigger. But in this regard, but in other regards, he says, okay, I'm not going to pull the trigger because he's having a change of heart. Bethesda is uh, pregnant. Um, he loves her. And he's looking to get out of the system. And so we have this aim. Uh, again, this is a young boy, immature. He doesn't have the logic or the emotional wherewithal. I do think on some level that there should be some sympathy in him, uh, considering that they they probably represent the same ages, maybe one or two years older than each other. But it's interesting that he will pull a gun and hold it up to her head just without any real thought as a child. And the director sort of has him, has Victor to pull the trigger, but not shoot and so and and he's only really stopped by the major players who come in and basically stop him so here's victor in terms of his youth um there is no real emotion you know he has on this leather jacket that you will see him in um something like this as an adult but there's no emotion. He's he's learned how to hold the gun, aim the gun. That has been the extent of his preparation. And you will see um, when he gets older what Sergey, his mentor, teaches him about um, infiltration, uh, eaves eavesdropping, preparation, elimination, etc. But this is this is the um, mob enforcer who starts out as young as a child preparing or getting ready to shoot another child and so here's this face right here and we will find out that this is really um, uh, another person we don't know for certain if this is Bethesda as a child because when she gives her parable at the end she basically suggests that um, 
one, uh, um, her sister was the one who couldn't take the sexual appetites of men, but she was strong enough to learn the ways of men. So we don't know if this is the sister or if this is actually Bethesda, but we do know that it had an impact on her. This whole experience had an impact on her to the point that she just trained herself and learned the ways of men to, until she was able to, uh, to get her vengeance. And so this is uh, Victor pulling back the trigger, and he's all, and he's literally on his way to shooting this young girl without much, um, much resistance to it. He has to be pulled back instead of pulling the trigger. Before we will know if Victor is going to shoot the young girl, uh, the other child we get the the opening credits of the movie. And so here it is, we have the actor Luke Goss and he's coming in into an airport uh, with a suit. Um, interesting that he doesn't have a tie that I would think that anyone who is sort of uh, wound as tightly as he is in the movie, that he would always be dressed. He would always have a tie. He would always be sort of sharp. Here, he looks like a businessman. He doesn't look like a hit man in a sense that we would think that he would be a hitman. No, we just see him as a person with other people coming through an airport um, and getting ready, I guess, to do business. So he's in a bathroom, in a restroom, and he's taking off his jacket, his uh, suit jacket, and he's gonna change in to some street clothes. The interesting thing I think about Victor as an adult, you know, that same blank face that he has as, as a child, he maintains throughout the film. It isn't until he really, I'll say his face, his blank face changes when Sergei betrays him and attempts to kill him. And then we see some emotion. And then it returns to maybe a focused half blank face when he's trying to become another mob enforcer for another person. And then that face changes again when he meets Bethesda or helps Bethesda. But it's interesting that his face here is basically just a uh, adult um, grown up face from when he was a child. So he has changed into his street clothes. So he's changed from being on an airplane to now on a train. And um, he's now going to, it doesn't seem like he's, it seems like he's just a regular everyday person, which is possibly the disguise. You know, when he comes to the airport, he, he has on a business suit. So not, so as to not draw too much attention to him. Well, he needs to look like the people who are, you know, going about their day every day. And so no hitman, of course, is going to look like a hitman or should look like a hitman. But basic clothes, jeans, um, shirt, um, leather jacket, shoes, etc. cetera. Um, and then some sort of bag that's, sling off, that's hanging from his um, arm. It's just your just your basics. You don't need a long sort of suitcase or anything like that because you know you're not going to be here that long. So then we have a uh, cut to this man, this older gentleman. He was in a car. He's um, trying to figure out what's going on. He's he's gotten out of the car and he's about to walk um, across the field. We don't know who he is. We don't know what purpose he's going to serve. I can tell you right now he's going to be the interviewer, but there's a lot more to him that we will uncover throughout the film analysis. I think it's important to pay attention to age because he's the interviewer who is looking for a way to um, bring back some sort of respectability. He was disgraced. We don't really know why I don't get a sense that we know why 
he was disgraced. He might have been caught in an in an uncompromising situation. After all, he and his brother are the ones who sort of um, the film doesn't say he raped Bethesda and her sister, but Bethesda and her sister were put to service, to were put to work. And we know from Sergey uh, when he's trying to get um, uh, the money from a person he owes, he tells him that if you don't give me the money you owe me, I'm going to put your wife to work. And so we just have to assume that this is probably a sex trafficking ring or uh, men who just use young girls and women to service uh, rich men or other types of men. So age does play a factor a lot of times in the decisions you make because um, he's looking to to come back in a sense or make a comeback, but he's not as as discriminating enough because he wants to interview a hitman. So, you know, he's interviewing a hitman. Who would ever want to go on camera as a hitman? That exposes you. So he's not thinking, he's not paying attention. Why would someone ever agree uh, for me to interview them as a hitman, knowing that they could be exposed, and of course, knowing that they could be arrested. So his thing. So he's so desperate in his um, goal to become a more respectable person that he that he sort of misses the obvious, and so that age is not always um, an indication of wisdom. This is a person who looks desperate is you know desperate to make a comeback but is not really thinking uh long term he's not thinking beyond the minute so he's looking at this red trash can iron based trash can in this beautiful field and he's going to walk to it and it's interesting that it's away from uh, the main road and so it's almost like a lure because now that you are out here, it's, it's hard to uh, say, okay, I'm not going to walk to that trash can. But you feel compelled to see what's actually in it in the same way that you feel compelled to see what's in the hitman and what's in the whole um, ordeal of being a hitman. So again, his age is not always a strong indicator of wisdom because if you walk to that trash can you really don't know you have a you have no true idea what's in that trash can it could be a bomb in that trash can it could be it could be the whole thing could be a setup which we will find out in the film that this actually is a setup so he walks to the trash can he gets the bag out um and it's a trash bag with uh, particular items in it that he's going to uh, rummage through and get instructions for and then we will begin the movie so he pulls out a gun from his ankles from his ankle uh, we have a watch there that's basically telling us time of course but he's sitting in his car holding his gun thinking that whoever is behind all of this is is near so he wants to basically be prepared but the the enemy that he that he's thinking is really not um, his true enemy. The hitman in Victor is not a true enemy. He only becomes an enemy for this man here because of Bethesda. But Victor doesn't really have any grievance with this man. Remember, this man is part of the mob system. You have the drug. Um, drug deals you have the assassinations and then you have the clientele this person is a clientele he represents the clientele just like his brother who also um also does you know something with the girls right and so um abuses them and likely um rapes them right this is a system he represents a system and he shouldn't honestly be afraid of the system that he's in he he shouldn't everyone should carry a gun because they do they are part of the system but 
if he's interviewing with a hitman, why is he so afraid? But it's interesting that Victor Victor is sort of working against the very system that he's supposed to be enforcing because this person represents a client within that system. So then he aims the gun for, I guess, for whatever, you know, practice interesting that is, is contrasted with Victor as a child aiming a gun, right? And so you have to wonder, when did he start aiming a gun? Did he aim a gun also when he was a young child? He seems to be a film, um, a filmmaker, but I think it's maybe porn films or other types of films that, that may not gain universal appeal or they were the types of films and that led to um, him being disgraced and again we don't get a lot of information about that but he has some sense within himself to aim a gun at, whether it's for practice whether it's just to aim but that tells us that there's a narrative history with him that he's that he not only has a gun in his ankle in his ankle, but he's also pulling it out to aim as a way to practice for just in case. So then he reads instructions and the instructions tell him to do certain things. He takes some pills, he put this on his head, and then he falls. Um, whether I don't know if it's asleep or just unconscious, but um, his time in the car ends here. He's he's not dead, but he's going to wake up in a room, I guess an apartment or loft type um, type place, um, wake up confused. So we have a cut to Victor in an elevator, an old fashioned um, elevator. And we don't know if he's contemplating. We don't really know what his purpose is. We still haven't been really introduced to him as a hitman. We don't even know if he is uh, the person who's going to be interviewed by the guy who was in the car. It just looks like two different people in, in, in different areas, one in this, in this building, one in a field. And we don't get any sense he doesn't talk. And he doesn't really speak until he meets with the, with the interviewer. So the man wakes up in a uh, room, uh, confused, doesn't know what's going on. Looks like there's an envelope on the desk, and I'm quite sure he's going to read it. But he's going to walk downstairs, and downstairs will be the inter will be the interviewing camera equipment and some uh, some film DVDs. So this view, I think this shot here is very interesting how the director gives us almost like a um, an outsider's view of this person. He's on his knees. He's looking through the camera equipment. It's interesting that he doesn't come with camera equipment if he's going to be an interviewer. Um, I, 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 we don't know if this comes out of his car, but it's interesting usually if you are... Uh, sort of like a camera type person or these are your tools of trade, you will usually have them near you in the car or you will go to your trunk to check and see if they're still there or something like that. And so we have to assume that these were supplied to him. He's taken off his jacket, is on the couch, so he is getting himself uh, comfortable. And it's interesting that he still, even if these are not his cameras, he understands them enough to set them apart, to prepare them. Uh, and so he knows that he is here for an interview. Also, before he does this, he walks to uh, the door to see if it will open. Or, well, he walks to the door just to open it and then realizes it's locked. So he's locked into this place. In the same way, you can say that he's locked into his career or disgrace, and the only way that he's going to be able to get out of it is to make a decision that is illogical. You know, you come into a place where you were blindfolded or you had to take pills and be unconscious or whatever. It's really unsafe. It's a very, and we don't know how he's transported, 
from the field in the car to how he gets here. We don't know if Victor is the one who does it or if if um, even Bethesda is is he is the one who does it, but he is here and he's locked into a place and that doesn't bother him. That's strange that that doesn't bother him, that I would, if I couldn't open a door, I would try to break a window just, just for the just in case. In the same way that he's carrying a gun for just in case, he doesn't think enough to check any of the windows for just in case. So again, he's not operating with a good sense of logic. He's trapped. And, and, and he feels that the only way that he can get out of even his current life trap is to make a decision that could cost him his life. And it's actually going to cost him his life. So then we have a cut to Victor. He's now um, taking things out of the suitcase or, the, or this large bag. And uh, he's he doesn't appear to be OCD or obsessive compulsive, but he does lay out his clothes as if he could be. We could argue that he is a person who's very, very focused on the task, uh, focused on the assignment. And for him, this is an assignment to meet with the interviewer. The interesting thing is when we get to the end of the movie, we're going to talk about his different assassin assignments or what I like to call or label task management that um, he lays out the clothes and um, but this assignment that he's on right now is really not an assignment from a mob boss. In some ways, it's not an assignment from himself. This is where I think when we get to the end and we find out that it's really Bethesda who's been arranging all of this, that really when he lays out his clothes, this is not him laying out his clothes on his own personal initiative. This is really Bethesda managing him that he's going to put on the uh, the jogging uh, pants and um, hoodie and he's going to uh, pretend like he is a piece of man to shoot the brother of the interviewer that we just met or just saw. And so when you're thinking about tasks or assignments, Usually he receives his assignments from Sergey or he receives him his assignments from the new mob boss that he's interested in serving. And uh and it's mainly them telling him what to do. And Bethesda is now telling him what to do. We're not gonna see that again until the end of the movie. But I thought it was interesting because I thought all this time that he was the one who was really in control and that he's never really been as in control as it at as the film um, uh, suggests that he is. So we're gonna see that now. He's in the jogging gear and he's actually preparing to surveil the area. So he's pretending that he's a jogger. And these are kind of like actor clothes. Now he could be a jogger in real life as an assassin, but these are actors clothes because if you're gonna go out in the field in a sense or in the area, you gotta look like the people who are in the area. So he has headphones, he has a hat on and he has jogging clothes so he can blend in. And that's one of the um, tools of the trade that Sergey um, teaches him to blend in. So he looks like he's blending in. So we get the back of him going through this, I guess, uh, tunnel and uh, he's jogging. And I wonder sometimes when we uh, look at Victor and his back, um, how much um, he has been holding on his back. You know, he still has his childhood to contend with um, that we still haven't gotten into. And he has the betrayal, you know, but you have to keep running. Even if, and, and he actually had to run in the movie 
um, when he's betrayed and he has to fake his death. So this back shot that I think is very important to consider because a lot of people who make a decision to become an assassin or choose any sort of life of crime, they do so with the idea of sort of having a monkey on their back or they do so with the idea of carrying something on their back. And at this point, we know, or we're going to find out much later in the film, that it's really, he's propelled or he's compelled to make things right for Bethesda. So uh, when he is working for Sergey or working for Trafficant or working for Franco or anybody else, you don't see him jogging. You don't see him uh, changing his clothes. You don't see him acting out a role or a part or trying to blend into the environment. So this dress that you see here, this garb that, that you see here, almost like a theater actor, uh, this is all for Bethesda. This is not for any of the people that he has served uh, before. He never looked like the jogger for them but he's looking like a jogger for Bethesda. So we have a cut to a very nice, clean, white image that we don't see. We move from dark to light, right? And that when he is with Bethesda, his, his eyes look different. His, um, um, his disposition is different. His Facial features look different. They look wider. They look like, he looks like he wants to smile. He looks like he wants to be sympathetic. He, he, he looks like he wants to care. But pay attention to the idea of moving from dark to light. And that the irony is, is that the person who is setting him up, that, that, that who he's lying in the bed with right now is actually dark. That for her to set this whole thing up as a way to take vengeance reveals her dark heart. But when we see them in bed together, it doesn't look like that. It looks like sunlight. It looks like insight. It looks like new wisdom. It looks like new discernment. It looks like hope. It looks like movement forward. But he doesn't realize lying in his bed, uh, letting down his guard, that he's actually moving backwards, that she has set this up so much to the point that, that that very gun that he was holding towards that young girl is the same girl, possibly, who's in the bed with him now. So we see Bethesda here. Um, um, she, as a character, we only see her looking at him and we see her sort of maybe complimenting uh, or being complimentary to him. We don't see much of anything else in terms of um, the negative aspects of the relationship. It just looks like maybe like a traditional relationship where two parties are in love with you, in love with each other. We wouldn't necessarily think that this is the same Bethesda who's going to dress up for the assassin. Uh, the, the assassin, the assassination for the moment. And so this Bethesda here looks like a person that he met, he fell in love with, she's going to get pregnant, and he's going to want to leave the mob for her. And he looks at her uh, with great intent. Uh, and usually when, when men are in this mode, they are looking to protect. So when you see him in that running outfit, running garb, He's thinking if I don't sort of help her or sort of make sure all of her enemies are done for good, they may come after her again. In the same way that when he was in a restaurant and, and those three guys come in and they take her to the back to abuse her and he has to make a decision to either leave out the restaurant or go back and help her, he, he has that image in mind. That's how they actually get to know each other as an adult, as, as adults. He had finished a kill. He's in a restaurant, drinking from a drink. She comes in, uh, sits at a table near him, maybe two tables down, looks at him. He doesn't really look at her other than the glance at one time when she's sitting down. 
and um and then the three guys come in and they attack her and they take her to the back likely to rape her abuse her and not knowing that that was a setup too that all of that was part of the setup and so you see the 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 maybe the fright in him the fear the fright in him to want to protect her and so we don't know if they are making a decision about meeting with the interviewer or taking out his brother or anything like that we don't know that but we we see a lot on his face and his face tells a lot about um impending danger you know uh, trying to take out our enemies, making sure that we are secure and safe, that we can go on ahead and live our lives together. So we have him still running, right? And um, the kind of running that he's doing is, is, there's a lot of distance between where he started and where, and where he's going to surveil. And so um, that makes a lot of sense in terms of um making sure that you blend into the environment maybe the place that he's going to could be a very uh, expensive area it could be in a very expensive area or it could simply just be his strategy to um position himself in a different area so that he's not perceived as anything other than a person who is residing in a hotel or in an apartment or or something like that but this gives him time to think this running that he does from and and it started out from uh, almost night i guess late afternoon to now evening to almost night this gives him time to think so by the time we get him shooting the brother uh he has already met bethesda in that in that restaurant he has already um fell in love with her found out that she's pregnant likely will want to marry her so he he has started something that he has to finish that he has no other choice but to finish you're going to hear sergey and uh cesar his childhood friend who are sent to kill him uh to kill victor say that they have no other choice they had to do it if they didn't adhere to the boss's command to kill victor then they would have been killed themselves and so in the same way he has no other choice but to take out this this interviewer's brother because he knows too much it's not like victor and Bethesda can go on and go get them a townhouse and live their lives and and uh, be free. They know too much, and these are probably people who have who are in positions of power who can really do some damage to them. So when you see him running, it's this feeling that I have no other choice. I got to do it. It's the same thing he heard when his betrayers were were sent to kill him. So then when we see uh, Bethesda actually shoot him in the end, it's almost like she's, she's suggesting that she has no other choice. When, re when in reality, she has someone who loves her, who wants to be a father to, her, uh, to their child, who likely wants to marry her, but she sort of says no i have no choice i'm going to uh, to go ahead and do this so this running is not something to take lightly i don't think the the writer director says okay let's just have them run uh when you understand the full uh under when you understand the full film and that by the time we see bethesda and victor together um we get that first but at the towards the middle end of the movie you see them meet for the first time as adults and so we have to just assume that when we see them in a bed together and we see them uh connected and talking or not talking that they have already met so what he's doing here is one of those i have no other choice i have to do it and this is them again so that means that these are different days 
he was on one side of the bed and she was up and now he's on on another side of the bed and she's on another side of uh, uh, the other side of the bed and so that lets you know that their relationship has movement in a strange way their relationship has movement and i mean even when you see him running that's their relationship having movement now it's movement towards killing somebody and um you know setting up the interviewer and killing his brother and then she's setting up the whole thing of course and then killing victor it's movement regardless but you're going to see him look at her back and her back has all the scars from when she was uh, abused and used as a child and the interesting thing is that Bethesda were, uh, represents the system too. She services the clients and it's involuntary, right? Of course, but she services the clients. Now he's the mob enforcer for the larger system. Again, the system is uh, drug dealing, other types of dealing, maybe arms, arms dealing, drug smuggling, um, assassinations when they are necessary of course and then uh, the women that they put to work and then also the clients the high level high value type clients and so he is the mob enforcer or the mafia enforcer for this whole system and he's now uh, sleeping with a client uh, actually a client of someone else so in some ways he's taking the the future revenue from the system because he's not supposed to uh have anybody for himself at least not without permission and you know also not without payment but there's movement in their relationship whether he knows bethesda fully or not and whether she knows him or not and she knows who he is she knows he is the young boy who came into her home and shot her father and shot her mother and the two uh, her and her sister were put to service to service men and be abused by men so when he's looking at her scars he may have some invisible scars from his own childhood because he used to hear his father beat his mom um, so his scars are invisible because he never really spoke much he never really expressed uh, he never really cried until we see him having to shoot Sergey, his mentor. But uh, this movement that they have is a false movement, right? It's 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 a false movement. She, she's you know as a character, she's a very patient uh, character. You know, if I was wanting to take vengeance, I would be sort of impatient and want to take out the person as soon as I could. You know, the guy, the interviewer who was in the field, she could have easily uh, taken him out right there. But then it really wasn't about him the whole time and that it was really about Victor. And she just used Victor to uh, sort of kill him. And then she turns around and kills Victor. So he's looking at her scars, the scars that in some ways he contributed to, even if even if he wasn't the the person who directly abused her, he has contributed in ways. Now we don't know if she tells him that she's part of the larger mob system as a person who has to service men, but he does know that that on some level uh, she may be connected. To that system we don't know if she if he knows that she's connected to trafficking or 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 anybody else who who's who's a mob boss he's the same one who has sergey and another guy come in and take the two young girls and regardless what he has put his hands to and holding a gun and enforcing the dictates of his boss he's looking at the results of that he's holding the results of that he's feeling the scars he's looking at the scars um and on some level he thinks about it he he sort of turns his head about it you know it is something that he considers we don't know if he's completely moved by it but 
we do know that this particular scene here is something that um, kind of bothers him. So we are back to when he is now surveilling the brother's, uh, I guess, apartment with a hoodie. And of course, he's still blended into the uh, environment. And here is the actual brother here. And um, we don't know what the brother does. We just know on some level he must have some influence. If there's a need to take him out, he must have some influence. Um, because we don't see Victor taking out everyone who has hurt Bethesda. It seems like these are is the interviewer that we see at the beginning of the film and this guy, his brother, who they look alike in a sense. Uh, it's something about these two that um, Victor must take out in a sense, must uh, assassinate. And we know now that it was really Bethesda who's pointing out these two men. So Victor uh, continues his sort of acting role. He's at a courier place, a delivery place, and he's getting a package. And the package is going to be um, clothes and other items. Well, not clothes, but other items that basically suggest that he's a piece of man. And here's the piece of box. And I don't know who, who puts all of this together to mail him a fake piece of box with other types of items so he can look apart. But it's interesting how the system is uh, very organized in this way that he could request a delivery of a piece of box, a fake piece of box with other items so he could look the part in order to be, uh, to be a piece of man to shoot somebody who is a target. So this, this lets you know how organized the system is, how thoughtful they are in terms of uh, their strategies, right? Because the goal is to uh, take the assignment, complete the assignment, and you have to do all that you can to do that. And you don't want a record of calling for a pizza, right? To me, it would have been simple enough just to call for a pizza and then deliver it to that person, right, the pizza that you bought, but then that leaves a record as well. So he's laying out the particular uh, tools that he's gonna use, a gun. Uh, he's um, taking this all apart from a, a particular laptop that he used. But again, this is this laying out that you see when he's laying out his clothes, you know, the jogging clothes. Most people don't really lay out their jogging clothes. They may lay out a, a suit pants and suit jacket and shirt or something like that, socks, underwear, anything that they're going to put together and put on and wear, wear but you don't really lay out your jogging pants, right? So in the same way that he lays out the jogging gear, he's laying out the elements of the gun. Okay. Remember that he does have some practice with uh, a gun, you know, and so uh, he knows all of the components of a gun. So he's wearing the uniform and uh, with matching hat, matching jacket, and then a piece of container. And then, of course, the piece is on the inside of that of that container. And so it's interesting how focused he is on, on, you know, selling this idea. This is a way also of blending into the environment because, you know, you surveil the area to know um, who delivers pizza in this area, right? And so he, this sort of takes some time to determine uh, what type of pizza place. And when the guy opens the door, that means he was expecting a pizza. So if he was expecting a pizza, then this also further means that Victor had studied the area and studied him long enough to know what his pattern was. Because why open the door, right? Especially when it's night like this, I don't open my door, but he thought enough to open the door. And so Victor um, knocks on the door. And then when the brother opens the door, Victor has his silencer, uh, he comes in, and uh, we're going to see an image, uh, the guy asking why, and Victor saying, you know why. 
And this is that image here. And I like the fact that the writer director only focuses on the actor's face and then just half of his face, which kind of signifies to me, you know, the uh, the part decision, the part of the decisions that are in the dark that we sort of make and then the ones that are actually in the light. And so there, by the time he gets to this point in his life, this brother here, uh, how many bad decisions has he made to the point that now he's he's having to be assassinated? And maybe he, it was his other brother who is the interviewer who got him into a lot of the stuff that he got into. But it's interesting, though, that he's now reaching a part of uh, his life, his mortality, where he's being assassinated. Not sort of walking along um, somewhere and someone attacks him and or um, maybe he having a heart attack or just dying of natural uh, causes. He's dying here a tragedy. Being assassinated is a tragedy. And also the fact that he has to be assassinated tells you about the level this man is on, that he has to, most people are not assassinated, they are killed or murdered. For him to be assassinated, he must have been a very important figure who was doing things sort of like, um, not on the down low, but on, but in, um, you know, in those dark areas, you know, that you, that you connect with people who are part of the criminal element and they give you this lot of passcode or key code or something like that. And you meet women and you have sex with women. And we have to, uh, we have to assume that they were having sex because when Bethesda gives the parable at the end about the farmer who had two, uh, uh, had a farm and, um, and because this very important man decided that he wanted to take the farm and, and the farmer refused and then he took the daughters or he took his precious, um, you know, commodities and she talks about the, um, how her sister could not withstand the, the heavy sexual appetites of men, but that she could. She says it from a, 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 a standpoint of being 10 years old. So whatever they did to her and her sister, they did it to them while they were 10 years old. And so how does a person get to that point in life where they are raping a 10 year old, right? So we see him assassinated. There's no recovery. There's no way out of it. He's just gonna be shot. And then Victor takes the ring. He knows that this ring is an identifier. So when he's interviewed um, by the interviewer, the, uh, the brother, and when uh, Victor is about to reveal uh, Bethesda, he gives the interviewer this ring. And so the interviewer know who the ring, to whom the ring belongs. And that's what sort of shakes him and unsettles him. And that really sets the scene for him, uh, for him to hear out Bethesda and then for Victor to, uh, to finally shoot him. But this ring is an identifier. It has an identity. It has a history. We don't know what the history is. I don't remember seeing the ring taken off Bethesda's parents. I remember Bethesda holding a necklace or maybe taking the necklace off her mother. And so um, it's the necklace that she leaves behind for Victor to then uh, contact her. And that sort of sets the scene for them to get together, fall in love, get pregnant, and then for her to betray him as well. But this ring here has an identification. It, 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 it is an identifier. It belongs to a specific person. So then when it's used at the end of the uh, movie, we understand why the interviewer is shaken up and, and why uh, he realizes that Victor has killed him. After all, he's a hitman. Again, 
the interviewer is not working with logic on his side. How, what would you think if a, a person who is interviewing, what do you expect them to do if he's, uh, if the person is a hitman? And so again, this ring is an identification. You don't even, you don't even need his actual identification. The brother knows to whom this ring belongs. So Victor has met his uh, particular task. So he has assassinated the brother and now he's on his way uh, to going back to where he uh, came from. And so this, this time he's taking a bus. So remember he comes in in the movie on an airplane, then he uh, transitions into uh, a train, coming off a train and now he's returning on a bus. How significant it is, I don't know. You know, it could be economic from one thing to the next, from one level, higher level to a lower level. Usually people who take the bus really can't, do not always or cannot always afford the plane. But it also says a lot about not being easily identified because someone could have seen him shoot the guy or pretended to be a pizza man and then saw him shoot the guy, right? And so returning on a bus versus returning on an airplane sort of keeps him under the radar, right? It keeps him, um, it sort of lengthens the time. So by the time you figure out what he's done, uh, it's too late. But I thought it was interesting that he's returning on the bus and it looks like he's, is he returning in his jogging gear? It's hard to uh, tell, but he's in that same hat that he, he was jogging with. He's also in, um, he also has headphones. So I can, I, I don't remember, that looks like the leather jacket that he's been wearing, regardless. He's blending into his environment. So he's a he's now he was he was a uh, airplane rider, he was a train rider, and now he is a bus rider. The only thing I think we don't see him in is in a car. So he's now surveilling the uh, area, the the actual townhouse where the interviewer is, and again. You know, it's interesting, again, the interviewer doesn't think to look to see if, if there are any cameras. He doesn't even really search out the place. He just goes for the camera equipment, sets it all up, but there's nothing in him that suggests, let me look around this place. I mean, after all, I'm in this place by myself. Let me look around it. Versus when you see Victor um, having to be on the run, and trying to meet up with another boss, um, a mob boss, he sort of goes into another person's, uh, I think it's his room, and immediately he searches out if there are any bugs in the room. And so he finds a bug behind the bed, he finds other types of, of you know, surveillance equipment, and then he's able to take out that person and then become, um, or listen to how he can get into uh, the new system that he wants to get into. But this is him surveilling uh, this particular interview, the person who's going to interview him. And the interviewer is just sitting down, waiting, um, not even plotting how he's going to do the interview. There isn't a pen or pad in his hand or anything like that. He's just waiting. And so we see Victor again, um, contemplating maybe how he's going to approach. This room that you see here is I think the very same loft that he and Bethesda are living in uh, because the same color scheme is in a subsequent frame. So maybe Bethesda is sleep somewhere. But again, by the time we see Victor meet with the interviewer, he's already in relationship with Bethesda and and she's already pregnant and and there's already uh, an indication or a suggestion that they're going to stay together. 
So Victor comes to the place. That means that he had a key to the uh, place in order to be there. And then this interviewer comes down. Uh, he is shocked to see Victor, of course. And of course, he's going to be a little reluctant. You know, we don't know. He doesn't know if Victor is going to pull out a gun or something like that. After all, he is a hitman. Victor shows proof that he is the right person who uh, he's supposed to be interviewing as uh, with a um, Polaroid photograph of this interviewer, uh, basically asleep, uh, asleep. So then we still don't know if it is Victor who took the picture. Um, I do remember the guy holding the Polaroid camera um, and he might have taken his own picture. Oh, actually, absolutely, actually he does. He does take his own picture because from a distance we see a flash. A flash that looks like he was he was shot. That's why I thought at the beginning that that um, it was a trap for him and he was shot. No, he was the one who took a picture of himself. And so we have to assume then that Victor was the one who transported him to this apartment and locked him in because here is proof of that picture. And so Victor is ready to um, uh, sit for the interview. So the, so the guy is, he's already set everything up as we understand, as we know. And um, it's interesting that I like this, um, this picture that is a reflection of th this mirror image that is a reflection of the window, that it looks like that window is at the back of the interviewer, which is actually, which is really just the reflection. But it's interesting, again, that he never opens any windows. He never gets any air. He never thinks about moving about the apartment or anything like that. He just sits and waits for Victor to come along. In the same way that you might see Bethesda just timing when she would meet with Victor. So that means if, if, if she's coming into the restaurant and sort of eyeballing Victor, then she must have been surveilling Victor in the same way that he has surveilled his targets, um, assassination targets, she must have surveilled him to know when he would come to that restaurant. I'm not sure if that's the only restaurant in the area, but it is a uh, specific restaurant. And I remember one of the guys who takes her in the back and abuses her when they finally meet, um, saying, why don't you stay or something like, or uh, why don't you stay this time? And I didn't catch that the first two times I watched the movie, but I thought to myself, so, oh, she's been there before. And that got me to thinking about her role. And it still wasn't until the end of the movie that I saw that she set the whole thing up. And I'm, and I, every time I get to the end of the movie, I'm still shocked when she's holding a gun and she shoots Victor. But uh, she must have been surveilling him the whole time, keeping tabs on him. So while he's running around and surveilling other people to assassinate, she was running around and surveilling him to assassinate him. Isn't that interesting to think about that, um, that parallel that she becomes what he is? And she didn't expect, or he didn't expect her to become what he is when he was first holding that gun to her head when he was a child. But as they grew up and he went his way and she went her way, um, involuntarily, of course, their worlds collide and they both become what the other person is, or she becomes what he is. So she essentially becomes the mob enforcer. But what we see here is just the interviewer getting ready to ask him, um, how did it start? Um, how did you get into the business? Things like that. And Victor says, let's start from the beginning. 
And that's essentially from when he was a child. So the child that we see at the beginning is, is the child now that Victor is going to talk about. And so this is him saying, let's start from the, um, from the beginning. You know, again, we don't know when we look at Victor here at this part of the film, we don't know that he is setting up this interviewer. So this face that he puts on is also acting. This garb that he's wearing, the suit with, without a tie is also acting. And this could be the same garb that he wore when he was first coming off the plane and that he handled as much as he could before he then returned to the hotel to uh, become the peace of man and then kill his brother. So he had to get the ring somehow. But this is him acting. And it's interesting that as a hitman, you want, I would think you would want to want to go ahead and solve that problem immediately. Not wait it out, not plot it out, not think about it. But I, I think that the writer director, Perry Vandal, really does a great job of sort of pacing out the plot setbacks. Because in some ways, he's not plotting a setback in a sense that he has that in mind. We are looking at this as a plotted setback. And so um, this, this, the desire to now want to kill him at, you know, Bethesda's uh, bequest or, or I said behest rather, and not being able to do it in this moment it's sort of like a setback, having to set back that assignment. See, remember, Bethesda really has assigned this task of assassination because this is her show. He's not really on assignment in the same way that he was on assignment when Sergei sent him on an assignment or when any of the other mob boss, uh, the other mob boss sent him on an assignment. This is really Bethesda's assignment. So he's taking really a lot of direction from her, which is strange because none of the men take any direction from women. If anything, the women are expected to take direction from men and the women are abused in the film. They are expected to be put to service in the film. They are expected to not have a voice in the film. When um, Sergei kills Victor's father and he sends the mother some money and the father's lighter in the envelope, she doesn't get a say in her husband being killed. And uh, also when Victor goes and kills uh, the father and the wife, the wife doesn't get a say and the father being killed. Victor pulls out a gun before she can even realize what he's doing and he kills the father, then kills the wife and then almost kills the two girls. So the women in the film do not have a say, but but that's the behind the scenes is the female puppet master, the voice that all of the women in the film don't have a voice to speak. She gets to speak. She gets to have the last word on men dominating the women in the film, uh, abusing the women in the film, raping the women in the film, a film as young girls, and expecting, uh, and the men expecting that they can make decisions on behalf of women and still uh, keep their life. Sure. Victor impregnated her or she allowed herself to be impregnated, but she's not going to give him a voice in their son's life. And she does say it's a boy, but this face here is a face of uh, real tolerance of real, and it's really an attitude towards the interviewer. And it's strangely enough, it's, it's an ironic attitude because Victor is looking at the clientele of the system who paid for the girls and paid for the women. And now he's working, a man working against another man in the very same system that they support and enforce. 
and it is a woman who comes in between them. So there's a lot I can do with this, but I just want you to think about that face that you see here that is much more that is going on and that is not really at Victor's. He may think he's in control, but he's been out of control for the longest when, when uh, they met each other in the restaurant and probably way, way before that as well when uh, she put all of this into motion, when she gave herself an assignment to set up all the people around her who hurt her and her family, as well as Victor. So this is where Victor is talking about, let's start from the beginning. And so we are returning in the film to uh, Romania and is represent the slums. We can look at this and tell that this is not a higher level expensive area, but it's, you know, it's home to Victor and his friends. And so we get a sense of this. Clothes are hanging outside of the windows. Uh, the building is not as freshly painted as it could be. Uh, and uh, mainly older people living here, uh, as well as families. And so now we see Victor as a child, right off to the right frame. And then we see all his friends. So these are the four friends. This is Victor and his three friends. One of them is um, Alexi, another is Marku, and another is Cesar. And Cesar is the one he's going to end up shooting because Cesar is sent to kill Victor later. Marku is the one who actually does not get into the mob enforcing business, right? And he marries, he sort of gets fat, has children. And then Alexi is a one that he was going to shoot because he found uh, Alexi is the one who sold him out, right? When in reality, it was actually Bethesda who, who set them up to sell him out, uh, to sell Victor out. But Alexi is the one he's going to let go. So that lets you know that later he has a change of heart. But these are the three friends with Victor off to the right frame here in the yellow shirt. So these two neighborhood bullies uh, come to attack Victor because he owes him some money. So in the same way that Victor borrows from, say, these bullies who actually work with the mob as well, the mafia as well, his father does the same thing, and we're going to see that um, later. So Victor is resolute in his face. Uh, he knows what they are after, and he sort of, you know, prepares himself to, to be attacked because he knows he's going to be attacked. And he has, I noticed that he has a habit of... Uh, lowering his head as a child. So he does this a lot throughout the uh, throughout this part of uh, his part in the film. He doesn't go all the way to the end until uh, Victor has flashbacks of his childhood. But essentially, we see him throughout the film with his head lowered. And we see these two uh, older guys um, approaching him. And so one of the guys attacks him. Uh, Victor sort of pushes him away and then he attacks him again. And then he takes him to the ground. And I, you know, it's interesting how when you are within a certain economically depressed area, how you all fight against each other. And I never could really understand that, how when you live in the slums or the ghettos or or any of the types of areas that do not have a lot of economic advantages and people are just living paycheck to paycheck, why would you really fight each other? I mean, you look exactly the same. I would think you would fight the people who don't look like you. Of course, I understand why I'm not naive. I understand that you don't fight the system or you don't fight the people who basically hold you economically hostage, it's not like you can go and fight the rich man. The rich man has resources, has, um, he, he 
He donates to the police unions. Uh, he may have some police officers in pocket. So you know you can't really do that because they can shoot you. But I just I never quite understand why you can why you could fix your mind to hit somebody who looks exactly like you. I understand this older boy wanting his money and that Victor borrowed some money from him and now Victor cannot pay him back. I get that. And why would he need to borrow money anyway? That's another, you know, question to think about. But I just never quite understood how uh, people within the same area who look exactly the same would fight each other. And I, I could just be naive, but I always thought about that. And so he is also determined in his goal to sort of uh, get Victor to pay him back his money. And remember, don't forget these uh, two guys. These are, these are the two guys who are going to bow their head to Victor later when Victor decides to join the mob as a child and he becomes a major enforcer even just as a child. When he goes to enforce um, um, money from a person who borrowed money from the mob, uh, the, uh, the mafia, these two guys are going to stop and lower their heads. So, you know, it's interesting how that transitions. We see Victor lowering his head and sort of in, I don't know, maybe some uh, shame or fake shame. And the guys, their head is raised, right, because they have the power. Victor doesn't have power. But then when he goes and seeks power by becoming a child mob enforcer, He's the one who has power. Sergey puts him in charge, and these two guys that you see are going to be the ones who lower their heads. And so uh, this is one of the bullies sort of really going in on Victor to the point that it's almost like he's choking him. And then um, this kid here is the one who calls out and tells Victor that he needs to come inside or, or something like that. I don't remember him being uh, a brother to Victor because we don't see him uh, later other than him being on this balcony. But he, something about him breaks up the fight between Victor and the bully and Victor has to return to the uh, home. And so Victor is laying on the ground. He's actually gonna kick the guy so there's some kind of fight in Victor. Uh, it's you know kind of misguided, of course, but there is some kind of fight in Victor because I would think if you're gonna, I wouldn't kick a guy who just took me down to the ground, but there's something in him that still wants to fight back. And that's in contrast to his own mother uh, who doesn't fight back. Victor is, is uh, positioned on the ground. So that's that feeling of, being sort of pushed down and having to find your way to get up. And I think when Victor decides to become a mob enforcer as a child, I think he is sort of, I think this is the image that he has in his head of being down, especially when he sees his father being uh, attacked by Sergey and, you know, thinking to himself, I don't want to become my father. But this whole idea of, of, you know, being vulnerable, he's he's vulnerable here because the because the bullies could come back anytime, but he's vulnerable here and he's got to find a way to pull himself up. And that's when he makes a decision after seeing his father beat up and everything, he makes a decision to pull himself up. And pulling himself up in this kind of environment is no different than pulling himself by the bootstraps, right? Uh, it's not a legal way to do it, it's a criminal way to go, but it but he feels like he has no choice. And choice becomes choice is very interesting that I didn't think about because all of the people, the people who betray Victor, as I noted earlier, say they didn't have a choice, right? And uh, many of the young guys who join uh, the mafia or the mobs basically, uh, suggest that they don't have a choice. But we do know that there is a character in this uh, film, Marku, uh, we'll see him later, who chooses not to join the mob. 
Now, Cesar says that Marco is mother fucked, right? That his life is so lower than a mob enforcer that he's fat and got a wife and, and he looks horrible. And he does that. We will see Marco later. He, he, he doesn't look like uh, a person who's fresh. He looked like he let himself go. He it looks like a, he let the the his surroundings affect him right in a negative way. But that's in contrast. He him seeing everyone else saying they didn't have a choice and they had to choose to go this route is in contrast to Marku saying he did. Marku hasn't had to kill anybody. He hasn't had to go on assignment as a mob enforcer. And so, and 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 the people who choose who chose to become mob enforcers towards the end of the film are saying they want to get out. So that lets you know that they really did not want to get in. And you know, instead of going to school, he chooses to become a mob enforcer. So him being on the ground, feeling powerless, vulnerable, not wanting to become his father, as we're going to see, is sort of the reasoning that he uses in making the choices that he make that he makes so this is his father uh this guy behind him is not sergey he's just probably like a foot soldier type person and trafficant who is a mob boss is going to talk about uh sergey being just a foot soldier and how uh it was easy to get him to sort of kill or attempt to kill victor Right, he's just a foot soldier. He does what he is told. So the father here, this is Victor's father. He owes the mob some money, and so um, these are, you know, like your enforcers, trying to take him down. And this is Victor standing behind the door, and I. And, this is where I say that the door aspect of this film is very interesting because. While Victor is watching his father be attacked, there's nothing on the inside of Victor that runs and opens the door and maybe jumps on one of the guys and says, you know, don't hit my father, don't touch my father. His hand is on the door, is on the door handle. He can open it at any time, but he's choosing not to open that door. I don't think that the guys who are attacking the father, sure, they would hit Victor and knock him down, but I don't think they would take a gun, at least not at this point, right? Because they want the money. But it's interesting that he doesn't walk through that door. He doesn't, there's nothing on, there's nothing in him. And when we talk about uh, attachment theory, uh, Victor really suffers from an insecure attachment. You know, nothing that he does, he doesn't have a firm attachment to his family, his, his, his mother and father. And so he doesn't feel like the need to uh, come to their rescue of any sort. Even when he becomes a mob enforcer, he doesn't like actually try to protect his family, right? But I thought it was interesting and I didn't catch this until maybe the third time I watched the movie that he's standing at the door that he's making a choice to not intervene that he is um you know suggesting to the viewing audience this is not my problem and he's going to say that to sergey when uh he decides to become a mob enforcer as a child and sergey asks so are you here to pay your father's debt and Victor says, no. And Sergey says, why? Because it's not my debt. And so I thought that was interesting. If, if all of us actually had that attitude as grown adults, we would probably not get into a lot of the issues that we get into in helping people. But here, he's not going to help him. He's, he, he, could, he, his, he has the power right now in that hand on the door to help his father, and he's not going to do it. Here we have Victor's mother and then his father's wife um, interceding or intervening, intervening. And even when we see her trying to fight for her husband, who owes money 
to the mob, Victor still never comes and tries to uh, rescue her, right? This man here hits, hits the mother in the face and she uh, turns around and falls down. And we don't see the husband actually um, hitting the guy who just hit his wife either. Remember that the women in the film are not women who are protected. They're not covered. They may have a husband, but, but that husband, um, that husband's voice is much louder in the film, even if the husband ends up being assassinated himself because he owes money to Sergey. But I just, I just really think it's interesting how Victor as a child, and Victor is powerless. I do understand that he's powerless. But like I said, there's nothing on the inside of Victor that runs through the door and says, don't hit my mother, don't hit my father, right? That basically everyone is um, in this thing individually and by themselves. Sure, we live in an apartment together, but we are not really here to take care of each other. However, the women in the film, except for Bethesda, uh, the this woman here, this mother here, and then the mother that Victor kills as a child, while he is a child, they intervene, they say something, they, they try to help their husbands, even if their husbands are just not, do not have the character enough to try to help their own spouses. But he's going to hit her here and she's going to flip around and fall on the ground and he's and then the father is also going to fall on the ground but again there's nothing on the inside of him there's nothing that pulls at him emotionally that says don't hit my wife right so she falls he hits her she falls he falls down as well victor is still in the background uh on the other side of the door protecting himself and then Sergey comes in. He is the one who owes, uh, the father owes the money to. And the, and the mother is somewhat off the ground, right? Looking at the two men. And then the father is just, he acts like he is so helpless, you know, that he can't do anything. You know, he has a lot of height on Sergey and, and, and the other guy. Uh, he has a lot of, he's, he's thicker than them, but somehow he is, so vulnerable. He's so victim-like, you know. Um, Victor has more fight in him when the two bullies take him to the ground and then they get up and, and about to walk away. Victor is the one who kicks the guy in the leg. He has more fight in him as a child than his father has in him right now. So then you think about his narrative history. Where, where did he stop where did he stop fighting? Has he ever been a person who fought at all? Did he see his parents, um, did he see his own father beat uh, his mother, right? What is his narrative history? Because this this is a setback for him. We are flashing, well, we, we're not flashing back. We are basically, the writer director has now positioned us to see what Victor's background was like his toxic environment so this is victor's memory of what he had to endure as a child but we don't get the father you know talking about his father but we don't get a narrative history about the father so we just have to assume that he had some of the same issues in his childhood because you do what you know you do what you've seen in the same way that the woman is afraid here and she was hit she's used to being hit her own husband who's on the ground has, um, hits her all the time he's always beating on her he's take he he takes a belt to her when Victor flashes back to his childhood just before he's, he, he decides to help Bethesda. Uh, we see the father taking a belt to the, um, to the mother's back. And her back is bloodied, right? Victor doesn't come in and try to help her and try to stitch her up or anything like that or put, a, put even a cover on her. 
but they each have narrative history. Sergey has a narrative history. The guy next to him has a narrative history. But it's interesting how the the writer director plots this setback in a sense that Victor is confronted with a decision and he doesn't take a decision and he and then his father is confronted with with the decision and he can't make a decision because he doesn't have the money to pay. The mother is confronted with a decision to try to help the father, but she's helpless because she doesn't have the money to pay. And Sergey is confronted with a decision that he's going to have to make because he can't pay. And he's the one who says that if you don't pay me my money, I'm going to put your wife to work. And that shocks her because when you're putting a woman to work in this environment, knowing that there's a mob, mafia as well, we all they all know what that basically means. So Sergey is um, sort of impatient here. This is Sergey who's going to become Victor's mentor. So we get a pretty good image of him. And so he's, when I said that he had height on them, he has height on them. Look at him and look at Victor's father in terms of, uh, in contrast to Sergey here. Sergey has a lot of power and he has a lot of weight to his authority, but this father definitely has some kind of height to him that he he has some kind of advantage, but he's 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 stuck in his mind that he can't do anything other than listen to this man tell him that if you don't that you owe me money and I want my money. And so he hits him in the stomach. And the wife is still screaming out, as all women do in these abusive situations. And this is where he says, this is where Sergey says that if you don't give me my money, you see him pointing at the wife. If you don't give me my money, if you don't have my money, I'm going to put your wife to work. And she's shocked by that statement. You know, it's interesting how it's it's probably common knowledge in this in this slum that women have to be put to work if their men can't pay. But it's still a shocking thing when someone says it. And Sergey is not, I mean, um, the father is not really all that concerned about it. He's just looking at Sergey as, as, you know, understanding what's going to end up happening. And, and again, Victor is still behind the door. He has taken his hand off the handle where, where we saw him before. His hand was on the handle to come in, to go through that door. But here he is not interested in going through that door. He's watching the events unfold as if he's watching TV. And I don't remember them having a television in the, uh, in the apartment, but he's watching this as if he's watching television, as if he's watching something that he might see on a cop drama, you know, or something like that. But he's not, but he has made up his, in his mind that he's not walking through that door. Now, we don't know what his narrative history is in terms of um, engaging a situation like this. This may not have been the first time, and we have to assume that it's not because the father is an abuser. So we have to assume that it's not. But regardless, he's not walking through that door. So when they finally leave, Sergey did see Victor standing uh, behind the door. And so he went on ahead and left uh, with the other guy. And so once Sergey and the other guy leaves, leave, Victor then opens the door. His head is kind of lowered, but he's looking at his father and mother. But that's the only time he decided to come through the door. And then... Uh, the mother looks at Victor um, coming through the door. It's interesting how the mother uh, feels the need to comfort her husband when her husband is the one who's beating on her. So maybe that's the motherly thinking in her to comfort him. But of course, when you are when you are a woman at this time um, in these types of areas, usually the woman is basically a housekeeper. She doesn't really work, and if she works, is maybe maid duty housekeeping duty um she may be a cook or something like that but she's not really bringing in a lot of money so so their life is very vulnerable when the man should be the one who's working 
and the wife is the one who has to tend to the house and the kids. And when the husband dies, you don't have anything else. You don't have a job. You don't have education. You don't have any other options. And so then in that case, sometimes women put themselves to work in another type of way. But she is comforting a husband who just let another man hit her and who didn't come to her rescue and who also hits her as well. So we have Victor here uh, just coming through those doors. His uh, mother is basically yelling at him to help. And Victor, with his, help, with his head held down, is refusing to help. Again, there's nothing in him that pulls out of him some sort of emotion, some sort of sympathy, even mercy, even grace. Uh, and maybe he doesn't um, understand those concepts, right? But still, something human in you should come out and say, okay, let me help you, mom, right? Even fall to the ground and, and I don't know, hold, hold your mother's hand. But Victor has resigned himself not to be of any use. And one of the things you're going to see with the older Victor is um, him basically saying that I can be of use to you to the, to the second boss, right? And that when you become a mob enforcer, it is understood that you are going to be of use. But here, he's refusing to be of use. He's refusing to be of service, which is going to be contrasted with uh, when he goes to talk to Sergey to become a mob enforcer as a child, as you see here. And he's basically wanting to be of use. In many cases, he doesn't want to become his father. He doesn't want to become the person who's lying down on the ground right now, who was just beaten by uh, some footmen, some foot soldiers. He doesn't want to become that person. And maybe in some ways, he looks at Sergey as a person that he could become. It, it is Sergey who actually is the one who mentors Victor all the way till um, up until adulthood and up until he actually betrays Victor. Uh, but right here, we see him not wanting to be of use. He's, he's, there isn't enough cry in his mother uh, for him to be concerned about, to, to respond to. And so you often have to uh, wonder then, when he was a baby, did his mother respond to his cries? Because at the end of this lecture, we're going to get into the concept of attachment theory and that sometimes parents will respond to their children, to, to their babies on their own time schedule and not on the baby's time schedule. Uh, you have for secure attachment, a parent who responds appropriately, timely, uh, is uh, plays with the child, engages the child, the child can wander off a little bit, crawl away, but turn around and look at the parent and still feel safe and secure versus an insecure child uh, doesn't have the same relationship with their parent. The parent is available or not available or is inconsistent in uh, his or her responsiveness. So the way in which you see Victor responding to his parent tells you that she's basic, she may be reaping what she sowed what she had sown in him, that she may not have responded to him as a child or to any of his cries when he was um, younger than what you see right now, and that now she's reaping that fruit in a sense, because it just doesn't make any sense. Even children who may be afraid, um, afraid of their parents uh, will still put on an act will still put on a face and still do something to help or whatever. Victor is just not inclined to do anything at all in this moment. So we see Victor walking outside with his head held down. I thought I thought that the actor really does a great job conveying whatever emotion is going on with him. You know, each child has his or her own emotions and you can tap into your own childhood and think about the times that you've had your head, had your head down. 
so I don't want to give sort of like this universal um, analysis about the child's head down. It could mean many things. It could mean uh, that Victor wants out of this current life that he has as a child and, and a child of two parents who who have produced a toxic home. It could be Victor wanting out of this neighborhood, this slum neighborhood. Victor wanting to look and do better in his life, even if he doesn't have a full understanding of that. So you would have to tap into your own childhood to think about what this head down looks for you. I'm quite sure that you have experienced your own vulnerabilities as a child, especially if you were bullied, especially if you dealt with a toxic father or toxic mother. Only you can make a true assessment of what this means for you. As you look at Victor uh, walking with his head down and think about this contrasted, this, this whole filming image of uh, Victor walking throughout the courtyard with his head down. Think about this contrasted when we see him running to um, running with the, uh, the, the hat on, the earphones in his ear, the jogging suit, and that long sort of um, filming sequence of him just running. He's walking here, but he was running as an adult. And so you're going to see that as well. So Sergey, his um, center, he is the one with the cigarette. The other two guys uh, are other types of foot soldiers. The two young men are men who, young men who join to become mob enforcers, right? Just little fighters. Look at the scene. The scene is an apartment, but it's definitely more geared towards an adult. Uh, it is uh, not necessarily a bachelor's pad or anything like that. Remember the back that we saw of Victor right when he was running through the tunnel? Well, we get his back here as well as a child. And he's he's forcing himself to make a decision before he truly understands the type of decision that he is making. But in his childlike understanding, he wants, he does, I think for me, I think he doesn't want to be his father. And that that's the reason why he's pushing. Because if you think about him being bullied in the courtyard, it is a parallel to his father being bullied by Sergey, and something in him that that pulls something out of him. He may not be uh, emotionally invested enough in into uh, trying to help his mother and help his father in that moment, and he's definitely not going to accept their debt. He's not there to work off their debt, right? But. He may not be emotionally invested there, but something in seeing that fight while he was standing behind the doors, seeing Sergey hit his father and his father fall to the ground and uh, seeing one of the men hit his mother and the mother fall to the ground, something in that dynamic and that visual image pulls at him enough to uh, push him to walk across the courtyard and into another building and into where we see Sergey and the other men and and offer himself to be of use as a mob enforcer. So he's standing here with clothes too big for him, which is ironic because the choice that he is making is a choice that, that is too big for him. It's too big for him to understand because I look at it like this. If this was the best choice for you, why would you feel like you need to quit it later in life? You don't see Sergey really quitting. He's killed by Victor uh, because it was Trafficant who sent Sergey to kill Victor. But I don't get the sense that Sergey is willing to leave the mob, leave the mafia, right? So he doesn't feel like the job is too big for him. Now, he does make a point of saying that he had no choice but to come and try to kill Victor. So maybe the job is too big for him in that way. But it's only connected to the idea that he was Victor's mentor. But in this case here, in looking at Victor, this shirt is too big for him. 
he should have a regular size shirt. And so it, it is likely his father's shirt. And that's interesting, too, because when he takes this job to become a mob enforcer for Sergei and for the m mob system as a whole, um, he doesn't take the money that Sergei is going to give him and give it to his mother. So not only is he not willing to pay the debt for his father, to offer to be of service to pay the debt for his father, but he's not even willing to take any kind of money that uh, that he gets from Sergey and try to give it to his mother. Most kids, when they grow up in these toxic environments, they're so wounded in their childhood and abused uh, and there is so much exposure to domestic violence that they just that they usually feel compelled. They just feel compelled to bring back anything that they have earned. Well, he doesn't really earn any money here. Uh, Sergey just gives him a bill, and maybe Sergey is thinking, "Well, um, I'm going to give him this bill." And maybe he's going to give it to his family. That's really why he's here. But Victor is resolute in his understanding. I am not here to pay off the debt of my parents, especially my father. So again, this shirt that he has here is, is very significant. I didn't really think about it because the other shirt that he had on was yellow and it seemed to be a little fitting for him even though it was kind of big but it just seemed to be fitting but this is clearly a very big shirt that does not fit him that it falls almost to his knees and is symbolic of taking on um, making a choice to put on a garb that is too big for him to wear in other words taking uh, uh making a choice to become a mob enforcer for a job that's too big for him to wear so when we see him at when we get his back uh, while he's running in the tunnel, there isn't any indication that that this choice that he's making is too big for him. But when we look at it from the back, when we look at him from the back, we could assume that having to make this choice is too big for him. Because when he kills the interviewer at the end, it, it is unsettling. It, it it bothers him for a, a, a strange re, uh, reason. And I was wondering if it bothered him because he had to kill somebody in front of Bethesda. He hasn't had to kill anybody. And maybe maybe he's wanting, he had wanted to keep that part of his job secret. And maybe that was the reason. But I think that, that his unsettling, that emotional unsettling, that psychological unsettling is really about the fact that he no longer wanted to do the thing that he has been doing for so many years and that he felt compelled to try to save Bethesda. And so, okay, I'll do this one more time because when he comes in from uh, a, uh, an assignment where he was supposed to kill someone and he doesn't kill that person, he puts his gun in the drawer of the nightstand. And I had thought about that and I said to myself, so why, so he put the gun in there and I think to myself, if Bethesda had all that opportunity to kill him, she definitely had the opportunity to take that gun and shoot him the whole time, but she never did. So that was more or less about Victor wanting to put away old things, childish things, no longer, because he takes on this role as a child. And throughout his process, he's really no different than a child in his in his thinking and so when he places the gun in the drawer it's it, it was all it felt like he was wanting to retire the gun right Re, uh in terms of being an assassin so again this is significant this large shirt that he's wearing is too big for him he can put it on and, and it can hang on his body but that's just it is hanging on his body so we see sergey kind of mocking uh, Victor. Uh, everyone is sort of listening in. And they usually take their cues from Sergey. So if Sergey is laughing, the men laugh. But when Sergey says, uh, basically, shut up, the men shut up. So that means that Sergey is running this room. He's running this room. He's running the men. He's running the two young guys that you see in the back. And he's running this game. And so when he talks to uh, Victor, 
it's it's a little mocking it's a little jest it's a little comic relief it's it's a number of things because he's really trying to read victor what is he doing down here why is he here and i think to myself why would you need to read somebody if you know they want to become what you see the young guys uh, behind you wanting to be which is a mob enforcer why isn't there sort of like a formal celebration come on in you can basically be a mob enforcer you can be all that you want to be but is 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 that way of kind of using mocking to set victor back to set him back emotionally to challenge him you don't really want this do you oh you really down here to uh, to pay off your father's debt and and victor's like no it's not my debt and so they kind of laugh about that as well and then sergey basically tells them to shut up and so he's running this game sergey he's running these people around him he's running his environment and he's running this table and so how he interacts with victor is based on the game as well so sergey uh wants uh one of the young men to challenge victor and so he goes over and he hits victor in the face in in the uh, temple and so victor returns with a kick to his stomach and takes him down so he's already proving himself it's a little bit of a test for him to prove himself and it makes sense you know what kind of fighting skills do you have we don't necessarily see uh any sort of training ground um so whatever skills they have picked up as children is usually on the on the playground someone comes along and hits them or something like that and they hit the person back and then of course once you enter a certain environment it is expected that you're going to fight is the goal is not to sit around and look pretty all day you are going to fight so that means that uh sergey is trying to see just how um quick in his understanding that Victor has about what he's actually doing and what he's actually choosing. So it is Sergey here who is offering once basically Victor has proven himself in in kicking a guy. And to me that reason <clears throat> that really wasn't too long of a fighting test or something. I don't know what Sergey is looking for and I'm not a man only a man will sort of understand um what sergey is really looking for but you know i've seen sort of fight scenes where there's like a little bit of a test and it's longer than that but you know victor proved himself at the same time the person that he kicks in the stomach stays down on the ground so that lets you know that victor knows how to handle himself so it's interesting that he doesn't handle himself really with the two bullies at the beginning that the only thing he really does is uh, once the guy gets up and starts to walk off, Victor kicks him a little bit. But he doesn't do what you see these guys th that he does with the young guy here. Basically, you know, um, his contemporary in a sense, in the same age range or something like that. He kicks him. And that's that's the extent of it. And I'm thinking to myself, so why didn't he show these same fighting skills uh, with the two bullies? You know, but a kick is a kick. Whether the the kick is him kicking the guy while he's walking away, or him kicking this guy in the stomach and taking him down. But there is a difference. I do believe that this guy that he kicks in the stomach, this young man, that young child that he kicks in the stomach is they're likely around the same age and the same height whereas the two bullies he kicks if he kicked him in the stomach or or if he kicked him more than what he did in the courtyard it might result in a punch to his face and he might stay on the ground for a long time but what you see here is sergey basically accepting victor into the fold and giving him a bill and i was wondering why he gave him that bill in that moment but i i just believe that he assumed um that victor is going to take that bill to the mother to his mother and sort of pay some part towards the mother because later when sergey kills victor's father and 
gives an envelope to the mother with money in it and, and a lighter, his father's lighter, he's concerned about the mother. He's concerned about her making it. And the interesting thing is he doesn't put her to work. At least we don't we don't see him putting her to work. Marku tells uh, Victor, an uh, older Victor, when Victor returns to this slum area after being uh, discovered that he's actually still alive, that he that she shortly died when Victor left initially. Victor left. Uh, Victor killed the man who owed Sergey money and his wife, and and the two daughters were taken away. And then Sergey is the one who um, took Victor out of the slum area and into the city. And so I'm I'm wondering then did the mother sort of die of a broken heart a year later. And so he's giving him this bill for whatever reason, payment or something like that. It could be just payment for passing this little test that he does. But I also think it has a lot more resonance with the fact that he wanted to take, he wanted Victor to take it to the mother. Because if he didn't, he wouldn't have left the mother any money after he, after he assassinated her husband. So Victor uh, goes back home. The father is sitting in maybe like a rocking chair or a lounge chair. And Victor doesn't have a relationship with his father. He doesn't talk to him. He doesn't say anything. He doesn't sit before him. He doesn't really respect him. Uh, he goes in. He comes. He he goes out. And the and and the father is you know sort of yelling at him. And he's yelling at him in a sense that you need to respect me, e even if he's not necessarily saying those words. He's saying he's coming from a standpoint that I am the head of this house and you're going to respect me. But Victor actually has more respect for Sergey, the one who beats his father. And so the father is making his own comments about why Victor needs to say something to him. And Victor looks at him, doesn't have much of a... Um, um, doesn't have much to say. He doesn't say anything. I want to note that this is a different t-shirt from the one that we saw him in when he visited Sergey. So now he's back in his child-like body, in a sense, right? That this t-shirt actually fits him. And this is a t-shirt that fits a child. The father could not take this shirt and put the shirt on himself. So this lets you know that that Victor, interestingly enough, has some clue about what to wear, what what not to wear. And when he goes down to see and talk to Sergey, he's wearing a shirt that's too big for him. But when he returns, somehow he's changed into a shirt that actually is the right fit for him. And the contrast is is that the that the decision that he's making to become a mob enforcer is way, again, it's way too big for him to actually make that decision. You know, in contract law, uh, children cannot sign contracts without the parent's uh, signature or permission. And so it is Victor operating as, as an adult when he's wearing that long shirt. But it's now Victor operating as a child when he's among his parents. So he, so it's like he's basically not telling his parents what he has just done. He's coming back in, operating like a child until he can make the transition and leave for good. But I think that was just kind of interesting that the shirt changes when he's in, in the home when he is back in the home in front of his parents and he has to act like a child. He doesn't say anything to them, but he has to um, act like a child here because if he had had that shirt on, that long shirt that was likely his father's shirt, uh, if he had had that shirt on, the father would have asked you, asked him, what are you doing with that shirt on? What are you doing with my shirt on? Take that shirt off. That shirt doesn't belong to you. It doesn't fit you. It's not right for you. You need to grow into that shirt. Take it off. So the father would have reprimanded him uh, 
and basically would have given him an instruction, a warning. That would have been like a warning. You are not supposed to wear that shirt, take that shirt off. It is not the right fit for you. Take it off. You are not a man yet. And that would have been the warning. And that's kind of like the missed opportunity that we're going to discuss later in the film analysis that the missed opportunity is to receive a warning about making certain choices. The missed opportunity is also um, understanding that if you go this route of, of taking money from the mob, you know, from the mafia, and you cannot pay it back, it could cost you your life. And so Victor understands a lot more than we realize. Just in the changing of the shirts, he understands a lot more than we realize. So Victor is lying down in the bed. That cut that you see on his head is from the uh, the young guy who hits him in the uh, head and then Victor kicks him. And so Victor is, is essentially hearing his um, father beat his mother. And when he hears that, he sort of turns uh, turns around in his bed. So he's turning around in discomfort. He's turning around in violence. You know, he's turning around. His ears hear things. His body vibrates when he hears the hits that his daddy takes or he puts on his uh, mother. Um, uh, he's turning his head and in, in ignoring. And I believe that Victor's father gets upset with the idea that Victor doesn't respect him as a as the man of the house and then takes it out on the wife. He was going to beat the wife regardless because he's been beating the wife. But I think that exchange that he had with, with Victor, when Victor did not recognize or respect him in that moment as he was talking, I think that was sort of like the fuel that uh, pushed him to take his belt and beat his wife so he's looking we're going to see in a flashback later uh the belt and how he is beating his wife but what we're seeing here is maybe his disgust the feelings that he have uh for the woman for the wife and a lot of times it's more or less projection that that they really need to beat themselves but it's much easier to take a target and beat that target, right? Versus maybe taking their hand and hitting their hand in a wall, you know, punching a hole in a wall or going to the gym and punching something or whatever. They would rather beat something. Even if they have to hear the cries of the person, somehow they just ignore it in their mind. It doesn't matter to them that in that moment, they got to express their anger. They have to express their disgust about their life, about their life's choices. So when did he start beating his wife? And I don't know if this is his wife. I'm just assuming it is his wife. But what is his narrative history? People don't get up one day and just begin beating somebody. Again, he must have seen this in his childhood. He must have seen his own father beat his mother. And so you do what you know. And this face that he has is really a face that should be turned inward. That it is him who has caused the disorder in a situation. Women usually are not really permitted to work in these types of environments. So that means it is up to him to uh, go to work. But we don't see him going to work. All we see is him being beaten up by Sergei and his other foot soldiers. Well, and the other foot soldiers, because this man here owes money. But we don't see him working. We don't see him making money. We don't see him leaving the house. He's in the house or he's in the uh, hallway. But we don't see much of anything. Now, we don't see him drinking. I can't remember if he was smoking. Um, so we don't see any sort of vices that keep him bound. So maybe he's just bound because he just don't know how to do anything but be lazy, not work for anything, not do anything, not even be an enforcer. The irony is, is that he doesn't have any money to pay back the debt, but he doesn't offer, he doesn't go down to Sergey himself and offer himself to be of use to pay down the debt. That's interesting that it, that it is his son 
who has some insight about the situation that says, okay, I don't want to become you, so I'm just going to offer myself, put myself to use and offer myself to be of use and be put to work and become a mob enforcer. But he's too lazy even to, to go the criminal route to become a mob enforcer, but he's later assassinated by Sergey. And so we see the mother, uh, this camera angle is basically uh, Victor looking at his mother on the ground, I mean, on the floor, and it, she's bloodied, and we're gonna get a closer view of her, uh, her back. And remember the scars that we see on Bethesda that the women um, are scarred. They're not only emotionally scarred and psychologically scarred and spiritually scarred, but they are physically scarred. We see Bethesda's scars have healed, but we can tell that those scars have been there for a very long time. Usually scars can heal a little bit to the point that they are not noticeable, but these scars have been scars that have been, have been ongoing. So if she was beaten or um, mistreated in any way, it was it was consistent and repetitive. In the same way that you see here, this wife, it is consistent and repetitive. But we don't see Victor going into his mother and laying down with her and holding her hand and just being there for her. So she's all alone. She got two. She got male energy in the house, and no male energy is there to actually. Uh, support her and cover her and protect her. I didn't realize that Victor had, had actually gone into the mother and was sort of putting his hands on her wounds. And this hand that you see is the same hand that he's going to use as an adult uh, to look at um, Bethesda's wounds. So I guess in some ways he is responding to his mother. Um, and these wounds are just horrific. They're just horrific. Even even in just actors looking at this from a, a filmmaker's uh, point of view, to create these wounds I, takes a little bit of psychology. Um, but these wounds, if these wounds could talk, what would they say? If these wounds gave the mother voice, the only voice that we hear of the mother is her yelling. That's it. But we don't hear much more uh, of her, her, who she is, where she comes from. We don't get any kind of narrative history about her. So we have to do a lot of assuming. And this is Victor uh, placing his hands on his mother's back. So yes, he does respond to it. So I have to I have to take that back, that he does respond to her, um, but he eventually leaves her as well. The irony is, is that when he flashes back to this scene with his mother, when he's in a restaurant and he's contemplating whether he should go back and help Bethesda, who he doesn't know is, is Bethesda, um, it is this scene here that that pushes him. He can't help his mother here, but he could help Bethesda. And that's what he, he eventually ends up doing. It's interesting though, it might've been better for him to continue helping his mother and staying within this environment than to become a mob enforcer. But by the time he, he gets to this point, he's already made the decision to become a mob enforcer. And so the father is out here in the hallway. He's always out in the hallway. And so he's out in the hallway and Sergey here, this image, uh, this shadow image is actually Sergey, and he's asking for the money. And um, he still doesn't, have the money he's going to sort of throw something at sergey some little bit of money or whatever and then the lighter and sergey is going to pick up the lighter and i guess the money um and i don't know if it's the same money that he gives to the wife but regardless he gives her money and so sergey is pulling out a gun 
as a way to enforce um, the guy to to uh, to give him to give the money that he owes. And you know, this is this is really actually. The gun here is significant only in the sense that Sergey really doesn't use it. He just pulls it out and it's enough to spark some sort of uh, flight in the father. But it's interesting how the gun, how guns are used within this uh, film. When Victor pulls out a gun, he intends to use it period whether he is a child using it or whether he is an adult mob enforcer using it but sergey is a little different the way he holds a gun um is doesn't seem like it's really intentional he's just using it to use it uh even when uh, franco Victor and Sergey are meeting um, with someone for a drug exchange. Sergey is not holding a gun. It's, of course, it makes sense that Victor is holding a gun because he's, he's like security in that moment. But as soon as Franco asks uh, Victor to give him the gun, yells at him to give him the gun, you would think that Sergey would immediately... Uh, place his hand on his gun, but he doesn't. So I wonder why Sergey even has a gun. Why does he even care to have a gun? I think it's just a threat. I'm not quite sure he's as, as intentional in his desires. And so uh, he picks up the lighter that, that the, uh, the father throws, and that lighter is going to be, be significant because it's the same lighter that he's going to place in an envelope with some money and leave with the mother. So the mother is sitting here like any victim of, of domestic violence. They are just as resolute in, in their understanding about the situation and their desire to stay. They may feel stuck or they may feel like uh, this is what I have to do. I have no other choice. Remember, you will have different characters saying, I have no other choice. I don't have a choice. And so in some regard, uh, it is true because like I say, these women do not go out and work. And if they do, is minor heist, housekeeping, maid work. They don't really go out to sort of like job jobs like a man does. And all we know that this is this is the slums and we don't know the workforce the economy of the situation we don't know anything like that we do know that people are joining to become uh mob enforcers right so she's sitting here she's been beaten uh been hurt and there isn't anything in her to we don't see her um cleaning herself we don't see her going into a shower. We don't see her changing her clothes. I'm not sure if this is the same uh, outfit that she had on when when her husband was beating her. Uh, but her face says it all. Her face is just as stone-faced and blank-faced as her uh, son's. And so... Um, there's a knock at the door she goes to the door and she retrieves this envelope that's going to have money in it and the lighter and uh she's confused by the whole thing but once she sees the lighter she understands that her her husband has been assassinated so that means this man that has been beating her is not coming back home that alone is a shock because if if a person has been schooling you in their university of abuse, that's all you understand. That's all you know. You're gonna have to now rebuild your life apart from the person who, who's been beating you when when really you that's all you've known. They might have met when they were younger. He might have been beating her from the time they have uh, 
they were younger and married. And so um, uh, it's interesting that she's wearing a T-shirt that works for her, that that supports her, but she's living within a system that doesn't support her. The irony is, though, uh, the system doesn't um, um, support her, but the mob system does. And it's the same system that Sergey just, he, Sergey is really not a person who uh, supports his own word. Because remember what he said, that if you don't give me my money, I'm going to put your wife to work. I'm going to put her to work. Well, he doesn't put her to work. So there's a challenge. There's We have to challenge um, his thinking, his authority, because Sergey is not who he really seems to be. He's not as as an enforcer as much as uh, he claims to be. So she sees the lighter. She realizes uh, what it means. And this is the same outfit. So she hasn't gotten out of this outfit. She hasn't gotten out of this blouse. This blouse that is bloody. That means she hasn't been into a mirror. She hasn't looked at her back. She hasn't... Uh, I'm quite sure that the blood is uh, was so thick that that is stuck to her back, and she has, and there isn't anything in her that says I got to get out of this blouse. And we don't, we're not going to see her development. Basically, uh, what we see her doing here, crying, this is basically the end of her development because she's going to die uh, a year later uh, after. Um, Victor is is uh, taking out of uh, town, but it's interesting that this shirt is her covering. She cannot get any other covering from her husband, and the only covering that is uh, temporary is from Sergey or the mob enforcer uh, system. And this is just the extent. And her and and her son is going to leave her. So she's going to be left all alone in this one apartment with nobody, no man, uh, no understanding of how to get herself out of the system, no job, nothing at all. And this is her despair. She's likely going to go into this house, um, lay down on the bed and basically die. And Victor hears his mother crying. Uh, about um, uh, and he doesn't know what it is, but he just hears her cry, and it's he's used, he's used to hearing her cry. So there's no sense in really giving way to any kind of emotion because this is what he's used to. This is what he's accustomed to. This is what uh, he understands as a young boy. And so Victor is now with Sergey. He's made his decision. He hasn't fully left the home yet, uh, but uh, he's made his decision. The way Sergey is pulling at him is like a father. Sergey is responsible for killing his father, for assassinating his father. And now um, Victor is more inclined to respect Sergey's authority than he uh, is inclined to, to respect his father's authority. So there's a changing of authorities. Once he decides to become to be to make himself abuse and become a mob enforcer, he already changed authorities. That's why he doesn't. That's why he doesn't respect his father when he's standing in the kitchen. And so he's changing authorities. Uh, uh, Sergey has now welcomed him. First, he gave him a bill, and now he's welcoming him by putting his uh, hand around his head, like you would see a father do. And so Sergey is, um, I mean, uh, Victor is, has been given a, a package and a package, um, inside the package is a gun. And Victor is now feeling the weight of that gun. You know, he's holding a gun, he's looking at the gun and holding a gun and looking at the gun is really looking at his decisions, right? But it's also looking at his setback because once he uses that gun, he sets himself back. He sets himself back in his overall mental development, social development, psychological development, spiritual development, once he shoots that gun. 
And right now, to me, to me, in some ways, he's at a crossroads moment. He may have a crossroads moment much later, but this is the time to make a decision and say, no, I don't want to go this route. But it's too late. Once you are basically in this system, it's hard to get out. It's like blood in, blood out. So that little fight that he had, that little test that he had was a way of jumping in, right? If we were looking at gang terminology. And so now uh, this is basically um, his first assignment, right? The first with the guy that he kicks was uh, was a test. This is now a, a first assignment, his first task. So the two guys that you see in the background that I noted earlier were the two bullies initially who were bullying him in the courtyard. So sir, uh, so Victor has now changed positions. He was the one down on the ground being bullied and being choked by those two guys. Now as a mob enforcer, as a special um, maybe surrogate of, uh, of Sergey, he's now in charge of them. So when, so when he moves from one, he moves from one position to another. He crosses positions. Uh, 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 in the same way that he was crossing the courtyard with his head down to go see Sergey, he's now crossing positions, and they stand there for a while as he walked down the stairs. It's not like they're putting on an act, and then once he. Once he gets down the stairs and midway, they go on ahead and change. No, they stand in that position with their head down for a long while until he is fully out of view. So he's completely changed positions. So now he's entering the home of uh, a family. This is uh, the wife of that family. And uh, she welcomes him in. Interesting enough, interestingly enough, she don't know him. For her to welcome somebody in without knowing the person, she doesn't know if the person is a friend of her daughter's or if the person is a friend of anybody in that home, but she opens the door willingly and lets him walk in. So she, so he stands before, Victor stands before the mother. There are the two daughters on the ground um, sitting on the floor. And then the father is sitting in a chair and he's the one who is surprised that Sergey sent Victor, this child, this child to collect the money that he owes. And so the mother here is concerned and basically asks, do you owe the money, right? And Victor looks at her and the mother here is much more resigned to be actually respectful you know, she's not looking at Victor and scoffing and mocking him. It's the father, of course, right? Because it's a man thing. It's a male energy thing. But you would think she would say, oh, you know, get on out of here. Go on to your mother. Who is your mother? Let me find out who she is. I'm going to take you to her right now. She, she doesn't do anything like that. So there's an expectation in this environment that this happens. I'm not saying that it happened before, but this happens for because mothers, women in general will always say, oh, you're too young. What are you doing uh, here looking like this or whatever? Let me take you back to your mother. I'm going to talk to your mother and tell her what's going on with you. She doesn't even do that. She looks at her, she looks at the husband and asks him a question. Do you owe money? And so the husband is really shocked. Uh, that Sergey would send a child to collect money, not knowing that Victor has a gun in his pocket, right? But uh, he is so uh, bothered and annoyed at this image of a child coming to disrespect him. And I guess Sergey un understood that the this older man would be bothered by it. And maybe he was hoping that he would be bothered by it. And so maybe he was also hoping that that Victor would have to pull out his gun um, uh, because of it. So the guy goes, um, he's really going to see if there's anybody else. He's thinking that Victor has other foot soldiers 
you know, other mob enforcers. And so he goes and looks out the window and, and he looks around and to see, and he realizes that it's just Victor and he comes back and he mocks him some more. And he's basically, she's basically asking, do you owe the money, right? She's concerned because right now, Victor is um, basically disturbing their peace. And so like any woman, like any mother who's trying to run the home, she wants to return to a place of peace. And it's not clear that this man hits hits this woman, but it is clear that she has some rule in that house for her to question her husband, for her to question him and ask, do you owe the money? As if she's participating in a conversation between two men, even though Victor is a young uh, uh, child, it's still male energy. And here it is, this woman is coming in and intervening and interfering uh, in male business, which you're going to see then in her daughter, Bethesda later coming in between two men, coming in between the men of the system intervening in male business. So uh, the guy is uh, mocking, laughs at Victor. Victor pulls out a gun and shoots him without any, without any sort of consideration to it or whatever. Um, and I don't know if he's shooting him because he doesn't have the money or if he's shooting him because he mocks him, but he shoots him. So after he has shot the father, then he shoots, shoots the mother. That's why I say that at this, uh, he doesn't have the logic in his understanding. Um, of course, he is immature as well in his understanding because he's a child. To notice the difference between one person respecting him and, and one person not respecting him. Basically, everyone looks like uh, he or she is not respecting him, so he's just going to shoot them. Because he's there to get the money from the man. So then why is he shooting the wife? Why is he shooting the mother? And, and uh, it's it is the man, the male energy that actually disrespects him, mocks him, laughs at him versus the female energy that uh, tries to bring about peace and tries to make sense of uh, his presence and, and urges the father, the husband to make things right. You don't see his uh, Victor's mother doing exactly the same thing Victor's mother is more concerned about Sergey beating up her husband. And so she tries to, to uh, rescue him, so to speak. This woman here is actually trying to bring about peace, trying to be a peacemaker in the home and trying to get the, the uh, husband to pay uh, him. Because he didn't say he didn't... He, he, the man didn't say that he didn't have the money to pay, right? He didn't act like he didn't have the money to pay, whereas uh, uh, Victor's father acted like he didn't have the money to pay. He was willing to take the hits and the punch to his gut um, as maybe indications or, or uh, implications that, that he just didn't have the money to pay ironically enough that when Sergey pulls out a gun all of a sudden the father is able to take out some money and throw it at Sergey and then he runs off but the man here in this um, scene doesn't act like he doesn't have the money to pay he's more offended at the idea that Sergey would send a child to collect the money versus even the bullies who held their uh, heads down or someone older than them, that Sergey would send a child. And so Sergey was banking on the man to be upset about the situation uh, and maybe resist, I don't know. But he doesn't seem like, so really the man um, basically sort of sets up on, 
sets up his own death because if he had the money to give to pay it back he should have just gone and gotten the money but he didn't go anywhere in the house to look for the money he only looked outside to see who was who were the other possible mob enforcers that accompany him and when he realized that it was just sergey sending victor this child here that's what really got him upset so he in many ways contributed to the death of of himself as well as his wife but i think to myself is is the male energy that that victor should have a problem with but he kills the female energy interesting interesting so now this is the image that we got from the beginning uh, where he's holding the gun and he's pointing the gun at this uh, girl because remember the uh, father is dead he's already killed the father he's killed the mother so we only have these two girls left over and 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 he doesn't have I think it's interesting I want to say he doesn't have the wherewithal to uh, think of them a little differently than the uh, two older individuals but he does pause he does pause and even that image where we see him pulling the trigger it, he or or it, the process of pulling the trigger he doesn't pull it yet he doesn't complete that task so this assignment here is interesting because we don't really know what we know that the assignment is for him to collect the money but we don't know for certain if sergey told him to shoot the man because remember sergey holds a gun he doesn't shoot a gun and so that i don't know if that's really part of sergey's instruction to him i wonder if victor is the one who decides to shoot the gun after all he has a gun he pulls out a gun he shoots a gun so it's interesting because it would be interesting it would have been interesting to hear sergey instruct victor now we're going to see later when uh, Sergey is mentoring Victor that that he's sh actually shooting the gun. Sergey is actually teaching him how to shoot the gun and everything. But it's interesting here we don't really get a um, whether Sergey told him to shoot uh, the gun. So the young girl is looking up at him. This is going to be the same girl. I we believe we have to hope or uh, or imply. That this is the same girl that he's going to meet later in the restaurant because it's the same dark hair versus her sister has blonde hair and so sergey and his uh associate comes in right right when victor is about to fully pull that trigger he stops him and you know interesting interestingly enough it does if this is the system that assassinates people who do not make good on their promises why does sergey not let him shoot completely and uh finish the task well the obvious reason is is that he's going to put these young girls to work basically sex trafficking he's going to put these girls uh to work they're going to be servicing older men for profit right for uh, uh for pay that they're never going to uh see they may get a dollar or something like that but other than that he stops it and so now we have trafficking trafficking is the um uh, is the boss that you see in this light gray shirt or something right and he's going to come in and um they're looking at what victor has done so we so they know victor is capable they know victor will see it through they know victor uh is conscious is is conscious and conscientious about the uh task and they know if they send in victor he's going to get it done so trafficking uh sergey basically tells them to uh, collect the girls the girls or hitting the men in, in the back and the girls do not really scream they don't yell they uh but it could be the sequence how the writer director sort of films it uh the music starts so we don't necessarily hear them scream but they do respond in a sense that they are hitting the backs 
of the men who are holding them and taking them out of the uh, apartment. One of the girls pulls at her mother and I think pulls at, uh, at a necklace on the mother because we're going to see the necklace later. And trafficking here is holding Victor. Victor's head, head is still down. And again, we don't know what Victor is thinking here. Unless you are a mob enforcer, unless you grow up in the slums, unless you uh, um, make yourself uh, choose a decision to go into criminal life, we, you really are not going to know what he's thinking in this moment. All we know is his head is down. In some ways, uh, he may not feel good about, about the decisions that he's making. But we don't know that, and we just have to assume, and we still may be assuming uh, incorrectly and inappropriately. Victor might be just fine with, with his decisions, but he just may be a person who has the habit of lowering his head. So Trafficant looks at Victor uh, and kind of smiles at him like a father would, and Victor... Um, doesn't really smile, but his face shifts in a way as if he's trying to smile. So this is Trafficant looking at Victor. And then uh, Victor is um, taken out of the city, right? Because he has committed a crime and he has to be, well, taken out of the slums into the city. And... Um, because he did commit a crime and eventually the police are going to come around to find out um, who shot the two people. And so now they go to another mob boss and it's interesting that trafficking here in the light gray shirt with brown pants or black pants, this is his son Franco who is standing before this other mob boss. And uh, Franco is a very delicate person, psychologically delicate. And we're going to see him later uh, in his element. Um, he's Something about him is a little off mentally. It's interesting that you see uh, Victor and Sergey in the same kind of posture. They're both with their, their standing um shoulders sort of down head down uh victor doesn't look at the mob boss right but um sergey is you know kind of looking at franco and it's interesting that victor to me looks like a younger sergey and Sergey looks like an older Victor. The difference is that Victor is not going to betray anyone. But in, in fighting the system on behalf of Bethesda, it's almost like he's betraying the system, right? So this is an interesting dynamic here. This is Franco, a younger Franco, and we're going to see him at play. And this is Trafficant's son, Franco. And then we have Sergey. And... Um, Victor is basically the only one who doesn't have a father here. So Sergey has become his pseudo father. This is Franco, uh, the younger version of him. Sort of, I don't know what to say about his face. You're going to see his face as an older uh, person. Uh, and you're going to see much of the mental defect that is president him. I don't know if this face is is the result of a deed he has done, if he's shot somebody and it has shocked him. I don't know because we don't see Franco in action. We don't see Franco like we see Victor holding a gun and shooting and shooting somebody after after an attempt to collect money. We only see this younger version of Franco and we're going to see an accelerated older version of, uh, of Franco later. So this is the University of Sergey, essentially. This man here is on his knees, hands tied behind his back, and Sergey is essentially teaching 
uh, Victor how to take down an enemy, how to handle an enemy. And the image of this is just interesting. You know, it's, it's so shocking that this would be okay to do with a child, right? But you start them young. That's how people uh, recruit for gangs or recruit for other type of criminal life. They get them young. And so he's eventually going to shoot him. So Sergey is teaching uh, Victor how to know his enemy, how to uh, plan for his enemy, how to prepare for his enemy, how to um, be aware of his enemy. And we're going to see this interestingly enough, when trafficking sends Sergey to kill Victor as an adult, Sergey is so far removed from his mentoring of Victor as a child that he forgets how well he trained Victor. So that when Victor, uh, when Sergey uh, slips into Victor's apartment, um, Victor already knew that he would. And Sergey thinks that he still has the upper hand, but he's gonna realize that Victor has been extremely uh, astute and smart about listening to Sergey. But what I think is very important is that Sergey forgot just how well he trained him, just how well that Victor is able to detect when Sergey comes into the apartment and then they have a conversation and then he actually shoots him. So we have Victor here reciting, my name is Victor. My name is Victor. Um, we don't see Victor making personal affirmations up until this point in the film. Uh, I do think I remember his mother calling out his name when they were in the uh, hallway and she was bent over uh, her husband and Victor passed both of them up. And uh, maybe one of the friends calls out his name. I can't remember. But this is the first time that Victor refers to himself by his own name. And this is part of the act. Remember uh, the difference between the t-shirts I called, I called attention to? The larger t-shirt that didn't fit and it's a man's t-shirt and he's trying to get into something that doesn't really fit him that uh, he's trying to step into shoes that don't fit him. The irony of it is that it is uh, Sergey who says he is actually a natural born killer. So by contrast, he's saying that this killing thing or this mob enforcer uh, thing is actually something that fits him perfectly. And we see when he shoots the, the father and the mother and almost the two girls, that it seems to come uh, with rather uh, ease. It's not as not um, as difficult as we might think it should be for him. He if it, and it was with so much ease that he had to actually be stopped. But that's contrast to the T-shirt that he wears in front of his father when he's kind of acting out the role of a child. That I believe he knows the difference. He may not understand the full implications, but I think when he presents himself with a uh, child's t-shirt in front of his father, I think he's playing a role. And when he presents himself in front of Sergey with that larger t-shirt, which is likely his father's shirt, uh, he's presenting himself as a role, right? Into a role. So, where you, so what you see here is this repetition of my name is Victor, my name is Victor, as if he is part robotic and part actor, you know, that uh, if he's ever uh, called upon to go and collect money again as a mob enforcer, he's going to start with a very simple uh, sentence, my name is Vin uh, my name is Victor. And this is part of Sergei's 
uh, mob enforcer university lessons, school lessons that he's teaching him. He's also teaching him how to blend into his environment and blending into the environment is making that kind of statement, uh, affirming yourself, calling attention to yourself, understanding your own identity. My name is Victor. So that's something that I want you to think about. So here we have Sergey teaching Victor the ways of mob enforcement. And one of the uh, important things is he's saying, um, well, I'm going to go down a list of things and then sort of expand. Uh, he's saying never miss. He's saying blend into the environment. Uh, he's also saying learn secrets of, of your enemies. Um, and in a few slides, we're going to see where he is where Sergey is talking about when necessary to bring a man to his knees um, to fully break him, a simple bullet is not enough. But what you see here is eaves dropping, is infiltration, is preparation, and then uh, eventually elimination. And this is what he's schooling him. He's schooling him on the, the ways of being a mob enforcer. So now we see an older Victor who has had many, many years of practice preparation as, as well as uh, mob enforcement through um, assassinations. And um, he takes to it like, you know, a fish to water, a duck to water, as if this is something that he's been wanting to do or should be doing um, since it was born. But that assumption is sort of disproved at the end of the film when it looks like he wants to get out. So that can't be true that he's a natural born killer if he feels unsettled when he shoots the interviewer or when he puts his gun in the um, nightstand drawer um, and sort of feeling compelled to get out of the game because now he has a woman, he has an unborn unborn child, which makes for a family. So here is where um, Sergey says, or he said to Victor before, but here's the example of it, that when necessary to bring a man to his knees to break him, a simple bullet is not enough. Now I think to myself, you're going to kill the man in a way. Why, why bring someone else in and kill that person? But it is clear to this uh, man um, that the person that they are bending by the knee is someone that he knows. And um, they're going to kill that person, which is going to break the man. So, of course, he recognizes uh, the individual. It's interesting that he doesn't call the person by name. I would think that he would call the person by name. And uh, they actually shoot him. So now we will cut to sort of like a side-by-side -side comparison. Um, uh, these are sort of two cuts at the same time. And this is Victor resigned to continuing as a mob enforcer. And this is Franco as an older individual struggling with this idea. He's not going to say that he's struggling. Uh, but the little boy that you saw, the face that you saw in the little boy, some previous slides, um, previous fr uh, frames, this is the older version of him who seems to not be able to um, take to the business in the same way that Victor does. Victor is very sort of cold, calculating, um, listens, uh, he doesn't run his mouth, he's very uh, silent in, in what he does, and whenever he brings out that gun, he's going to shoot. So Franco um, is somewhat excited and somewhat bothered by what he has done. We don't know what he's done, but we get this image of his head lowered as being 
um, as indicative of something that is bothering him. He's standing by a car and Victor and Sergey are going to drive up and um, Franco is going to sort of reveal what he has done, what he has put his hands to. And so um, there's a lighter and we don't see the full uh, lighter, but I think this is going to be the lighter that Victor gives to his father trafficking after um, capturing Franco. That's way down into the movie, but it's something to think about. And so uh, he's lighting a cigarette. He's, you know, it's interesting that he's full man, full beard. The little boy in him is still there, but it's much easier to hide behind the cigarette, hide behind the beard, hide behind the dark clothes, hide behind the fact that he does have a little bit of clout, more so over Sergey and Victor. Sergey, according to trafficking, is uh, a foot soldier. He does what he is told. And then Victor is up under. He supports the authority of um, Sergey, but they all support the larger mafia boss. So this is Franco confront, um, sort of taunting uh, Sergey off to the left and Victor off to the right, basically to get out of the car. And so um, just before this happens, Franco gets into the car in the back seat and he tells uh, Victor to go look and he kind of slaps him on the head. Victor gets out and he thinks it's maybe just a package or something like that. But then he goes and looks in the trunk of the car and it's a little girl who's killed. And this part of the business seems to bother Victor. Remember, this is the same child. This is the same man who was a child who didn't have a problem pulling a gun out on two other children his age. But now as an adult, it is bothering him that he has to pull out that a child is in the trunk, dead, killed, and dead. So he grabs his face as if to uh, maybe hold himself together, comfort himself, because he can't reveal too much of what he is feeling, uh, then it would reveal um, his disgust. And this is the little girl who's in a car. She's dead. And this is Franco laughing about it because he knows now that Victor has seen what he has done, what he has put his hands to. You know, of all the things to put, put their hands to, um, these mob enforcers, they put their hands to hurting children. You know, uh, of course, if this was trafficking, or even Sergey, had he had gotten to this problem and solved it much earlier before he killed um, the child, Sergey would have put the child to work. Trafficking would have put the child to work. Remember, Bethesda was put to work as early as 10 years old. And so I don't know what what age this young girl lives in the, in the trunk of the car, but they would have put her to work. But Franco... Uh, escalates the problem he ups the game instead of putting them to work we're just going to kill them and we don't know we we only know with franco um our first exposure to him when trafficking brings him to a head boss and he sort of he looks shocked in his thinking right that's our only sort of introduction to him and then we get this larger version of him. So we don't get the same kind of uh, you, uh, mob enforcer school lessons that Sergey gives to Victor. So we don't know how Franco has been raised in a sense, or we don't know how he has been schooled. And so he has no, he has no appetite for doing things the right way. Uh, his appetite is more along the line of being extreme. This is extreme because we don't see Victor killing a child as an adult. 
And so Franco here is there's I think there's a screw missing. I think there's a mental issue going on with him from the time that we saw him as a child and his face looked looked very shocked. So now we are at this exchange. Franco is supposed to uh, manage this exchange. There is Sergey, there is Victor, who is an enforcer. And so he is, they're going to do um, a drug trade where there's money and then drugs. And so uh, the main boss is actually in the middle, but this guy right here is going to, uh, to give over the suitcase. And so Franco looks at the drugs, he smells the drugs, uh, for whatever reason, I don't know why he's doing it the way he's doing it, uh, but this is uh, the drugs. And then um, there's something that turns off in him that he gets kind of uh, spooked or something, and he just, he he's not, his head is not in the game, you know. Uh, he has other plans, no matter, even if the drug deal could have gone well, uh, Franco had other plans from the beginning. And so he's trying to open up this uh, briefcase that has money in it. Somehow he can't open it. And he um, gets up and uh, he yells to Victor to give him the gun. Now, a gun is not, ne is not needed in this particular um, scene, really. But that tells you that Franco had already had plans to do something else. And so the guy who he's going to trade with is not impressed. You know, he's the son of a big mob boss himself. And Victor is looking at Franco trying to open up the briefcase, um, the briefcase unaware that Franco is going to mess up this drug deal. This is where we see Franco um, changing the plans, changing the game. Uh, it's, it really should be just a simple transfer, a simple deal between uh, Franco and his men. And Franco really is up under his father trafficking. Um, it should be just a simple deal with Franco and um, the other drug dealer changing drugs for money or money for drugs but this is where we see franco yelling at victor knowing that he has uh that kind of seniority because his father is the boss yelling at victor to give him the gun and we know as soon as you bring in a gun it's going to change the um, the whole dynamic especially when a gun is not necessary we don't see the opposing drug dealers or mob mob uh, people pulling out their guns. Um, if anything, they should be the ones who would feel a threat, right, from Franco and his men. But it is Franco who changes the dynamics of the game. And basically, when he kills that girl, he's changing, he's sort of, you know, disrupting the way things usually are done the standard uh, way of mob enforcement and drug dealing. So the man is not really, he's not really all that amused, but when um, Franco says to Victor to give him the gun, you see the two guys at the back ready. They are ready with their hands on their guns, just in case, right? So Victor is bothered by Franco's request. Um, and as in every case, Victor looks to Sergey for direction because after all, Sergey is his mentor, is his direct boss. But Franco has a lot of rank in this um, game just by default because his father is in charge. Trafficking is his father. So Victor is reluctant to take out his gun and give it to Franco. And in many cases, you should always be reluctant to give your own gun 
right? Why, if Franco is supposed to be this big mob enforcer under his father, why doesn't he take out his gun? And why doesn't Franco have a gun? Um, you know, that's interesting that he doesn't take out his gun. So you have to wonder if Franco has, has um, bad intentions here, that maybe he is trying to set up Victor or maybe he is trying to do much more than what what is called for at this moment. Sergey doesn't respond. Victor has to give him the gun because Victor is really, Victor is a mob enforcer, but to Franco and Trafficken, he's he's really no different than Sergey. He's a foot soldier, so he has to do what he is told. Remember that it is Sergey who is um, who confronts, who sneaks into Victor's uh, apartment to kill him and says he has no choice. He has, um, he basically has to do it, right? And it is Trafficant later who says that Sergey is a foot soldier and he does what he is told. So Sergey doesn't, doesn't give him any advice. Victor is still bothered by the request, but he ends up having to give over his gun. And Sergey looks at Franco, but Sergey is is powerless. He's really powerless. Remember the difference. Uh, remember the parallel between Victor and Sergey when they are meeting with that other boss and trafficking and his uh, and Franco. That Victor and Sergey had their heads down, but now look at Victor and Sergey. Victor has his head up but Sergey has his head down. Now he's looking at Franco to see what he's going to do. And Victor is mindful of the room uh, just in case he does have to take out a gun and shoot the other, uh, um, other drug dealers, mob enforcers. But look at Sergey and how Sergey reminds me of a parent who always has to deal with that, that wild child, that child who won't stay in line, even though Sergey is not Franco's uh, father, he just reminds you of that person who always, he see, he trusts Victor to do what he is told, to take the assignment, um, set the task, complete the task, and then report back. He trusts Victor, not just because he has trained Victor or mentored Victor. Victor is not uh, a loose cannon. He's not a hothead. Um, he may be misguided in his understanding about um, choosing to go that life, but he is certain of himself. He's sure of himself. You don't see him laughing uh, the same way Frank was. So Sergey just reminds me of that kind of father figure, pseudo father, who always has to keep up with that one child. Uh, these two are, say for instance, these two are um, Sergey's kids, and he feels like he has to keep up with that one child. It's, it's like going after that one child to sacrifice another. So I thought this was interesting, this uh, sort of scowl that he's giving Franco. Of course, um, Victor gives him the gun, so he's holding the gun. And of course, Victor has a gun at the back of him, but we don't see... Um, Sergey with a gun. Remember when I told you about Sergey uh, pulling out a gun in front of Victor's father, but not aiming it, not shooting it? I don't think Sergey is uh, capable in that way of, of having a gun. Sergey can lead people, he can teach people, he can train people, but I don't even think he's really suitable to be a mob enforcer. But Franco puts on an act just before uh, he shoots the main guy. So he shoots him. The other guys retaliate, right? And then Victor takes them both out because Victor has has, has had much more practice than the other two men. Uh, we don't see Franco practicing and being trained by anyone, but we see Victor practicing and being trained by Sergey, and we don't see Sergey shooting anyone. And so Franco um, is slipping into his mental defect, his mental uh, issues. We don't really know what those mental issues are, but he's laughing. And we're going to see another character 
do this do the exact same thing i don't understand this kind of laughing i don't understand how you can slip into this because i don't have uh personally mental issues but it's scary to have a loose cannon i do understand that and so victor is forced to shoot the other uh, the other guys uh sergey still doesn't pull out a gun and franco is on the ground laughing so then sergey runs to franco to sort of grab at him and remember the image that we had had a victor on the ground and the two bullies attacking him the one bully uh pulling him by the shirt almost choking him and so we see sergey doing this exact same thing this older guy much more seasoned trying to get this younger guy to act right and then sergey uh steps outside and um he's bothered by the whole exercise doesn't really know what to make of it but trafficking is on his way and so trafficking is pulling up in the car sergey kind of straightens up like a good soldier and then trafficking crosses uh sergey sergey with his head down so we see sergey's head down when he's in the when he's basically adjacent to trafficking and trafficking is a boss of course and it makes sense but that's when we see his head down uh he doesn't um do much more than when he is uh engaged and so um trafficking is talking to his son franco here and he calls out papa i'm i'm hurt and uh trafficking is really upset with him but he doesn't really admonish him because he's concerned for his son and i don't necessarily think he's concerned for his son because the son has been hit and he's bleeding but he's concerned for his son because this son killed another son of a major boss and so now they're going to have to cover it up but i wonder how much trafficking could have solved this problem much earlier in his son had he not put him into the business had he not sort of put his son to work right that it seems like these mob enforcers these these mob bosses that that they are inclined to put their children to work so that lets you know on some level they don't have enough money to let their children uh, be free and go to private school away from the business so these are really lower level mob bosses and then victor looks at that dynamic between father and son uh trafficking kind of looks at victor uh he doesn't let victor in on the idea that he's going to set him up to be killed by sergey but victor doesn't speak he he's just like that young boy he was when he was uh a child just having that head down not speaking silent etc but his head is up this time so trafficking is telling sergey uh no traces he doesn't say directly get rid of uh victor it's just understood no traces because he's not going to let his son take to uh, fall for it even though his son caused the problems instead uh there needs to be at least a dead person uh from this particular mob crew and so victor is going to have to be the fall guy he's going to have to be the scapegoated person to take the fall for uh his friend franco and is really not his friend but you know and sergey is bothered by this he understands what he must uh do and they both look at uh what the handiwork of franco and what he has done and they don't really understand the implications but it's interesting how sergey is standing by standing uh on the side of a person that he's about to uh, uh to kill that this is the same person that he raised from a um adolescent um trained to kill trained how to uh surveil has 
develop a respect for each other and he's going to have to kill him. And they're standing side by side. And they've been standing side by side from the time that he, from the time that Victor decided to become a mob enforcer. So Victor uh, closes uh, the suitcase, that, um, the, uh, the briefcase that has the money. And we see the son of a major boss killed, shot in the head. So this news is going to get back. There's no way you can really cover this up. You couldn't even uh, say burn him or, you know, bury him. This is going to get back to uh, his head, his father, his head boss. And so Victor is going through a door. This is his apartment door. And remember how I said that Victor... Uh, sort of stays behind certain doors and doesn't come through. And this is a door. Now, this door is his place of um, shelter. So he's oh, he's walking into the door after that exercise from whatever that night is because he's he has a change of clothes here. Uh, when he was at the warehouse, he had a uh, leather jacket and jeans. So now he has a suit jacket on. So we don't know the distance between the time frame between um, that warehouse meeting and now we just know that that he has changed clothes. But he's coming through a door expecting to be um, to have peace in his own place. And so then right before we see Sergey slip in, Victor goes into the bathroom um, maybe to fake out whoever is going to come through the door but turns on the shower and um we see sergey slip in so how is it that sergey knows how to get in uh there must be some familiarity uh sergey must have been there before in order to be able to know exactly how to slip in now of course uh he has trained himself in and how to slip into an apartment you know that's just obvious. He has age on him. But that also tells you on some level that there's some familiarity that Sergey has with this place, especially in the way that he moves about. So then uh, he moves about and then it is um, Victor who knows he's coming. And we don't know how Victor knows he's coming, but he knew he was coming because he had his gun out with the silencer now remember what i told you that victor i mean uh, sergey forgot how well he trained his pupil that he trained victor in this way of of knowing when the enemy is coming in and being ready with the gun and so he forgot or or he may be slipping or maybe he wanted to be caught because it's interesting that uh sergey wasn't already in the apartment Whatever time frame Victor was away from the apartment, Sergey could have been in that apartment and, and he could have been waiting and waiting to blast Victor. The fact that he didn't have that foresight tells you that he really didn't want to do this. But we understand that Victor um, knew on some level that he was going to be scapegoated because why would he all of a sudden pull out a gun in front of his mentor? And so Victor is turned around by this, you know, um, this person coming through the door of his apartment to kill him. And he's actually surprised and it bothers him. So his face, uh, whatever blank face he has had throughout the film, it has, this face is a hurt face. And so, of course, um, he has to control the situation no matter who the person is. And so he keeps, uh, he keeps Sergey um, at gunpoint to make sure that he can control the situation, which is likely something that Sergey taught him to do. So basically, it's interesting. Sergey is receiving the fruits of his own labor in a sense, right? The fruits of teaching someone how to be a mob enforcer. He's now experiencing it. And so um, here, Victor is looking at the choice of weapon is something that will blast Victor. It was a, it's a big, long, thick shotgun type, uh, type weapon. And he's, uh, Victor is saying to Sergey, um, good choice. Here's that weapon, 
that he um, hits a couple of times and says, good choice. And then Sergey basically goes into his spiel, goes into his speech. Go, and whether he has prepared that speech or not is one that he has thought about uh, when contemplating how he was going to kill the person he has uh, helped and raised and, and basically loved. So he's really bothered by this. He's telling him that he has no other uh, choice but to do it. And um, and that if he didn't do it, that, that he was going to die. But it's interesting that his face changes from the time that he beat up Victor's father and how resolute he was in, in you know, dealing with the father and punching him in the gut and everything to now looking at the son. And it's interesting that he would kill the father. He was going to kill. He killed the father and was going to kill the son. But Victor is well aware of how the system works. And so uh, this is where we see Victor actually uh, cry a tear. He doesn't do any heavy crying just yet, but we see him. This is the first time he didn't cry when his father was beating his mother. He didn't cry uh, when his father was killed. Uh, he didn't cry when he had to leave his mother and move to the new city, uh, move to a city. Um, I can't remember any other time prior to this, but he didn't cry. But now he cries because Sergey was like a father to him. And uh, and if he's crying, he loved Sergey, whatever love means within this context. And so for Sergey to turn on him and betray him and want to kill him and not even try to come to him and say, we need to uh, get you out of the country and, and fake his death. Remember when he shoots the father and the son, and I mean, uh, the father and the wife and then almost the two girls, it's uh, Sergey who basically says, let's get you out of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the town and into the city. And it was sort of like a way of, you know, faking his death. There's nothing in Sergey that basically says, let's do this again. Let's make sure that uh, you are you are not killed. So I'm going to stage your death. I'm going to bring somebody in, stage your death, pretend you're dead, take some identification, right? And and we're going to um, get you out of town and no one will be the wiser. So Sergey, on some level might have wanted to kill Victor because there was nothing in him that said, I can't really do this. I'm going to have to find another way even if traffic and finds out, I'm, I just I just can't do this. And so that's interesting. I never thought about it until now that Sergey was still willing to kill Victor. All the resources at his disposal, he could have easily found a way to smuggle Victor out of the country, and he doesn't. Victor's head turns because he is faced with a decision that he doesn't want to make when he when he has to kill other people as an assassin. It's just not a decision that he has to make. It's just something that he does. He doesn't think about it too long. He gets it done. But this one, he's going to have to make a hard life decision, which represents his setback because um, it's a setback for him. It's a setback for the relationship that he has for Sergey, and it's a setback for Sergey himself. Sergey, that he has to kill the person that he's been training. Um, Victor, he has to kill the person who has been training him. And then both of them, their relationship has developed. Uh, it's it's inherent in the plot plot development that they that they have a strong relationship and now it is experiencing a setback and he is forced to make a make a decision that is going to be life-changing that means he will never be able to have access to this mentor ever again once he shoots him once he kills him and that's something that he thinks about that really bothers him that he never thought he would ever have to be confronted with that type of decision.
And no one wants to be confronted with the decision to kill a mentor. You know, the way that you can kill a mentor, if we were, le if we were looking at this from a different context and not the mob enforcer, hitman, assassin context, you can kill a, a mentor uh, when you decide to go your own way in life. Here it is. They have trained you in their ways and, and prepared you to go forward. And then you end up doing something that costs you your freedom and going to jail. Well, there's a teacher, there's a mentor and a, and a teacher that we always think about in terms of what went wrong with that person. Why is it that they get to this age and they do this this X thing right here, uh, X, Y, Z, uh, who trained him, who taught him? Uh, who helped him? Who wasn't there for him as a, a child? And we always go back and look back on that person's history, that person's narrative history. You can kill a mentor that way by by embarrassing him, by not not doing the things that he taught you. That's why I am careful as a teacher that I don't engage in certain types of activities that would bring shame to me as a person, to me as an uh, uh, just an individual, um, and to me as a teacher of the profession. And so, um, because I would not want to kill, so to speak, my mentor. I had a mentor who was a taskmaster, and he was a mentor uh, when I was an undergraduate, then when I was in graduate school, and then a little bit after um, um, college. And so that would be the, the best way to kill that mentor would be to do something so bad that it's so criminal that I end up in prison. And that's how you can kill a mentor uh, in that way as well. Not literally, but metaphorically. So he is forced here now in the same way that you hear uh, Sergey saying that he has no other choice, Victor here has no other choice. Now, he could decide not to do it and tell Sergey to give me a head start to leave the country, right? And then they go chasing after him. Uh, Victor must, on some level, want to kill Sergey in the same way that Sergey, on, on, on some level, want to kill Victor. There's nothing in him that that is resistant long term. So there's something, is this face, this, I think this, this is the first time we're seeing a side profile of Victor. And we, we are seeing the distress, the hurt in his eyes, uh, the pain in his face, uh, the veins in his neck, his ears even are, are affected, the hair on his head, the, uh, the beard, the, uh, the mustache, everything is affected. The clothes that he's wearing don't feel as comfortable now. And so that's something that I want you to think about that he's really distressed about this decision that he has to make. So this is where Victor, this is where we get the word attachment. It is, it is Sergey who says that Victor has no attachment, that he, he is just uh, basically uh, um, stone-faced, um, has no attachment, um, meaning that He's not really affected by the fact that he has to kill somebody. But it is Victor who pulls out that bill that Sergey gave him as a child. And Sergey is actually surprised. So that bill meant something to Victor. He didn't, again, he didn't give it to his mom to solve a problem or anything like that. But it meant something to him for him to keep that all those years. He might have been 12, 13 years old when he first became a mob enforcer, maybe even 10, I don't know. And here he might be in his late 30s or probably middle 30s, right? And so no matter what, he has kept that for over 10 years. That whole time it has been. So that lets you know he did have an attachment uh, to Sergey. Sergey really didn't understand the pupil. Even until his death here, he didn't understand the pupil. He thought he understood him as someone 
who uh, is just a natural born killer, will do whatever he's told, etc. And he didn't really know his pupil all that well, because if he did, he would have known that his pupil, his mentee, kept the bill that he gave him uh, as for, for sentimental value. He never spent that bill. He never gave that bill over to anyone. It was something that he was attached to. And this is the reason why I decided to add attachment theory to the case analysis at the end of the uh, film analysis because it is Sergey who mentions the term. And attachment is a psychological concept that we are going to explore later. And so, Victor, I mean, um, yeah, Victor is making his appeal without really even speaking. The fact that he his face is pain and he's holding his bill tells you tells you everything about how he feels about uh, Sergey and how much respect that he had for him and how much love that he had for him. And so now this is where Victor is forced to confront and kill uh, Sergey. And in some ways, I wonder if Sergey is a pseudo father to him, a father figure. How much uh, does this gun here represent uh, Victor's real desire to kill his own father? Now, he never gets the chance to do it, of course. It's Sergei who assassinates him. We don't see Sergei do it, but we just know that, that the father has been assassinated. And so it's probably not Sergei who did it. It's probably another foot soldier that Sergei sent to kill Victor's father. But it's very interesting that he's holding a gun at his chest uh, at his uh, heart, and uh, and how much that sort of pains him to have to make this decision, and he shoots him quickly. He doesn't wait too long. He doesn't drop the gun. He doesn't have a change of mind. He knows that he has really no other choice but to shoot him, and he shoots him. Sergey is shocked by the shot, of course. His face changes. He is, his face looks like death. And Victor is turned around by this idea. It really bothers him. Turns his head. He can't even watch it. Can't even see it. And he drops his head there. This is where we see Victor now uh, faking his death. So uh, these are men who were likely standing guard for Sergey and so he takes them out in some kind of way and he and he drags them to this um, apartment and um, Victor is switching out identification information uh, uh, wallets things like that as well as this watch so that when uh, they come looking for him uh, they would think it is him instead of um, this person here. I don't remember what he does with uh, Sergey. I don't know if he buries him because he can't leave Sergey burned with the other men, right? Because if he does that, it's going to be revealed that he's actually really alive. So we don't see what he does. All we see is Victor setting fire to the apartment. So he has the gasoline. He's about to set fire. To the apartment or to this building whatever it is and then we get this smoke we get a fire and we get a smoke and so um in 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 other words all of what all of whatever progress he put into being a mob enforcer for sergey for um for trafficking is now all up in smoke there's no turning back he basically has no other choice but to leave. And this is kind of when he sets this on fire like this, you know, this is almost like looking back at his own narrative history with that mob um, organization, that mob heart, uh, hierarchy, that his narrative history now has to um, basically go up in smoke as if it never even happened. But the people are... The people who are part of this uh, organization are very suspicious about whether or not he's actually dead. They don't have any proof. They just have this fire 
and they have to assume that he's dead. But knowing how much they know how skilled Victor is, it is always the case that he might actually be alive. But when he looks at this, he's looking at his narrative history because he has to go into hiding. He's going to go to a whole new country, London, England, and um, assume another identity. So this look back here and is basically watching his narrative history go up in flames. And so trafficking is in what maybe looks like his library reading a book and someone comes in with uh, some sort of you know, package or something like that. We don't know what this is. We may find out later that it is connected to Bethesda, but uh, it's just a, really an envelope of pictures. So he's looking at the pictures. The book is still open. And then he places the pictures in the book and closes the book. So we know what that basically means in terms of metaphorically speaking, that he's closing the book on that person's, on Victor's contribution to his organization. He's closing the book on him. He, of course, the the pictures may be more than enough at this season, at this time to, uh, to suggest that Victor truly is dead. But for now, he doesn't have any, um, any inclination to check and see other than looking at the pictures themselves, right? And so closing the book is closing like uh, Victor's narrative history with trafficking. And also this closes uh, the book in terms of uh, trafficking still being able to operate as a mob boss, even though his his son, Franco, was actually the culprit in the whole exercise. His son is safe. His son is safe for now. And so, and we don't know how long he's going to be safe, but he's safe for now. So now we see uh, London, England, and we get the back of um, Victor's head. We don't know what he's thinking about, but we do understand that he's in another country. We get his reflection through the uh, window, and we don't know what he's thinking about. The narrative when um, he's in London, England, he doesn't go into a reflection period. He just understands where he is and he's got to now, now find a whole new mob boss. He, he's got to find a way to be of use again. And so he doesn't get into this whole sort of contemplative journal writing. Let's think about this. Let's think about this betrayal that just happened uh, before we go on ahead and make a choice to do something else. And so the setback, a lot of times a setback should be useful for you thinking about uh, areas of weakness before going on to greater battles. And th that's the definition of setback that I use from a minister, Bishop T.D. Jakes's uh, series, Step It Up, that came out sometime in 2006. And so he's talking about the, the, uh, the purpose of a setback is not for you to uh, be upset and pout and whine. The purpose of a setback is for you to uh, reflect on areas of weakness and fix them before going on to greater battles. How is it that Sergei was able to make a decision to kill Victor, despite what trafficking tells him to do, that there was nothing in him that was more resistant to it uh, or more um, inclined in him to go and try to uh, hide him or something like that. So on some level, he felt like Victor was a person he could kill. Because if he had any fear of Victor, if he truly had any fear of Victor, he wouldn't have attempted it. Or if he had fear of him, he would have been in the apartment before Victor came. So, so uh, um, Sergey really trained and framed Victor as someone who could be killed. It never occurred to him that he would he would um, not be killed, right? So that is also something to think about because Victor did not frame uh, Sergey as a person who could uh, could be killed because if that was the case, he would have killed Sergey a long time ago. 
to assume a position to to be as a higher ranking um, uh, mob enforcer, he would have killed him a long time ago. So that lets you know that Victor, it never crossed his mind that Sergei could be a person that he killed, that that all of the other people that he killed, those are, those are you know, assignments. Sergei uh, was never an assignment, but uh, as much as the mob gave Victor assignments to kill people, Victor was forced to give himself an assignment to kill Sergei, his mentor. So we see um, Victor walking up some stairs. And to me, this is symbolic of not only moving forward, but the attempt to move up, right? That the stairs represent ascension and that he's now going to figure out who the who the current boss is of the city. Um, go into this hotel room and look for the bugs in the room because Sergey was the one who always told him that hotels like this or the types of uh, places that bug uh, rooms, especially the rooms of politicians or businessmen or anything like that, so they can use something against them and get their way. And so this walking up the stairs, it represents some form of ascension, moving from the lower levels of dealing with traffic and Sergey Franco to now moving up higher levels. He's even changed his dress. He's even changed his garb. He's not wearing the jeans and, and the shoes and the t-shirt and the leather jacket he's wearing a suit he knows that in each area in each context you have to change your dress you have to uh, move yourself to a higher level of thinking and so this going up the stairs represents on some level his ascending his ascension uh later he's not going to uh keep the mob enforcer job because he says it's too much risk um and we'll get into it, but we're looking at him from the back again. Remember, remember the back where uh, he was running through the tunnel and we thought there was a lot of, um, kind of like a monkey on his back. And then we remember him as a child from the back when he's making the decision to become a mob enforcer and be of use to Sergei. So now we're looking at him who's supposed to be a dead man. He faked his death. Uh, in Romania. He's supposed to be a dead man. This dead man is uh, wearing a suit. He's he's wanting to enter a whole new phase of his mob enforcement. And he is not only moving uh, forward, but moving up. So he's in, a, in someone's room. He's checking uh, the bugs in the room, seeing where they are. It's a nice room, of course. And he finds a bug behind the of the bed, and it, and it makes sense, especially if one of the uh, one of the mob people decided to give over a child to him to have sex with. He, uh, they could frame him later for um, anything that they wanted in terms of you know benefits, advantages. This would definitely work well for a politician like a bug in um, in his hotel room, so that if he's caught with someone, the mob could use that against him and get him to give them um, economic kickbacks, right, for anything that they are wanting to do or just look the other way. So the guy comes in who's um, who is part of the surveillance team, uh, Victor uh, decides to take him down. And then he comes across uh, the person who was surveilling and he takes his computer and he's listening to tapes in the same way that Sergey trained him to listen to tapes, find out where he can get in, what sort of, uh, where the gaps are, right? And he listens to this tape and realizes that there's somebody there's somebody who is a snitch who is stashed in a safe house. And he feels like uh, that may be his way in to the mob boss. So Victor is listening. 
um, getting as much information as he can. The goal is to look for something for something that he can be of use because that's how he starts his career. He doesn't have any uh, aspirations to be a mob boss himself. You know, this is his opportunity to be a mob boss. But it looks like he might need some money because when the mob boss he meets asks him to take on a, um, an assignment, Victor discusses price. So that lets you know he has price in mind. He has money in mind. And uh, I guess the strategy would be to not only be of use, but also make money so you can set yourself up just in case you have to move again. So this guy here is connected to whom, uh, to uh, what Victor is going to find out later about um, the, the person Rafa. I never really quite got a, a good understanding of who this person is, but this person is central to Victor finding out who the snitch is. Uh, where he is housed, where he is stashed. His name is Rafa. So this guy is not Rafa, but he is connected to uh, information that Victor is going to need to find where Rafa is. So Victor um, sort of eyeballs him. The guy is going into the restroom. Victor gets up. He goes through a door, and this door is his way metaphorically of trying to get into a new system through this guy via this guy but it is his way of trying to get in so remember the door that he refused to go through to help his father and mother the door that he crosses to uh, become a mob enforcer uh, the door into his apartment the door leaving his apartment to fake his death right uh, he's in a whole new country, and this door he's entering uh, is symbolic of him now wanting to enter a new mob hierarchy, a new mob organization. So he catches the guy by uh, the neck, of course, to get information from him. Victor is very focused in his efforts, so he's, he's holding a gun. And... Um, uh, this is sort of like maybe the third time that we see him holding a gun from the time he was a child, the time that Franco messed up the drug deal, and to now. I, I could be wrong, but um, he's not like Sergey in terms of not having a gun at all. But when he takes out a gun, it's for a purpose. It's not for to play with. It's not for to, uh, to threaten. It's for him to take action. Now, he doesn't shoot this person here but um, he does make it possible for him to be knocked out. And so um, Victor is watching his surroundings, of course. And then of course he takes down the guy. He gets the information that he needs and then he takes down the guy, he doesn't shoot him. And uh, here is where he's surveilling again. We get the back of him so we can see the image of the piece of guy. And that's sort of like his MO. He becomes a pizza guy, right, uh, to get in. But this is the back. Uh, we're looking at two guys. One is a pizza guy in a townhouse, and he's going to have guards that he's going to see later. So that's a, uh, I think that is actually Rafa. Could it be Rafa. And so, Victor is now surveilling the area, trying to figure out who is where. Um, you know, I'm surprised there aren't any security guards or anything like that, because he's it's, it's just easy for him to get into something, whereas, I mean, this guy is a snitch on the mob, so why isn't he heavily, really heavily guarded? And we get Victor uh, looking um, at the location to see a way to get in. And then we have Victor laying out the uh, the tools of the trade, you know, the gun and everything that is connected to it. He's changed his dress, not, not only from a suit to the jogging suit, but back to his jeans and his uh, leather jacket. 
And so he um, comes in, he shoots uh, the guards. These are the other guards that he shoots. He takes Rafa by the neck and uh, Rafa is saying to this guard holding a gun, don't shoot, don't shoot. But then Victor ends up shooting the guy. And then um, Victor uh, places him on his knees and remember that he's a snitch. So what Victor is about to do is almost a way of shutting him up. So he gives him cotton or some kind of um, handkerchief or something like that to put in his mouth. And you know that's symbolic of him shutting up. You won't have the opportunity to snitch because I'm going to turn you over to a boss so I can get into a new system. So you're going to have to shut your mouth. And then there's a camera that Victor sees. And he looks up at that camera. And uh, it should be something that is alarming. But this is not the camera, really that actually reveals the fact that um, Victor is alive. It is in the restaurant when the guys take Bethesda into the kitchen and harm her that Victor doesn't realize that they are on camera. And that's the camera that um, Bethesda uses to frame Victor and reveal the fact that he's still alive. So Victor drives this guy, this Rafa guy, to this um, to the warehouse of a boss that he now wants to put himself uh, to use for. And of course, they have to pat him down, right? And then Victor walks him through the uh, warehouse, um, tied, gagged. Uh, of course, which means that he can no longer snitch. It's interesting that he doesn't blindfold him. You know, what if he got away? He would know the location, but uh, bound and tied is enough. And this is the second lieutenant of uh, the new boss that Victor is going to now want to work for. He's kind of suspicious, but we see Victor... Uh, with the guy uh, on his knees, Rafa on his knees, and uh, the boss here is asking Victor, who are you? And Victor says, that's not important. What is important is what I can do for you, things your men can't. And that's sort of offensive because none of the men were able to find Rafa in order to bring him to this boss. But that's interesting that they couldn't find him um, or did they refuse to find him? Because Victor is saying things your man can't, meaning they're not able to, but it is the second lieutenant here in, his, in this uh, black suit with the white uh, collared shirt looking at Victor that is gonna set up the boss. So you almost have to wonder then is the second lieutenant behind Rafa. Rafa doesn't talk or say anything to the second lieutenant, uh, and maybe Victor doesn't give him a chance, um, but it's something that a mob network of people, foot soldiers, you know, leaders could not find this one snitch. And I have to reason that they did not want to find him. Or, or the second lieutenant set it up where they could not find him or refused to find him. So um, this boss here is um, interested in taking Victor on. I mean, it is impressive that he was able to find the snitch, but um, it is uh, the lieutenant, the, uh, the second lieutenant, who says, who accuses Victor of being a cop. And uh, he's the one who suggests, why don't we keep him and kill you, right? Keep Rafa and um, kill Victor. Which is odd though, because wouldn't you want to kill the snitch? Sure, if you wanted to kill Victor, go on ahead and kill Victor. But why is it that you're going to keep the snitch and kill Victor?
right? When you don't even really, you really don't know anything about him. At least give it some time to check him out, right? To run his record through uh, the network. But it's interesting that um, the second lieutenant guy would, would actually say, let's keep the snitch and kill Victor. So the guy is, uh, of course, afraid for his life. We don't know what kind of person he is, so we don't get a really narrative background on him other than the fact that he's a snitch and that he was stashed in a safe house. But we don't know what he's snitching about. But we do understand that this boss man, this mob boss, uh, has a way of killing people who are reporting on him. So later when Victor decides that he's not going to continue with the business, and the boss man gives him his last assignment to kill a journalist, a reporter, um, it seems like he wants people uh, killed who won't play ball because his first assignment is going to be for Victor to kill, actually kill a cop who, who can't be bought, right? And it seems like the boss is the kind of person, this mob boss is the kind of person, he wants to kill those types of people uh, he cannot uh, convince, he cannot persuade um, anyone who sort of speaks or writes anything against him. So then we have to think to ourselves, Rafa might have been a previous mob enforcer uh, who was approached by a cop, by maybe the same cop that Victor is going to kill through liquid, um, liquid nicotine and that they are connected, that maybe it was the police who stashed them there, of course. And so, uh, but he usually tries to kill people or has people killed who can't be bought, who cannot be changed, who cannot be converted, who cannot be persuaded, and people who basically write or speak things against him. So here we have the second lieutenant accusing uh, Victor of being a cop, of course, pointing a gun at him. Victor doesn't, Victor is cool. One thing about it, Victor is cool. He stays cool. He doesn't try to take the gun out of, out of the man's uh, hand. He doesn't try to fight the man. He doesn't uh, try to, he doesn't even turn his face to argue with him. They both are looking at the mob boss, but it's just interesting that Victor is very cool in the way that he handles himself. So the um, mob boss is kind of intrigued, uh, wanting to know much more about him, but Victor is going to give him a phone and basically say, I'll call you, give you some time to think about my offer. But he's saying to the boss here that he, he says he can basically be of use. So he is of use. Uh, he did call Victor and they are now sitting in a car uh, discussing um his assignment and this is where victor is asking about a price or or he gives information to this mob boss about a price and and the mob boss is actually surprised you know he kind of you know, chuckles a little bit but this is the trade you know he's um victor is trading his services as a mob enforcer for pay and interestingly enough he's not even trading his services uh, for loyalty, right? Remember, he just got out of a situation where he had to fake his death. He was loyal to a person who was his master or his mentor, and that person turned on him. So now he's he never talked about price before. You knew that he wasn't concerned about price because he kept that very same bill he got from Sergey from a child. So it was never about price. It was it was maybe about family, uh, having a father figure, having someone that he can trust, feeling protected, covered, or whatever, having a purpose, you know, even though it's assassin being a hitman, it still feels like purpose. That's why you see, that's why you uh, hear Caesar talks about Mark, who their other family, um, their other uh, childhood friend, uh, calling him mother fucked, meaning that either I'm going to be a motherfucker or I'm going to be motherfucked. And he's saying that he's implying that because Marku did not choose to become a mob enforcer, he never grew. He never got out of the slums, 
uh, in, car, in common parlance, he never got out of, out of the hood. He never made much more of himself than what he looks like. And we're going to see what he looks like. And so even if even if mob enforcing is uh, crime and it's assassination uh, and it's hitman uh, like uh, uh, attitudes, it's something that is of purpose. It gives these childhood friends purpose. So this is where he is discussing price. Again, we never hear of him discussing price in any other capacity, but now he's discussing price. So that means he's over the loyalty bit. He's over the betrayal bit. Uh, he's going to be of service to someone, but he's not going to go down the same way he did before. He'll never let himself be um, tricked again. And so now Victor is looking at the information. This is uh, the boss giving Victor a task, an assignment, and it is a cop. And the cop is the type of person who cannot be bought. And so he basically wants... Victor to um, sort of complete the task. So we have a picture of the guy who is the cop who can't be bought and what, and it is up to Victor to do, uh, to design a way to assassinate him or to kill him. And so now we look at um, liquid smoke. This is how he's going to kill him. He's going to, uh, he's creating the liquid smoke. He's going to place it in his coffee, which is then going to induce a heart failure. And so here's the guy who is sitting at a cafe wanting to be served, right? He hasn't quite sat down yet, but there's the intent to sit down. That means that he, he plans on staying, right? It's not like he came into the cafe and got a drink and, and walked out. But of course, this must be a popular cafe for him in order for Victor to be there to administer the liquid, uh, smoke a liquid, nic uh, liquid nicotine. So then we have a cut to Victor preparing it, right? And he comes in as a regular uh, type of uh, customer in, in, in the appropriate garb. So it's almost like he's looking like the guy who's now who he's now about to kill. He has on this kind of like this uh, corduroy jacket uh, with a collared shirt and then uh, some jeans of sort, and he's wearing some glasses. So he's now acting out a role, and I feel like he, if he needs. Remember what Sergey says, you have to blend into your environment. So in every environment, he changes his garb. And this is the way the people look around this particular environment, this cafe environment. So he purposely drops it on him so he can then turn around and go get him another, which allows for him to put liquid smoke into the uh, coffee. And, and so then we see him still sort of like this going back and forth of him meeting the person and then preparing the poison at his apartment or at his warehouse. And then he's able to take uh, part of it and place it into uh, another container. And we see him doing that here because then it has to be uh, something that's small enough that he could quickly do it without the bartender or the, uh, the barista um, noticing what he's doing and then we are cut back to where he is where he has the coffee and he's pouring it into the uh, man's coffee to give uh, him a second cup and again look at his clothes he doesn't even look like a hitman he takes off his glasses right uh, which are of course fake but he's wearing a collar shirt he's looking like the man he's about to kill He's looking like the man. You, you know, interestingly enough, he never looked like Sergey. See, that tells you right then and uh, there that he never planned on killing Sergey. He never looked like Sergey. Sergey wore uh, a suit, not a really nice, fancy suit, but a suit nonetheless. And he never looked like him. But he's looking like the guy he's about to kill. So he comes and gives him the coffee. Then he quickly leaves. The guy drinks the coffee, feel, it tastes a little funny, and then he basically kills over. 
um, Sergey, I mean, um, uh, Victor reports back to this mob boss. He's wearing a suit again uh, without a tie. And remember that this is, a, uh, I think this is the same suit or, or, or the same kind of look that we see when he's first coming off the plane. Uh, we have to assume that uh, when he's coming off the plane is to meet with the interviewer. So remember, we haven't seen the interviewer in a long time, but this is basically uh, uh, Victor laying out how he became a mob uh, enforcer and how he continued it with another um, mob boss. But he, he is reporting back to the mob boss here. And so uh, he's pulling at him like he would a son, uh, very comfortable with Victor. Um, Victor has proven himself here. There are two girls on the couch and they're gonna go and celebrate. So he looks at him again, like a father to a son. We don't see the same dynamic between him and the other guy who accused him, uh, the second lieutenant who accused Victor of being a cop. But we know Victor is not a cop. And we know this guy believes, this mob boss believes that Victor is really not a cop. It's gonna be his loyalty to um, Victor or his acceptance of Victor is about to be tested, however. So um, he's upset, of course. This second lieutenant here is upset at the fact that who is this person coming into their environment to make changes, to um, uh, be a major influence? Because after all, he's the one who's supposed to be the major influence. But you have to think to yourself, why, if, he, if he's a second lieutenant, why wasn't he able to find Rafa himself? Why wasn't he able to uh, dispatch his footmen to find him. One thing about Sergey, he could find somebody. He, uh, the Victor's father managed to run away from Sergey, but Sergey managed to find him and assassinate him. So Sergey was very good about, um, you know, the logistics of the trade. But this person here, to me, he just wears a suit and he's part of a mob, but he's not really effective because it shouldn't have taken um, Victor, an outsider, to come in and and actually uh, sort of have an impact the way he has. So then they go and um, go and celebrate the mob boss, Victor, and the two women. And remember, these are likely women who started out as children who were put to work. So uh, it is very significant, their role. Um, they just so happen to be on a couch waiting. I don't think so. These are usually the types of women that they have put to work. It's interesting that Victor notices that the elevator is not working but it doesn't prompt him to think about it long enough. He just looks at it, the elevator is not working, let's go upstairs. Nothing in him that sort of uh, wonders about it, thinks about it, checks it out, or even push a button right to check and see if it actually works. So this is where I feel like he's letting down his guard. This is a setback for him because here it is, he's trying to push himself forward to become uh, to be of use to a new mob enforcer, but he's not quick on his feet here to think about whether or not the setup, whether or not they are walking into a setup that he's supposed to be protecting this this boss of his, right? And basically he's not protecting him. So they go up the stairs uh, the boss is interestingly enough, Victor is going ahead of the boss, which is odd, right? They're not partners. He's supposed to be the mob enforcer, meaning that he's supposed to be protecting the new boss, but he's not. So that, again, that's part of his setback process because he's not operating in the traditional way that he has normally been operating since a child. 
So there's laughter, there's happiness. Uh, Victor, I guess, feels a little relaxed and then he's about to walk into the setup. So he fights the guy, uh, takes the gun out of his hand, uh, takes him down. And then the boss tells one of the girls to uh, to get the gun, right? Victor is actually noticeably shocked by this, which he shouldn't be. His defenses are so low that he doesn't recognize uh, a setup before it becomes a setup. And the boss is shocked. And so he pulls a gun out on Victor which sets him back because remember he's supposed to be the person who is uh the one who just killed somebody on his behalf and now he's pulling a gun out on victor and of course the mob boss is going to be more skeptical now because maybe he's thinking that victor set him up so of course he has to play this role to get back to um his place of comfort and his foot soldiers and his footmen. So then they make it back to the warehouse and then the second lieutenant comes in. And I had wonder, wondered whether he was behind the setup and we find out that he actually is, but he's very shocked. And the shock that he has on his face is kind of minimal, but it is shock. It's like, why is he here? He should be dead. And he's sitting there holding his side because he has been shot and he's actually surprised. And uh, it is uh, this second lieutenant, his name is Kovacs. And um, he's laughing. And remember that uh, that laugh from Franco is the same kind of mentally disturbed type laugh. And I'm not, I don't know if he's the son of this mob boss. I couldn't get a, a good read on it, but I do realize that he's the second lieutenant and his name is Kovacs. So he's laughing. He's suggesting that Victor is actually the culprit who, who, um, who set up the boss. But it's going to be found out that uh, the boss is going to call a telephone number and that the phone that rings is actually Kovacs, his second lieutenant. And so there's this sort of uh, ruse, ruse that Kovacs does see. I knew it was you. I knew it's you. I, I knew we couldn't trust him, right? He does this ruse, right? This whole sort of... Um, play by play, scene by scene, actor by actor type of thing to kind of throw off um, any suspicion of him. But he, it's undeniable that he has a contribution here. Of course, he, he gets into a laugh, accusing Victor, uh, saying, uh, and uh, the boss is saying, somebody knew we were coming and then the boss is going to call the phone. He does a pointing and I always remember when a, a, a liar tends to do a lot of pointing. So the more he's pointing towards Victor, the more he's really telling off on himself because he doesn't know Victor enough to point at him and call him a liar. So then the boss pulls out the phone that he retrieved uh, from the site. So whoever uh, was hired to kill this boss, um, this is actually his phone. So he calls the phone and Kovacs's phone rings. Before that, we have him holding a gun, um, holding Victor at gunpoint as if to make some sort of case that I got him. I got the. I got the person. The irony is, why didn't he hold Rafa at gunpoint when Rafa came in? When Victor brought Rafa in, why didn't uh, Kovacs here 
pull out a gun to ensure that Rafa stayed down on the ground. He never pulls out a gun. He sort of looks at Victor and he looks at the boss and he's accusatory, but he never pulls out a gun, but he's pulling out a gun now. Also, this is also symbolic of the idea that he never, uh, you know, dispatches any of his own foot soldiers because he's second lieutenant. So that means he got some people under him. He never dispatches any of his own foot soldiers to find Rafa. So I think Rafa is is actually uh, connected to Kovacs. We don't get a full development in terms of uh, uh, plot development, but we just have to assume. So he's holding a gun, Victor is cool. He doesn't do much more than just wait. Because remember, um, this second lieutenant, Kovacs, is not the one in charge. So as much as he wants to hold a gun to Victor's uh, uh, face, to his person, he can't shoot. He's not permitted to shoot. So this is basically theater. It's really no different than theater. Because he know he has no power other than what the main boss says he has. And the main boss is already now going to be suspicious of him because he's so quick to pull out the gun to try to shoot Victor. So he calls the phone because he is suspicious, right? It's interesting that he will call the phone. There's a guy who is... Uh, with the major rifle um, sort of guarding the main boss. That's why I say Kovacs has no real power other than what the main boss gives him. And then uh, the phone rings and it's uh, the number of Kovacs or the second lieutenant. And then of course uh, he falls to the ground and uh, the main boss does his spiel, you know, in terms of um, giving him a talking to. And then we have Victor holding a gun to Kovacs. It's interesting the, uh, the conversations we have with people right before uh, they are about to die or they are about to be killed or or we are about to kill them. Uh, he already set up his boss. So why even have the talking to? We know that you're going to kill the person. So why even have the conversation? It's not like he's going to remember it after his death. It would have been better to keep him alive and, pro and possibly torture him and get more out of him, how many times has he sold sold him out to somebody than to just immediately kill him. But these conversations that we have right before uh, um, a decision we are about to make really takes a lot of energy. It's almost unnecessary. This is a loose cannon. There's no reasoning with him in the same way there was no reasoning with Franco. And so talking to him and having a conversation with him is just not going to do any good. And so we see that face, that's Franco face. That's that same kind of mental defect that Franco had when he had just shot that, um, shot that drug dealer, that mob, um, mob son. And so again, it doesn't matter whether um, Victor holds a gun to him and shoots him or not. Um, in his mind, he's just, it really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you say to me. I, I would do it again, in, essentially. And so Victor does kill him. And the discussion that he's having with um, this mob boss here is uh, basically, how did you know? And then Victor says, like the closer you, the closer they are, meaning that you kind of have to keep tabs on them. Um, and then the man is saying, but you saw. And then Victor is saying, but I'm on the outside. It's easier to look in. And then the guy is saying, the mob boss is saying, well, now you're on the inside. But Victor is saying, I can't take the risk. So I have to go, right? 
So it's that sort of going back and forth that you saw what I couldn't see, which is interesting that it takes an outsider to reveal who Kovacs really is, right? Uh, but he's he's deciding not to take the risk. So these two men are discussing, having a conversation, and uh, the main boss here is basically saying, you know, before you leave, I want you to do one more job. And it's basically uh, send a message, no need for accidental, meaning that the person that you're going to kill, you don't need to make it look like it, it was an accident. Uh, I don't care about a message. I just want you to um, basically take the person out. And um, and the person is going to be a reporter who is writing a story on him. And so he wants to have that person uh, killed. And uh, that person must be an extreme threat, a big, big threat for him to not even, um, not even make it accidental, right? So they are discussing that information now. So I want to take a little bit of time to focus on Victor now being, um, now labeling himself as an outsider. So remember a couple of frames, he's talking about the closer they are. And, um, and, and the mob boss is saying, uh, but you saw it, right? And then Victor is saying, well, I'm on the outside. It's easier to look in. So he didn't. I never remember Victor using the word outside uh, in his in his dealings with Sergey and Trafficking and Franco, but now because of the betrayal, he's considered or he's considering himself an outsider. So then, um, this makes this sort of. prompts the question, is he going to remain an outsider? Is he just going to be maybe a contract killer for multiple mob bosses? And what is his, when he says he's just an outsider, what is that sort of, that sounds a little bit like criticism of the mob hierarchy. That sounds like criticism of the system itself, that there is no one loyal. Anyone can be betrayed. The closer they are, the more likely they are to take you down. Uh, and of course, he's speaking from a frame of reference from having to shoot Sergey. And he didn't have this language before. He didn't talk this language when he was a child. He didn't, I don't necessarily think he felt like an outsider in his own family. Um, and he didn't necessarily feel like an outsider with the friendship group on the courtyard. But after uh, his dealings with Trafficant, Franco, and Sergey, he's now, he's now considering himself an outsider. And this look that he's giving you, there's pain behind it. He's not going to show his tears right in front of this mob boss. He's not going to show you what he's really thinking. But I think the word using uh, the preposition uh, outside is something to really think about and consider because how he frames his decision making is going to be sort of outside of the existing mob hierarchy, outside of the existing mob system, so that whatever decisions he makes, they're going to be his own. He's not going to consider the mob uh, as he did before. He was loyal to Sergey. He believed in Sergey. He was uh, Sergey was a pseudo father for him. He respected him. So when he's saying he's outside, there's no individual respect to in one person anymore. He's a man for himself. He didn't even think about money when he was with Sergey. He felt covered and protected with Sergey. So if he thought about money so much, he would have spent the bill that Sergey gave him. But he, he didn't even think about money. But in his dealings with this mob boss, all of a sudden it's about price. And that's essentially, it could be his way of building um, maybe capital reserves for later that he might decide to be a mob boss himself. It's unclear. Regardless, he's, he's 
framing himself. He's positioning himself to be an outsider. So any decision that he makes going forward are will be decisions of his own. And it doesn't matter if anyone likes it and you can brand him however way you want to brand him. And that means that he's leaving it to chance. One, he can support the very system that he chose um, he chose as a child and he could oppose it if he wanted to. And that leaves him the flexibility and the options. So being on the outside is something um, completely, it sort of shifts the development of the plot, it shifts the thinking of the main character, it shifts all the people that are centered on that character, and it and it sort of informs what he's going to do with uh, Bethesda later. So we have Victor sitting in this restaurant, um, and we have to think to ourselves, why is he actually sitting in this restaurant because remember the second boss uh, has given him a last assignment to kill that reporter. Um, and remember he said it, it doesn't have to be accidental just to make a statement. And so instead of actually um, doing that immediately, he's sitting in a restaurant. And, you know, keep in mind that when he is when he f finally does go and visit the reporter, and at this time he is with Bethesda, who we're going to see in a in a bit, um, you can tell that his heart and mind is changing or changing towards his um, assassination targets because he lets her go. And he's more moved by the idea of the bassinet, the baby's crib, um, you know, suggesting that there is a baby in the crib. And this is right after he finds out about Bethesda um, being pregnant. And so you can tell that, that he's likely not only contemplating a strategy, but also just reflecting on his narrative history all of the events that led up to him sitting at this restaurant. But his life is about to change because we already know that he's with Bethesda, not here, but it's going to uh, happen after the events within this restaurant. And so he's um, basically going to rescue uh, Bethesda. Um, they're going to meet up. They're going to, uh, to fall in love. She becomes pregnant. And then that informs how we, um, how the rest of the narrative will unfold. So he is sitting here in this restaurant, uh, nursing a drink, thinking, quiet, contemplative, and isn't aware that his life is about to change. So Bethesda comes to the door and we're not going to ignore the purpose of doors, right? Because remember, this is a setup. We don't know that it's a setup until the end of the film, but Bethesda coming through this door is really a setup. She's setting up Victor to be found out and, and discovered that he's actually really alive. And that when he framed his death, um, that, that wasn't actually true. So coming into this door, is coming into is making a decision about how she's going to um, set up the very person who killed her family who killed her mother and father and who contributed to her having to be basically sold and put to work so you have to wonder then as i noted in uh some frames uh earlier uh how long has she been surveilling Victor, because she had to know that he was in the restaurant or visited this restaurant often for her to come in and then look at him and then set him up because uh, when, when Victor goes and tries to rescue Bethesda, he goes into the kitchen 
and fights the other men. Well, there's a camera that we don't see. And, uh, and all those actions are actually on camera. And we're not going to see that they were on camera the whole time until we get to uh, traffic in and we get to Alexi watching uh, the video. And um, uh, it is actually Alexi who gets the video first uh, and then uh, he sells it or, or he gives it to traffic in as a way of as some kind of incentive uh, to get out of the mob business because he also has a family. family, And we're gonna see that later. But the decision here is much more strategic than we realize because how is she able to get a copy of the, ca of the, uh, the camera feed? How is she able to get a copy? Um, so she must know the owners. She must know, you almost have to wonder, is she, an owner herself is she how is she connected to this restaurant in order to have access like that and um and we don't get that narrative history of sort of how she is connected to this restaurant but we do get when the guys come in the three guys come in to basically attack her uh one of the guys says why don't you stay this time? Why don't, no, uh, stay and have a drink with us this time. And again, I didn't catch that earlier. I did not catch that earlier, but when I looked at the movie two or three times later, I realized, oh, she must know the people in this restaurant. She must have been here before. Um, she must know the people who are attacking her or she knows their character or she knows their routine so she's just not coming into this restaurant innocently she's coming with a whole sort of uh strategic um uh, vengeance in mind to um sort of befriend victor make him fall in love with her get her pregnant and then shoot him so that he won't have a relationship with his own child um, so that he won't have the family that he likely dreamed of so again coming through this door there's a lot there's a, a space of time that we don't have access to and that is due to the writer director sort of setting us back in our understanding of of the narrative structure um it would be nice if we saw maybe um a flashback of bethesda having a conversation with alexi or having a conversation with traffic she's not going to be able to do that because she's the clientele of uh big politicians and um big um um big businessman or anybody anyone would would deep pocket she's the clientele she's the service she's she's the product she's the product and it's interesting that when victor aims to shoot her as a child it's interesting that we wouldn't see her now had he shot her she wouldn't have been able to take vengeance on victor had he shot her shot her as a child but when she comes in the door, we do know her narrative history. We don't know it at this point that this is the same woman who was a child that Victor was about to shoot. But um, it's something that's a little obvious to us that he's going to meet somebody and maybe that person is connected to his past or something like that. But that door being left over uh, open as she walks through it, is her is an example of her narrative history that spans all the way back to her childhood if we had a visual right now we could see that child and that child sort of taking steps uh, in an evolutionary way to the person that we see today and we don't get um we don't get images of rape we don't get images of um someone hitting her we see the scars on her back but we don't get the images of that so 
that coming through the door, that door here is it, it, it represents a lot of decision making on on the part of Bethesda that we don't have access to, which sort of sets us back. And her coming through the door is actually going to set Victor back because he's already vulnerable from the betrayal. And he's already vulnerable from maybe almost being killed by Kovacs um, trying to frame him as a cop. And then he's already vulnerable uh, by using the language of outside. So he feels alone. He feels outside. Uh, he doesn't have the mentor that he had to shoot. Uh, for the first time, he's he's a child still. He's a child in a grown man's body, but he feels alone. He feels um, maybe even abandoned. So he's sitting there uh, nursing that drink, thinking. We don't know what he's thinking about. He doesn't have a conversation. Uh, when she goes to sit down, he does kind of glance at her a little bit, but it could be just a glance at her for the sake of glancing at a customer coming through the restaurant. But it doesn't seem like he knows her. However, when she sits down, it's clear that there's some interest on her part uh, in looking at him, but we don't see interest on, on his part in looking at her. Um, the first time that we kind of see him with the woman is when um, he was going with the boss up the stairs when the elevator wasn't working. And that's really the first time we've seen him with the woman. So, and when he was with that woman, he let down his guard. Now, these were women who were put to service, right? Um, you know, to celebrate, but, and, and to celebrate uh, Victor placing, uh, putting that, liquid nicotine into that cop's drink. Uh, but that's just, that that was indicative of him sort of lowering his defenses when he was with the woman. So now then we see him with, we're gonna see him with Bethesda and he's lowering his defenses. And this reminds me of the biblical story, uh, Samson and Delilah. Sam, um, Samson is, um, has like um, extraordinary strength and Delilah is trying to figure out what his, what the secret is of his strength. And so he sort of plays around and mocks her and, and everything. And every time he tells her uh, something about his strength, um, she brings in the Philistines to try to overtake him. But instead he overtakes him. Then she wears him down so much with her nagging um, and her pleading to the point that he goes on ahead and tells her the secret of his strength, which is if you cut my hair, I will lose all of my strength. And then it sounds actually uh, believable. And so she sends in the Philistines, they shave his head, which is interesting that you don't know that your head is being shaved. I don't know if she put something in his drink or something like that, but it's interesting that you don't know your head is being shaved. So they shave his head and then he wakes up thinking, uh, she says, the Philistines are upon you. And he thinks, okay, I can operate in the same gift talent and skill and I'm going to do exactly what I did before and this time it doesn't work. They end up overtaking him. They gouge out his eyes. They uh, strap him to some sort of large thing and he basically has to toil for labor. Later he gets his vengeance but it didn't necessarily have to go that way. He lowered his defenses when it came to a woman and so there must be some kind of need in Victor that he lowered his defenses with the woman that he wasn't in love with, they were about to celebrate. And now he's lowering, he's, he, or he's going to lower his defenses with the woman uh, he is in love with or, or uh, he wants to have a family with. And so there's something, there's some kind of need in him that he hasn't tapped into. Uh, of course, he's not gonna reflect on because He's, he's always going to be on autopilot. Even if he's sitting here nursing a drink and thinking about the betrayal, and we have to assume that, he's still always going to be on autopilot because he is a trained assassin. So there must be something in him that, that has a need. So she she's playing her part. She's playing her part. She's playing like she is actually a customer coming in to eat a, at a restaurant. She's smiling, greeting 
the uh, the um, attendee, um, the, the bartender, and uh, she's playing a part. And also notice the fact that she has a necklace that's actually going to bring them back together. So he doesn't look over at her, at her. He continues to nurse that drink. He doesn't, I'm quite sure he's listening in, eavesdropping on that conversation. Remember, he's been trained as a hitman to eavesdrop. So even if he's sitting there thinking about this drink, he's also thinking about the conversation that the woman is having with the bartender. So uh, we can assume that his ears are always open. He's always thinking, he's always wondering, he's always strategizing. So then she takes a look at him and um, it's interesting that we don't know why she's looking at him like this, but we can we can understand that understand that there's a reasoning behind the way she's looking at him because if it's just an honest exchange, honest engagement, you basically say hi. You might make small talk. Oh, I come in, I'm coming in from work, and I needed to get something to eat, and I don't feel like cooking or something. You would make small talk. She sits there and doesn't engage him, doesn't have a conversation, and she's watching him. Now, remember how Victor has been the type of person who has surveilled all of his um, assassination targets. He has watched them. So this person, so Victor is now an assassination target. Ooh, that's, ooh, that's really hard to, uh, to think about. Victor is now an assassination target. So the, the, the tables are turning and he doesn't even know it. That once he is framed for betrayal, that kind of um, drawing a line from one person to the next, like a clothesline hanging, uh, who's going to betray him next, has become sort of like the new focus for the film. Remember in the courthouse, I mean, in, in the uh, the courtyard when he was with the kids and the bullies were attacking him and, and the young boy calls out from uh, the balcony and remember all the clothes that were hanging on the clothesline um, in that area, in his, um, in that slum area. Well, we're now hanging all the people who are going to betray, betray him from Sergei all the way to the end of the film. So the narrative is shift is now really shifting for us because uh, he has he he knows his targets. He has searched out his targets. He has surveilled his targets. He has planned his strategy. He's eavesdropped. He's prepared. He's done all that was necessary to ensure that he can complete the task. But there's nothing in him that says I need to do the same. For Bethesda. That's why I say there must be a need in him. Uh, there's something in him that is crying out for something. I don't know what the something is, but it's, it is always uh, for everyone a cry out for connection. So whereas he has been uh, surrounded in, surrounding, surrounded in toxic environments in, in the family environment where it was sort of insecure, and he felt like he needed to leave that family environment to go and become a mob enforcer to secure himself, so to speak, even though the mob enforcing environment is still insecure. We know that to be true because they try to kill him. But it's his journey from trying to um, uh, leave insecure, toxic, chaotic environments to secure, stable, peaceful, less chaotic environments. And so then you have to wonder, does he see Bethesda as an opportunity uh, for having a family to, to close the gap in that connection? Because I believe he considers Sergey family. And so now that that is, now that that has left a gaping hole in his heart and in his mind and in his thinking, uh, the heart is searching for something to grab onto. The soul is searching for something to grab onto. You cannot live off shooting and killing people um, 
as a way to live the rest of your life. There's something in you that's always going to want to pull at something that is much better for you. And so this look that she is giving him says a lot without saying anything, this look that she is giving him. We know by the end of the film that he's a target for her, but he doesn't know that. And he's not eavesdropping enough to know it. He's not thinking about her enough to know it. So that lets you know that the men in this uh, movie never really suspect the women to have any kind of strategy, that they would never ever think that uh, the women would make them targets. But Bethesda is now looking at her target. And so um, um, this is still her looking at him. Um, there's a lot that is going on with his face. We don't, is, we don't know what she's thinking right now. But the way that she is, you know spacing out her lips and i'm not a body language expert but the glare that she is giving him is something to remark about meaning that um it's like she's going it, it's almost like she needs to watch him and stare at him long enough to take in who he is as an adult and i wonder if she's watching him so long to look at um, the child in him. She knows who, who he is. Um, she knows his name is Victor. We don't know how she knows his name is Victor, but she knows his name is Victor. And she knows this is the person who shot her family, who killed her family. And she's going to reveal that at the end. She's not revealing it now, but we know that's her n narrative history. But the choice of the writer-director to sort of hold her back or set her back, but basically hold her back from engaging in conversation with them is kind of strategic here because um, you can't do too much too fast because then Victor might get suspicious and decide to leave, right? He just may decide to leave altogether way before the uh, three men come. And so, um, because he's still very tender and vulnerable in his heart concerning the previous events, right? Concerning his own narrative history. He might have set fire to that apartment trying to erase himself, but his mind, his neurology, um, his, uh, his thinking about what transpired from the time he was a child all the way to who he is today, is still in his thinking. He's replaying it like a tape in his mind. He's replaying the portrayal. He's replaying the issues with Franco. He's replaying the issues with trafficking. He's replaying uh, the issues in his childhood. When he attempts to leave this restaurant, we're gonna get a flashback of his memory to his childhood and when his father is beating his mom. He never lets it go. It's hard to let it go. And so uh, just because you shoot somebody doesn't mean that you have shot the memory of your experiences out of your head. Just because you shoot the person who probably is the person who probably represents your father or anybody else or even your mother, they're still in your head, still replaying like a movie. It's as if you are, uh, using a remote control to continue to replay the exact same image over and over and over again. And so you, we could say the same thing of her too, that when she's looking at him, she's thinking about her childhood. She's thinking about sitting on a floor holding her dead mother. And she's thinking about seeing her father fall to the floor after Victor killed him. And so those, that's a lot that could be going on in those eyes, could be going on in those cheekbones, could be going on in that mouth, that almost desire to want to say something, but, but you have to hold yourself back. And that takes a lot of patience. Um, you are making someone an assassination target and you have to walk it out with a lot of patience. You have to tolerate. She had to tolerate having sex with him. But remember at the end, when she's talking to the interviewer, she said she learned the ways of men. So she knew how to turn off that part of her brain and that part of her mind to do what was necessary 
to gain the advantage. So there's a lot that is going on in her thinking, in her face. Victor never turns to look at her. I'm, I'm quite sure he's thinking that she is looking at him, but uh, he never turns to look at her. And I don't know why he's not, you know, I would think that any red hot blooded, red blooded man would sort of engage her, but he's not. That lets you know that he's stuck in his thinking about something. He's stuck in whatever uh, he's thinking about in terms of his narrative history and, and the decisions uh, he made. He's likely feeling his mortality. That uh, there's a lot that we do in our 20s and then we need to start getting serious in our 30s. And then by the time we get to our 40s, we are now feeling our mortality. We are realizing that, oh, we could die that I can't make the types of decisions, risky decisions that I made when I was in my 20s because I can actually die. We think we are invincible in our 20s. And we might start to get a clue in our 30s or we should get a clue in our 30s. But in our 40s, we are really, it's, it's a shocking revelation that, oh, we have mortality. Oh, I can die. So the people that he's been shooting, he's never thought about their mortality. He all, he only thought about the assignment. He only thought about the task. And he only thought about the instruction from Sergey or from Trafficken or from Franco. So it didn't really matter to him whether they had mortality. They were already dead from the get-go. Once he took out his gun, they were dead. But now sitting in his restaurant and thinking about uh, the next assignment from that my boss who says, I want you to kill this reporter. Um, I'm quite sure he's thinking about that. I'm quite sure he's thinking about uh, Sergey, of course. And I'm quite sure he's thinking about a lot of the events that have transpired um, up until him nursing this drink. So this is a sort of wider view of, of uh, how they are basically not engaging each other nice restaurant, nice sort of uh, set up uh, uh, this part of the set. I th it looks believable. It might be an actual true restaurant, but again, they're not engaging each other. Even though as children, they know their child, their child histories know each other. This is the same man who was a young child who held a gun to her family. And this is the same woman who, as a young child, looked up at the, looked into the barrel of a gun. And and I don't know what she was hoping, but she looked at him, didn't say a word. So the same child who didn't say a word is the same woman you see here who is not saying a word. The same child who was holding the gun to her head and didn't say a word. This is the same man who. Uh, uh, is not saying a word to her now. And I just thought this was interesting as sort of like a wider view of how distant but close they really are. And again, if they got to talking and having a conversation right here in this restaurant, because you kind of spill all your guts when you are hurting, a lot would have been revealed. But when you think about how they engage each other, she never reveals who she is. She never reveals her narrative history, how there was this guy, there was this young boy who held her family um, at gunpoint. She never reveals that. So again, that takes strategy. That's a setback for Victor because he's not getting all the information about who Bethesda really is. And it is a setback for herself that she's personally setting herself back from revealing who she truly is because she needs to pace this out in the same way that the writer director needs to pace the the development of uh, Bethesda and her goals um, throughout the narrative. If we get that too soon, then the movie would end, right? So it's important that the writer director is just as patient as the character that he is writing for. So the three men come in, 
You, you can tell one is in charge of the other men or, or basically his backup. Right before he goes and grabs Bethesda, the bartender comes up to him uh, and the guy with the, sort of like the jacket um, sort of takes his head and hits his head up against the, uh, the counter. Then he falls out on the ground. So there's something about the bartender who doesn't like these three guys to the point that he had to, he basically had to address them. I can't remember if he addresses them in a sense of, of asking, what are you doing here or something like that. Uh, regardless, this guy who is at the uh, the front of the game, he's he just looks like the type type of person who would just start something just to start something, even if the bartender was nice, right? He's just going to start something because he has another agenda, and his agenda is always to create and perpetuate chaos. So Bethesda catches their eye. She is noticeably uh, afraid, but in thinking about Bethesda and her sort of strategy to set up Victor, I wonder if this is a true fear. I wonder if she truly knows these men. Because when Victor goes to, to save her, she only basically has a cut on her, on her lip. And I'm thinking if they're trying to uh, attack her and rape her, why didn't they punch her in the face? And why isn't she sort of crying from her eyes or something like that? She only has a cut. And it could be that they create, that they could have easily taken a knife and just cut her lip the way it looks when we see her face. But her face is not as misshapen as it should be. If these, if these are rowdy, disrespectful, dishonorable, abusive type men, and 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 usually these types of men will do all that they can to subdue you. Uh, it could have been that they had her in a cho in, in a hold enough to rape her or do whatever they needed to do to her. But it's interesting that her face is not as damaged when Victor finally fights them and then takes her out of the restaurant to put her in a cab. That is not as as damaged as as you think it might be, right? So. She sees them. Uh, we are afraid for her because we are in this part of the movie. But when you get to the end of the film, you have to wonder if this was also part of the setup. So then we see the scars on her back. Victor also sees those scars. And, you know, scars have their own narrative history. I think I mentioned this earlier in this film analysis, so we don't know. There are lines on her back. Uh, and it's likely someone used a razor or used some kind of um, item to kind of make those scars. They're not necessarily from whips. Usually a whip would have um, maybe, they might be circular, they might be long, longer lines, right? We do see a longer line in the middle of her back, so that might have been by a whip, but those two lines at the top of her shoulder are different types of lines. And we don't know what those lines are, but they tell a story. There is a narrative history behind them. And the um, writer director does not give us that visual. The only visual that he gives us is when Victor's father is beating his mother and then uh, Victor comes in and looks at her bloodied back. And so the woman that you see in Victor's mother could easily be the woman that you see here in Bethesda. So the, uh, the, uh, the main guy is, you know, sort of looking at um, Victor, almost challenging him to do something, to say something, you know, I always say about bullies, bullies are very effective in their strategies because they usually have a crew. But if he was by himself without his security, I wonder if he would have challenged Victor. Uh, it's interesting, though, the way he looks at Victor, uh, you know, it's almost like it seems like he knows him. But 
he just might be the type of person who has contempt for people. Remember, Victor was bullied before. Um, and he knows how to handle himself now. But Victor doesn't have his crew with him either. And so he has to play it cool because he can't so much as try to take on um, this crew in, in a sitting position. He would need to be in a more um, fra um, frame of mind for fighting. And we're going to see that later. Victor looks at him, doesn't say a word. Uh, it's, you know, it's a man thing. I'm not a man, so I don't know what they are saying to each other as men without saying anything to each other. But the guy doesn't engage Victor either. I mean, he sort of bams the man, the, uh, the bartender's head in, into the counter, but he doesn't um, pull back the table and the chair to engage Victor. So as I noted, there must be, there must be, this must be just as much as a setup as Bethesda is setting up Victor. But it's interesting. Of course, when the man grabs Bethesda, you still don't see Victor making a decision to say, hey, stop, don't do that. It isn't until he begins to walk out of the restaurant, fights with one of the uh, security men and is about to cross the uh, cross through the thresh of uh, the door and hears the cries of Bethesda and flashes back to his childhood that he then engages. It takes all of those different steps. So he understands the system and he's not willing to fight the system over that woman, but it isn't until he's about to leave and flashes back to his own mother that he's now willing to fight the system. Remember, Victor has used the preposition, the, the preposition outside. So he considers himself outside. So when he tries to go through the door to leave and makes a, a, a decision to return, he is giving him the he he's giving himself the permission to fight the very system that he actually supports and uh, enforces through uh, being a hitman through being a mob enforcer. Th this guy represents the system, represents the criminal element. So he's going to now fight him, when in reality, that's what mob enforcement is. Not only just assassination, but uh, enforcing the clientele and forcing uh, any politician or businessman. Victor is now going to fight the very system that he chose to join because in fighting a guy and trying to rescue Bethesda, it is fighting the mob system. So Bethesda attempts to leave. The guy looks at her. Uh, the other uh, security guard um, uh, the security guy is looking at Victor. Victor doesn't see Bethesda getting up to leave. They're all watching each other and it's likely a man thing again. But Bethesda getting up to leave to me could be a signal to the guy to do something. Again, when we see this part of the movie, we are very afraid for her. We like now I am a woman and I would and I would, if I saw these men come in, I would do all that I can to try to hurry up and leave because uh, without them saying a word, a lot of times women who are vulnerable know what these types of men are up to. And we need to hurry up and get to a safe uh, place or get to a person who, who we think can protect us. It's interesting though, that she doesn't get up and walk towards Victor and ask him for protection. That's interesting because usually women in certain uh, environments will do, will sort of try to appeal to another man. Oh, I'm, I feel afraid or something like that. It's not always common, but it's common enough that if we are in a restaurant and it's just us, us, and then the restaurant is full of other men, 
and we can sense in one man, uh, one man that he's a nice person, a person that we feel could protect us, we tend to move towards that person. We may not move uh, very close to him, but we'll move in the vicinity so he can see us. And we may engage in conversation to pretend that we know that person so that uh, the people who, who are coming in to attack someone don't suspect anything that oh we're just friends in a way right and so we're hoping to send that kind of signal to that uh, that would be attacker please don't attack me i'm with somebody but he's going to grab her so he grabs her looks at victor almost challenging him to do something about it victor doesn't do anything about it and um and they're going to take her to the back. Victor looks at him, uh, doesn't say a word, doesn't engage him, watches him, maybe on some level says, this doesn't have anything to do with me, do whatever you're going to do. Um, I got my own you know, business to, uh, to take care of. And so we see that the man has put his hands over Bethesda's mouth. But the, but the Bethesda that we see here could also still be acting. Because you can't be, to me, on some level, you can't be a person who is afraid of these people and also be a person who is trying to take vengeance on your assassination target. Now, Sometimes if you've been triggered from childhood because you were raped or molested or, or attacked as a child, something in the way he's holding her could still be a triggering event. That even in her mind to set up Victor as an assassination target, that the way he's holding her could still trigger her and trigger the child who was uh, first raped by somebody, right? that they probably took her from the back or they probably put their uh, hands on her mouth to shut her up, to, sh to, uh, to shut up the screaming. So it can still be a triggering event for even for a person who's trying to take vengeance on um, their assassination target. So Victor, they walk to the back. Victor clenches his jaw um, and he's, he's sort of in limbo an emotional psychological limbo he turns his head it bothers him but he doesn't get up to say let me go take care of this now he does a lot of he he really does a little bit of waiting and then he resigns himself to go on ahead and leave out of the restaurant so this is a wider view of of him uh hearing the uh, screams of the woman um, hearing the commotion in the background, I mean, in the kitchen. Of course, he still doesn't do anything. He doesn't even nurse his drink anymore. Um, he hears, he is very distinct. But he, he decides to get up and walk out. And the, the, uh, the um, security guard approaches him and basically tells him that he can't leave. So here is the uh, security guard telling him that he can't leave. And then Victor um, says, yes, I basically can. And, and he fights the guy. And then this is where Victor is at the door. He's gonna, he's, he's gonna, he's entering the door He's exiting a place, but he's basically enter, entering the door and he's gonna stay within this doorway for a good minute, thinking he hears the cries of the woman, right? And remember, don't forget that the cries of the woman are still just as strategic because we find out that she is setting him up. So he's thinking, wondering, should he go and handle this? Because remember, he has positioned himself as an outsider now. And so whatever decisions that he make, he can make whatever decision he makes. He's still standing in the doorway, holding the door, thinking, wondering if he should go back. That hand on the, um, 
on the glass of the door says a lot. That pause is like he said, I'm, I'm not willing to let this go. I got to do something about this. And maybe this speaks to his childhood when he first decided to become a mob enforcer, that I got to do, I don't want to become my father. I don't want to become my background. I don't want to become my narrative history. I got to do something about it. It wasn't the right choice, but it was a choice that he felt like he needed to make in that at that time. So this holding back, holding the door while he's uh, still a little bit inside and out, it's like straddling the fence. What should he do? What should he, what decision should he make? Does this belong to me as a problem to solve? Because remember, he was giving, he was given assignments to solve. He was giving tasks. They were assassination assignments, but they were, Sergey gave him the assignment or assigned him to do something, right? Now he has to take the responsibility and assign himself. He has one last assignment that he has to do for that second mob boss, which is kill that reporter. But now that he's on the outside, he's now having to assign himself. So this holding the glass in the door and holding the door and standing inside and outside of it is this sort of contemplative thinking about what role he's now going to serve. What what is he now going to do? Is he now going is he going to continue to find another mob boss and be a contract killer? Or is he going to now be his own boss? And making a decision to go back in and solve a problem, assigning himself to solve a problem is the steps leading to him becoming his own boss. And he's he's still in his door, you know. Uh, he His hand is still slightly on the glass of the door, but his eyes are closed, the screams are getting louder, and now he's going to uh, flash back into his uh, narrative history, his childhood. So this is the father who has a belt, who is not beating the child, not beating, he's beating his wife with so much force. And this is reminiscent of him when um, he was in the bed, when Victor was in the bed and then he turned himself. And this happens, I feel like this happens when uh, Victor's father felt challenged in his authority, right? When Sergey comes and takes, um, asks him to pay the money that he owes and uh, punches him in the, um, in the stomach, we hear these cries. When Victor refuses to acknowledge his father while standing in the kitchen, we hear these cries. So I think that he beats the wife, beats the mother, his mother, simply because there are challenges to his manhood. And, and uh, there's nothing like feeling like a man in targeting a victim and beating a victim and feeling the full expression of the chaos that is on the inside of you and creating chaos on the outside of you, right? That again, what was his door? I'm quite sure that he saw his father beat his mother and that became a door for him to enter because there was nothing on the inside of him that says, I don't like the fact that my father beat my mother and I wanna be sure that I don't become that person. Even Victor choosing to become a mob enforcer is his way of saying, I don't wanna be like my father, so I'm gonna do whatever I can to do better because we don't see the father working anywhere, not even trying to become a mob enforcer. So uh, uh, there's nothing in this father who is beating his wife. I don't want to become what I saw growing up. Whereas with Victor, he's saying, I don't want to become what I saw growing up. So remember, Victor was in the bed with that cut to his head and he's hearing his father beat his mother. And so that was the extent of the flashback that he remembers. And that's what pulls him back into the restaurant. That's what causes him that flashback of his mother 
of his father beating his mother and hearing that while he turned himself around in the bed to get some kind of comfort for himself from those cries is what actually pulls him back in and he turns around and he makes a decision to re-enter this door um, to now be a true outsider that he's now going to fight the very system that he has supported so he walks. Remember, we get the back of him. So we got the back of him when he was running in the jogging uniform. We got the back of him when he was a child and deciding to uh, become a mob enforcer. Um, we get the back of him in different areas of the film. And now we get the back of him making a decision as an outsider to go in and rescue the cries of a woman or to rescue the woman who is being attacked by these men. So that means he disagrees with some elements of the system that he enforces. That he hasn't had any really direct influence with the clientele, the women who are put to work. But this time he now has direct experience with it. And so now he's going to solve the problem. So then he comes into the kitchen. It's, it's very light con um, considering where he just left but is a full service uh, kitchen and it is here where he is saying enough enough this this is another word uh, um, from an outsider now who is saying this is enough whereas when he was enforcing the system killing people he, he never said uh, assassinating somebody was enough He's now saying that it is enough when it is in relation to this woman being attacked. He never even said it, it was enough. You know, it's interesting when uh, he finds that child um, in the trunk of the car that Franco killed, you don't hear Victor saying enough. When Franco messes up the drug exchange, you don't hear him saying enough. You don't, uh, when Sergey comes to kill Victor, you don't hear Victor saying enough. Uh, you don't, when Victor surveils to find out uh, Rafa and present him to the second mob boss, you don't hear him saying enough. Um, and when he eventually has to kill Kovacs, you don't hear him saying enough. But now that he's switching from outside, the word outside to enough, we're going to see his decision making because he's going to let Alexi go, the same one who sold him out. And actually, he got the he likely got the information from Bethesda, right? The film, uh, and from, uh, the, the the film video. And then he's going to um, let go of the reporter. And those are examples of his enough, which are fueled now by this concept of being an outsider. I want to stay with this idea, this concept of looking at Victor or Victor now framing himself as an outsider and that when he comes into the kitchen to resolve this issue with Bethesda being attacked, that he uses the word enough. And in both instances, I feel like um, that Victor is becoming somewhat an interventionist, right? that when I say that he frames himself as an outsider and that he's saying that's enough to the men and I'm linking it to the idea that he's now going to fight against the system. When you look at this frame here, he's fighting against the system. He's going against the system, but he's also intervening on behalf of Bethsaida before he even understands who Bethsaida is, right? Um, Bethesda, uh, who she actually is. And to intervene, I looked it up, and the meaning for intervene is to come before, uh, come between to prevent or alter a result or course or uh, of event. Again, intervene, to come before, to come between to, pre to prevent or alter a result or course of events. And so he's um, 
he's becoming this intervent in, interventionist that had he lived beyond uh, Bethesda's shot to his chest, he might have been sort of like the moral imperative guy uh, who fights against the system. The people that he is sent to kill, like the cop who he pours liquid nicotine um, in his coffee, a cop who is unwilling to be bought, or the reporter who is reporting on the second boss, mafia boss, mob boss. He might have eventually become those types of people fighting against the system. This is the first step. Because remember, Bethesda is a client of the system. She's a product. Why would you fight against um, a product when you are a mob enforcer for the whole mob, right? But this, this fight sequence that you're going to see is that step by step uh, towards a more secure attachment that he's that something on the inside of him is reaching towards something else on the uh, inside of somebody else. Uh, it is a step by step towards uh, fully leaving what he has left, that narrative history. Because remember, to the second mob boss, he said he he's not going to basically be able to join because he can't risk it. And so uh, usually he usually when he joins something, he didn't really think about it as uh, that long. He just he just joined it. And any time Sergey gave him a task, he performed it. But you don't even see him uh, performing immediately the task that the um, mob boss tells him to do in killing the reporter. Instead, he goes to this restaurant and sits down, and that's where he meets Beth uh, Bethesda. Because in any other uh, regard, he would have handled that, but he doesn't handle it until he's basically secured his relationship with Bethesda. So um, I look at him as an interventionist, that he's beginning to fight the system that he chose to join and enforce um, in, in a criminal, violent way. Uh, he's now intervening on behalf of this woman that he doesn't know. Just because he heard her screams doesn't mean that she was actually screaming. He didn't see her get hurt, right? In the same way that he has been exposed to his mother being hurt, he just heard the screams. And so then he equated the screams that he heard from Bethesda in the kitchen to the screams of his mother that he has always, always, always grown up with. But that's not really understanding the problem. That's not really uh, trying to understand how to solve a problem. That's intervening before you have an opportunity to understand. So this, interven this intervention, uh, this way of him coming between to prevent or alter a result or, or course of events is going to have deadly consequences for him because he's intervening on behalf of a person who is actually setting him up. And that's something that he, that that never even crosses his mind. Uh, the whole time that he was with her for six months, uh, leading to um, uh, his own assassination, it never occurred to him that she would be setting him up. So this, this idea of outsider, him framing himself as an outsider and then coming in and saying to the men enough is uh, all sort of coming together as a way for him to become the thing um, that I believe he really wanted to be. I think in some ways he wanted to solve his family's problems, but um, he wasn't willing to take on the debt of his father to solve those problems, but he was willing to save himself in becoming a mob enforcer. I think um, the last thing I might want to say about this in terms of intervention, remember that Victor never intervenes on behalf of his uh, parents. Uh, and, in, and he doesn't have, he really didn't have the power as a child to intervene. But like I said, when you see your parent being attacked, there is something on the inside of you that should pull, that should pull 
or that should push you towards jumping on the person, kicking the person, yelling, don't hurt my mom, yelling, don't hurt my dad, crying or something like that. And we don't see that in Victor. Uh, but he's willing to come back and intervene for this particular person. And maybe on some level, there might be some guilt that he didn't intervene on his mother's behalf with his father or on his father's behalf with Sergey. Maybe there's uh, that, that notion of feeling powerless as a child, but feeling now powerful and coming to fight these men. Regardless, uh, that's why it's so important that you sort of address problems before they become greater problems because what he didn't do or what he couldn't do when he was younger, he's now trying to do, but is actually going to lead to him um, being set up and killed. So we have this fight sequence and I remember hearing in a video, watching a video, um, a video interview and uh, that the fight, that this scene that is choreographed, uh, the fight person that he is um, fighting with is the actual fight choreographer. Now, I didn't necessarily like this scene. I thought Victor coming in to try to save Bethesda or solve some problem that he felt was necessary to resolve was fine. But I have a problem with Victor falling like this when he's supposed to be a skilled assassin. How can these sort of uh, these guys come in who don't even look like they have skill to fight, come in and sort of knock him down? And this may be indicative of the idea that Victor just no longer wants to participate in these types of antics because he, he seems to come off as much more skilled than he really is. But he may not have fighting skill as well. You know, just because you shoot a gun doesn't necessarily mean you have fighting skill. Now, he does pretty well in this fight sequence. He manages uh, to handle the guy very well. But I thought this this sort of stumbling onto the table was kind of, um, especially the way the guy fights him, it, it just seems like it didn't warrant it, right? He's supposed to be much stronger as an assassin than to be a person who just merely falls onto um, um, a table and it seems like he trips himself or or I don't know he sort of like trips and falls or something like that it doesn't seem like the guy hits him hard enough for him to fall back and I thought that was kind of interesting because it goes against our understanding of what an assassin should look like what an assassin should be uh, be like he comes in with the advantage really the men don't really expect him to come in at least we don't know that at this time and at this point in the movement uh, movie uh, the men didn't expect him to come in and so uh, he comes in with the advantage so he should be really taking them down a lot quicker so I just thought that was interesting this fight choreography uh, that Victor stumbling onto this table sends out many warning signals to the viewer that does he really want to do this because um does he really want to to stay an assassin um this stumbling is is symbolic of him not only maybe stumbling into this world but trying to stumble out of it at the same time and so i thought this was kind of like an interesting uh fight sequence So we have Victor uh, still in this uh, fight choreography. And so he has gained the advantage. So it's like a system coming after him, him stumbling and then regaining his power position or regaining his advantage. And so this is where I felt like when I was um, screenshotting the frames this is where i felt like victor most conveys his i uh his attitude towards fighting us uh, fighting against the system for which he uh chose and for which he has been enforcing for so many years now this hit to the back or hit to the side is symbolic of him now hitting the system from the side or slightly in the back right and that it is him 
with a vengeance, ironically. And I'm not sure that he sets a goal, a task to be vengeful. For all intents and purposes, he is coming in to save Bethesda. But the but you have to think about the narrative history of him being betrayed as well and him pulling that energy, pulling from that state of mind, pulling from that energy to hit this person in the back. He, do, he doesn't know this person enough to have this kind of energy against him. And this could be just male energy fighting male energy as well. But this is where I thought this was very interesting that this image here best conveys for me Victor's desire to now fully fight against the system for which he's been enforcing for so many years. Um, he manages um, to get this guy by the neck. And that's also symbolic of choking out the system, right? Um, taking it from behind. Remember the guy in the, in the restroom where he takes the guy from behind, um, gets behind this, the very system that he's now trying to overtake. And so now um, every person that he's going to fight as he continues to frame himself as an, as an outsider is gonna be one um, the purpose will be to sort of choke the system, take it from the side, take it from the back, um, take it from the neck, right? And uh, interestingly enough, as I noted, that it would have been uh, sort of uh, kind of wonderful to see if he had become a mob boss himself. But Bethesda sets us back as the viewing audience when she shoots him. She, she takes away a lot of his potential at becoming a mob boss. I'm not saying that he might, uh, that he wanted to stay with the mob, but things look a lot differently when you are the boss, when you are on the other side of the desk. And so there's a schooling that you get when you are a student, a mentee, a pupil. And then there is a schooling that you give when you are the mentor, uh, uh, the teacher, right the trainer the the instructor the boss and so this to me represents that sort of uh symbolic way of now taking down the system from the neck so then he manages to finish the fight and then he looks at the woman on the ground i mean who's on the floor um and he looks at her and it, i don't know if he has any sympathy he just might be looking at her so then he eventually uh, walks towards Bethesda. He gathers her up. He doesn't say much or anything like that other than saying that um, we have to go, right? There's a sense of urgency because he doesn't know if anyone is going to come in. And so I wonder then if he feels like he has to go, how familiar is he with that restaurant uh, who owns that restaurant who might be coming after them. Um, and so we've never seen him surveil that restaurant, nor have we seen her. But there's a sense of urgency in him that basically says it's time to go. We got to get out of here. And this is where I say that Bethesda doesn't have many injuries, especially on her face or even around her neck. If someone is coming to attack you and rape you, Usually, you would have many more in, uh, um, many more injuries than this mere cut on your uh, lip. I mean, the man didn't punch her in the eye. The man didn't take her by the neck. He didn't pull out her hair or something like that. And that's why I say that uh, when we find out that she was behind this whole thing, that whole uh, the whole thing in terms of setting Victor up and getting the film footage and basically giving it to uh, Alexi, who then gives it to um, Trafficant, the boss who basically had Victor, had Sergey kill Victor or, or attempt to kill him, that I feel like even the attack from the men was a setup. I feel like that was a setup as well because any person who has been a victim 
of domestic violence, of any type of violence, usually even 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 if it's the second, third, fourth, fifth, fifteenth time that you are being attacked, the person always gives you a fr uh, fresh new injuries, f uh, a fresh hit, a fresh uh, slap to the face, or a fresh knock to the ground, or something like that. They always give you new injuries, and for her to not have. Um, injuries near her eye or not even see the handprint from a slap from one of the guys, right? It's interesting to me. This little thing on the lip, she could have punched her own self for that. You know, she could have thrown herself up against the wall for that. So that's why I wonder about this sort of um, look that she gives. And of course, the writer, director, it is purposely not giving her uh, fresh injuries. He may not have thought of it, or he just may be purposely not giving it to her. But it's interesting too that even Victor is just not considering it as 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 well. So he takes her outside. She um, she's still in her actress role. In a sense, she's still acting out this part of being the helpless victim attacked uh, person uh, who needs help and guidance from Victor. Um, and she closes her eyes and, and it really does seem like she needs this type of help. So he helps her in, in, into the uh, car, into the cab, still with, with her eyes closed. She looks up at him uh, and she was wondering why he wouldn't get into the car with her. And uh, and I think he basically says, I'm going a different way or, or something like that. But um, she eventually takes out a piece of paper, gives him a piece of paper, which I think is about to happen now. So they still have a bit of a conversation. And then she tears off a sheet of paper and I don't remember her even writing on that paper, but she tears out a sheet of paper and gives it to him. Once she closes the door and the car pulls off, he throws the paper down to the ground. And then she, I think she purposely drops her necklace because um, it's the same necklace that she looks for in the kitchen and picks up. And then uh, she throws a sheet of paper. I mean, she gives him a sheet of paper, but he throws it. And then she drops the necklace. And that's purposeful because she knows that he's going to now contact her, right? Uh, just giving him a sheet of paper, he could make the choice, oh, I could contact her or I may not contact her. But now knowing that there is a necklace on the ground and it looks like a very um, treasured, necklace she knows beyond a shadow of a doubt he's going to contact her now so he's sitting in his loft area or apartment thinking about the necklace nothing familiar comes to mind about it uh, about it when he's aiming to shoot um bethesda with her sister um you um one of the sisters and i think it's bethesda grabs at the mother who is now shot and dead and, and there was a chain or pulls out a chain or something like that. And I feel like it's probably this necklace here. So now he's on the phone and he's uh, contacting her and he says, I got something of yours. And that's how it starts uh, uh, officially, even though it started much earlier when Bethesda set the task to set him up and, and assassinate him. So they eventually get together, they meet, have dinner, um, and he's talking about how this is not easy for him. He's never done this before. Um, bad idea, the worst. Uh, but she's basically acting out her role. And see, um, what this tells me that Victor has never done this before, that Victor has skipped a lot of steps in his personal development. Because once he, he decided to become a mob enforcer as a child, there was really no time to develop like 
relationships with women. So that is like his personal setback as well. His emotional, um, psychological, but definitely relationship engagement setback. Because if he had had the practice of dating while he was an assassin, but he had the practice of dating or seeing someone, he would have learned about women. Remember, it is Bethesda who says she learned the ways of men. But Victor was only taught the ways of, uh, of your enemy with Sergei. He never really learned the ways of men because if he did, he would have learned that betrayal is always possible. He learned the ways of his enemy. Uh, uh, he learned the ways of his targets, not necessarily men. And, and he's never learned the ways of women if he says he's never done this before. And so, again, if he had had any exposure to just the ways of women and how the ways of women um, reveal themselves, he might have been able to detect a little bit in Bethesda. But Bethesda is a really good actress in terms of the character that she's playing She's 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 a character in terms of Bethesda, uh, her name and 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 her narrative history. But she's also Bethesda, trying to play a role with Victor. So she's operating with two personalities. She's operating in dual roles. She has to make sure that she keeps both of them straight, the one that he doesn't know about, and the one that she's trying to show him who she is. And so um, there's a little bit um, of a kind of conflict in between them. You know, he's sort of resistant to this idea and she's still kind of pulling at him, but not so much, you know, she's keeping her cool. Uh, but it's kind of like this, this still sort of engaging, um, engaging dialogue about how this is not easy for him and how he's never done this before. And then they are uh, having a conversation that face is, says a lot about that face, you know, because we know that she's the one who has set him up. It's so, that face is so inviting, engaging, but it's scary too. It almost reminds you of a snake that she is keeping a very tight lip about herself so much to the point that uh, we have to remember who she is. Now, we don't know who she is at this point in the film. We don't know that she's setting him up. And so we may be more intrigued by her eyes, by her hair, by her lips, by her face overall. But once we get to the end of the movie and and we we rewatch this and come to this scene, it's scary. It sort of sends shivers up the spine because we were sitting at the table with the snake and didn't even know it, right? And uh, that's how assassins do. You know, they tend to snake their way into the lives of their targets, right? To figure out how they're gonna take them out and then they snake their way out. And that's essentially what she's doing here. She's putting on the face that is necessary to garner any kind of emotion from Victor. Uh, continue to um, get him off guard or or sort of encourage him to let down his guard. And, and remember, it's, it's, it reminds me of Samson and Delilah to the point that when she strikes, and it is very shocking at the end of the movie, when she strikes, he just never sees it coming. And so they get into a kiss, which is kind of passionate for them. And um, it says a lot about her being able to kiss him. And, you know, he, she doesn't go, go through the same conflict that he goes through in the movie. When uh, he finds out that she's pregnant and, and, um, and he's trying to decide if he wants to stay in a relationship even prior to that, he's conflicted. But she's not conflicted at all. Uh, she makes him fall in love with her, but she, but she, uh, holds herself back from falling in love with him. And so they're in bed together. Again, that's, there's that lighter uh, environment. Um, 
sort of that peaceful environment. He looks at her lovingly and he looks at her back. And these are uh, frames from the beginning of the movie. And again, he doesn't know that he has contributed to many of the scars on her back, if, if, if not directly, but definitely indirectly, considering that he is, uh, or he was the mob enforcer. And so she's lying in the bed, sleep. Uh, and it's interesting, I don't know how she can sleep uh, with herself, knowing that she is setting this man up. I don't know how she can make love to him. I don't know how she can engage in a relationship with him, but she, she assigned it to herself. She, this is her assignment. And part of the assignment is continuing, uh, continuing to learn about him and knowing his um, ways that she can come in um, from the back, from the side, in the same way that Victor comes in from the back, from the side, from the neck. She's doing the same thing. Um, you know, developing a relationship with him, letting him fall in love with her. You see on the on the frame here, this is six months later, and this is her assignment. He is he is her assassination target and he is her assignment. And so any way that she can come in after him, and I don't know how she thought she was going to uh, complete this task, but you always make adjustments when when necessary. In the same way that Victor didn't think he was going to have to rescue Bethesda while he was sitting in a restaurant, he had to make an adjustment. And so he's conflicted. He's looking at her, sitting and observing her. She's asleep. And um, um, he's not tossing and turning in the bed, uh, but he is tossing and turning in his mind and possibly in his heart. And so again, he's very conflicted about what he should do um, going forward. And Victor is looking at the two glasses. One is um, empty and the other is not. And I and um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, her patience for a minute because when she's when she senses that Victor is pulling away, she uh, says to him, "You don't love me." And uh, she also says, "I don't think you know how to love." Uh, and then he turns around and says, I don't want you to go. And then she basically says, give me a reason to stay. And with that dialogue, I think it's very interesting that Victor is pulled in emotionally into one of these types of conversations that women have uh, when they are trying to nag uh, a man to love them. And maybe nag is too strong of a word, but, you know, I've... At, at my age now in my 40s, I'm 46, uh, when you sense today a person who is not interested in loving you or wanting to stay with you, I think you should let that person go because I feel like if the person really wanted to be with you, they would make the effort. You wouldn't have to pull at them to, uh, to be with you. But remember, this is all an act. And so she knows the ways of men and she knows how to sort of put on the fake waterworks right in order to get him to change his mind you know it's something that nothing um really uh prompts him to think he looks at the two glasses of course and we get to see the two glasses but immediately a woman would understand that one of those glasses uh that that is half full should tell you that either she's just not a drinker or there is something else that is going on with her. But I thought an image of those two glasses was interesting to take a, uh, to use as a screenshot because it automatically uh, calls attention to women that she may be pregnant. And so they are sitting at the uh, table And this is where 
uh, she's saying that he doesn't know how to love. You don't love me. Uh, uh, and he's saying, I don't want you to go. Give me a reason to stay. And, you know, that kind of middle part of the relationship where it's about to turn into uh, something else long term. And I don't know where this is. We, we get an indication that six months later, but I don't know if this is um, before the six months or after the six months, but we just have to assume that it's after the six months. So they engage each other. He looks at her lovingly. And then this is where he sees the pregnancy test. Uh, of course, he's going to be shocked that she's pregnant. So even before she became pregnant, he was all, already conflicted about his relationship with her or him engaging in a relationship, especially as an assassin. But, but the pregnancy test is what now sends him into an either, even greater crisis mode, right? And so then he responds. He is conflicted, is, uh, is actually um, a bothersome idea because it's a lot that you have planned your life to be one thing and then it shifts. And, uh, and it's voluntarily in the sense that you know what it takes to produce a baby, but it's involuntarily because you didn't plan to be pregnant. You didn't plan to be a father. And he doesn't know what being a father is because he really didn't have a, a true father figure. I mean, a true father in his real father. He only had a father figure who then who then turned around and betrayed him and tried to kill him. So there's so much that is going on in him standing in this shower and thinking about uh, his narrative history and whether or not he is capable or even ready to be a father to uh, a child, let alone be a relationship partner to a woman. And so uh, we see him con uh, continually conflicted by this idea. And then this is where he does what he does. He, he goes and finds the gun and points it to her head. She never wakes up. She never wakes up. And I wonder, every time she's sleeping in his bed, I wonder, if she's really uh, awake. I really do wonder that, but she never wakes up and he um, he aims the gun at, at her head. Now remember, he's not gonna be able to shoot her. There's too much love now on his part and too much of uh, relationship investment on his part to uh, shoot her. Whereas in the beginning when she was a child and he was pulling back the trigger, he couldn't shoot her because Sergey came in and stopped him. And we wouldn't be having this conversation, having this discussion, or we wouldn't see him shooting his gun had he shot her or had Sergey not stopped him. So we almost have to blame Sergey for stopping a process because now he's going to reap the consequences of that decision or that involuntary decision to not be able to shoot her or kill her. And so, um, you know, the interesting thing that he could go and find a gun to shoot her is there was no resistance on his part. Just because he's, he's not going to shoot her doesn't mean that uh, we can say, oh, well, he resists. He resists the temptation. I think actually the temptation would have been not to take the gun out in the first place. If there was nothing on the inside of him that basically uh, said, I don't want to do that. Maybe I need to talk to her. Maybe I need to break up with her or something like that. But I don't, but I don't want to sort of equate her in the same way as the other assassination targets I have killed. And when he pulls out a gun to shoot, to, to aim it to her uh, head, He's basically equating her and not even, not e the irony is thick, not even realizing that she is actually one of them, but he's equating her to all of the other people that he has set as a targets 
set as assassination targets and actually killed. And so the gun that he's pulled out um, says a lot. It says a lot that he didn't even that he didn't even risk the temptation of pulling it out in the first place. And maybe he's on autopilot. Maybe he's on um, auto drive or something like that. But the time he has spent with her, the fact that he has this child on the way should have been something that he said, OK, I don't want to do that. I don't want to pull a gun out on her. And she's sleeping quietly. And he goes somewhere and um, um, he thinks about the situation, right? Uh, he goes and cries and he now he can't leave this situation. Remember when he was leaving his parents' house and going down there to Sergey, he made a choice to leave. This situation, he feels almost powerless. He can't leave this situation. And uh, it has gone way beyond conflict uh, or, or feeling conflicted. He is now resolved in himself that that this is going to be my life because he can't kill her, right? And he and he hasn't hugged her yet until he comes back from attempting to kill the journalist. But he's now resigned to the idea that that there's no turning back, right? She's a woman. I love this woman. She's pregnant. We're going to have a child together. And uh, the thought of me becoming a father is scary, especially when my hands have been filled with bloodshed, ha uh, has caused bloodshed. And now I'm going to hold a baby. Right. And that's a lot that's going on in his head that we have to assume because he doesn't talk out the dialogue. We are kind of set back in this narrative because the writer director doesn't allow him to speak during this sequence. He's not speaking during this sequence, so we don't, we can't get any insight into what he's really thinking. So we just have to assume, and assume, and and assumptions are not always good. It's better, it would be better for him to speak. However, the visual images of him being conflicted and scared and uh, wondering if he will be the right person, etc., whatever, are still sufficient. So he's standing and looking at her as she sleeps because he's about to uh, leave and go out and uh, meet the journalist. And so we get this image of the journalist. She has a baby. There's sort of like a baby bed and everything. She was holding the baby. And so she's here holding the baby, right? And she is the reporter that the second mob boss wants Victor to kill and he's and and he said he doesn't need it to be accidental he just wants to send a message so she's looking at the computer it's nighttime of course and she's uh researching her target her target is that second mob boss right and in some ways she's trying to assassinate his um uh, his reputation okay and remember the interviewer has a reputation that's kind of disgraced and he and he's using victor as an interviewing tool to sort of uh, regain his reputation and so here's the guy who who is that second mob boss that she is going to write about and victor is holding a gun to her head um he's looking at the screen and um, um, it is here where he is telling her to leave tonight, don't come back, she's dead. She's essentially dead. So this is where Victor is has, has decided from the frame, from the mindset of an outsider now, that he's not gonna kill this woman. So the assignment that the second boss gave him to do, he's going to abandon that assignment. He's not going to do it. And maybe on some level, he's sort of helping the woman uh, get out of town in the same way that Sergey initially helped him when he was a child after shooting Bethesda's uh, parents, right? Either way, he has, he has had, his, his narrative has, has shifted so much to the point that he is now letting people go. That, that whoever was an assassination target from the beginning of his thinking that person is no longer that. And so he's telling her that she has to leave tonight. And she's telling her, um, and 
Um, and what really moves him is the fact that she that he sees the baby, or or he knows the baby is there in the crib. So then, uh, once he tells the journalist to leave tonight, don't come back, and that she's essentially dead, she leaves. Uh, and then he comes home and he puts the gun in the drawer, right? And then he feels the baby belly, her belly, um, uh, Bethesda's baby. So when he's putting the gun in the drawer, this gun has been in the drawer the whole time. And that's why I said, I wonder why Bethesda never got the gun out to shoot him then. Uh, because whether he is uh, afraid or uh, I'm sorry, whether he is shocked in this apartment or whether he is shocked in that other apartment with the interviewer, it doesn't matter. He's shocked. And so all that time that she had to take him out, she could have taken him out. So, of course, this has a lot to do with the writer director plotting this out, plotting out his setback, because in meeting Bethesda, it really is a setback for him. But it has a lot to do with how the writer director is plotting it out. It has a lot to do with how even Bethesda is plotting out her assassination target, right? She is no different than what uh, she is doing to Victor, the same thing he has done to other assassination targets. Uh, uh, plan out his own patience, plan out his own tolerance, plan out his own strategies, right? So putting the gun in the drawer, however, I feel feel like it is um, Victor's decision to now kind of put this whole ordeal to bed, maybe. to um, He's never going to let go of a gun, as anybody uh, would attest. But this may be his way of kind of letting go of this whole idea of mob enforcing, right? Uh, closing the book on it, the same book that you see trafficking uh, uh, close when he looks at the pictures and then he puts the pictures, the, uh, the photographs into the uh, book and then he closes the book. We don't know for certain if he's going to do that, but the fact that he let somebody go that that person was supposed to be an assassination target informs us or suggests and or, uh, and or implies that he's ready to let this go. So he lays in the bed with her, lies down on the bed with her, kisses her from the back, and then puts his hand on the belly. And so now he is actually invested in this idea of becoming uh, a father, right? This is his unborn child. Uh, this is the woman that he loves. And so this is going to be his life. And so now it's time to let go of anything that might get in the way of that. So he, so we now that we now that the writer director has unpacked all of those decisions that um, Victor has made using Victor as a character to talk about his narrative history, the the twists and turns, the betrayals, meeting Bethesda, um, falling in love with her, saving her, rescuing her, and almost her rescuing him, um, the interviewer is asking him about whether or not um, he will uh, become a good father, uh, his relationship with Bethesda. He's basically saying we don't have a plan or he doesn't have a plan, but we'll work this out together. And then the interviewer asks, what kind of father do you think you will be? He said, a strong, um, good one, right? And you almost have to wonder the fact that he's interested in becoming this, um, that maybe this has been his goal the whole time of family. But before he can really enjoy this whole idea of becoming a father and and being with Bethesda and becoming a family, he has uh, one more um, goal he needs to complete. He has been found out. He has been discovered. Now, he doesn't know it is Bethesda who has ratted him out. And interestingly enough, 
he was looking for Rafa, the snitch, to give to the second mob boss in order to get in to a, a new system when it was also Bethesda who ratted him out, who was a snitch on his behalf. And so this is their discussion going back and forth about him becoming a father, having a family, etc. And so this is where he's been discovered. The men are going to come to this location. Um, we don't know yet by whom, but we do know that, that he's going to have to sort of um, eliminate his enemies. If he's going to move forward with Bethesda, he's got to do it. And so we have this enemy who is maxed. We're, we're going to find out who the person is. But uh, this is a person who is um, willing and able and capable to take down Victor. And Victor um, takes him down. So Victor knew that he was exposed. Now, we don't get how Victor knew, interestingly enough. You know, I didn't think about it until I got to this uh, particular frame. We don't know how he found out that 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 he was found out or discovered. Regardless, we are forced to skip along uh, with the character uh, and then just try to piece it together later. So um, he takes tools of the enemy, right, to listen in on anyone who may be speaking. And that basically gives him instructions because remember, he's in a setback right now. Even if he knew that they were coming, he's still in a setback. And so he's going to need instructions to get out of this particular setback. So now that we have Caesar, one of his childhood friends, right? Caesar was sent to kill Victor and they are in conversation. And so this is 20 years later, Victor uh, recounts. And Victor is asking him, how did you find me? And um, Caesar goes into multiple uh, conversations, right? Uh, he talks about Marku. He talks about, um, you know, different, he talks about trafficking. He talks about all different types of, of, you know, conversations, right? But basically, how did you find me? And so they they engage in their own conversation, of course, because he's not going to necessarily shoot Caesar so quickly as he would anyone else, because he has to find that information. He has to gather intel, right? And so uh, talking to Caesar and having a conversation with him is going to get him that. Plus, it's a reunion. It is symbolic of a reunion. I mean, you see somebody you haven't seen in so many years, you want to know what's going on with them, even if you know you're about to kill them. And so Victor looks at him uh, with that kind of sort of stare that he gives, half blank face, half focused. And I thought this angle was interesting uh, in terms of consideration, because it's almost like a fourth wall is breaking that the two men are having a discussion and then the camera is having a discussion in terms of um, taking the the uh, the shots, right? The close-up shots. But it's almost like we are entering this conversation too, um, the breaking of the fourth wall to, to kind of see what's going on. You could also look at it as possibly a mob boss uh, having a sort of zoomed in view or I, well zoomed out view of of their discussion as well and you can look at it as um, maybe security you know taking time to really listen in on what's being discussed so we have Victor pointing the gun at Cesar Remember, this is his childhood friend, and he and it has come to this, that he is pointing the gun at Caesar. But before this happens, uh, before Victor finally shoots Caesar, Caesar tells him that Trafficant knows that he is alive, that knows that Victor is alive, and that Caesar is the only one who knows that Victor is alive. And he also uh, makes uh, 
also puts forth the same idea that Sergey uh, suggested or said that uh, he had no choice. He didn't want to do it. And then he says to Victor, we're brothers. Um, but he also says something that is, that is a little contrary. Uh, same old Victor never know when to back down. And it has some of the same elements of uh, speak that Sergey was basically suggesting that Victor has no attachment and that um, he's just, you know, the type of person who's who's going to get it done. And so Cesar is essentially saying the exact same thing, that same old Victor never know when to back down. But, you know, how is it that a person, how does Cesar expect Victor to back down from an attempted kill? You expect Victor to just take it and, you know, take being betrayed, take being um, assassinated? Is that what you're suggesting? Because if you cared about Victor in the same way that say, uh, that Sergey said, uh, suggested that he cared about Victor, why didn't you, why didn't you come with your regular face and not a mask? Why didn't you come with the uh, with your regular dress, your regular garb, not as an assassin, uh, warn Victor and say, trafficking knows that you are alive. I'm the only one who knows that you are alive. Let's try to get you out of town. So no one has any sort of loyalty to Victor if you care about him so much. You're calling him your brother, but you but you have come to kill him right? It's sort of like that Cain and Abel. You know, I'm really here for you, but I'm actually going to kill you under the sun, right? And so um, Victor makes an interesting uh, point that um, he says that he could have killed trafficking anytime. Even when uh, trafficking sent Sergey to kill Victor, uh, he could have killed him anytime. Victor says, I chose not to kill him killed trafficking out of loyalty. That's why I didn't kill him. It wasn't that I was afraid. I didn't leave the country because I was afraid. I chose not to kill him out of loyalty. So then you have to think about Victor's statement. So he had more loyalty to trafficking to not kill him than any loyalty to Sergei in killing him, right? Because he could have said to Sergei in that moment, let's run away together. Let's flee the country together so I don't have to kill you, right? But, you know, Victor is saying, is suggesting the same thing that Cesar and uh, Sergey uh, suggested. I had no other choice. I had to do it. I didn't want to do it, but I had to do it. So he's going to eventually kill him here. And so he shoots him. Um, um, and this is a childhood friend, the same person that he was playing with rocks in the courtyard, the, the exact same person. You know, it's interesting too that when they were playing in the courtyard and the two bullies came after Victor, none of the friends stepped in to try to fight the, uh, the other bullies. Now, you know, once you are triggered in certain environments um, and you've been bullied, multiple times, it is hard to fight, right? But no one valued Vic, Victor enough because it was still, it still would have been four on two. Even though those were big guys, it still would have been four on two. Somebody could have picked up something to knock them out, but nobody valued Victor enough to, to jump to his defense in the same way that no one valued Victor enough in his own family to um, cover him and help him, right? In the same way that Sergey didn't value Victor enough to say, I can't kill him. I'd rather die myself or I'd rather flee the country. And in the same way that Cesar, who's calling him, calling Victor his brother, didn't value Victor enough to say, I can't kill him. See, all these people, they make all of these different statements, but they don't back up their own statements. They're not even really loyal to their own statements. So, I thought it was interesting that Victor said, I chose not to kill trafficking out of loyalty. 
and and it has been this way for many years for, for however long he he has been in this other country it's been that way so he's forced to return back to his uh, country uh bucharest romania so he returns and this is where he's going to see marco He's coming through a door. Now, this door is different from the door that he left out of when he was younger. He's coming now, um, 20 years later, uh, as an adult. And he has had such a narrative history prior to coming through this door. If you think about uh, once he opens this door, and we've already had priv we've already had exposure to what he was as a child and what he revealed to the interviewer and to the viewing audience, and, and if you look at sort of like this front part of him, but envision the back of him and all of those steps from the back, right? All of those uh, experiences, the whole narrative history and all that that suggests, you know, uh, what is behind him. It's not like he's walking away from it now in this sense. It's just that he has to return home to settle old business. He has no other choice but to but to reveal himself. Otherwise, he would have stayed wherever he was and he would have continued to operate with the kind of standards he was uh, operating with in terms of loyalty. He's had loyalty to all these people, but they haven't had loyalty to him. So him coming through this door is coming uh, back to his past, but also uh, the narrative history that is... Uh, in back of him that is also connected to his um, connected to his childhood but also connected to everything he has done up until the age you see him now so he goes into his old apartment um and i think this might be his bedroom i'm i'm not quite sure but this is the way uh it looks um you know it's 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 it's, it's interesting to me how we we have to assume that this is a different landlord and not the mob system that that controls this apartment complex, these uh, projects. But it's always very interesting to me how uh, the mob, criminal elements, gangs, hoods, all that, uh, they have a way of trying to control the area, but they won't keep the area up. They won't keep the area up. They won't keep the buildings up but they want to own it and own you at the same time. So I'm quite sure that a lot of memories are sort of flooding his mind right now, his childhood, uh, uh, the many doors that he had to go in and out of, right? Uh, and so now he's going to um, see Marku. And we get an idea, Marku, and remember Cesar was suggesting in his speech to Victor that, that you either you either be the motherfucker or you get motherfucked like Marku and Marku is motherfucked in a sense that um, uh, he he could have chosen to become a mob enforcer but he didn't and he chose the life that he's in right now and so look at how he looks look at how he is he's not anywhere um, advanced as we are as mob enforcers right he talks about how, uh, his weight he talks about how he looks how bad he looks etc so mark who is uh coming in and he's one of the childhood friends who were who was out there on the court courtyard so they basically have a conversation and uh, uh victor is asking about his mother and he asks where is she and mark who says i'm sorry um about a year later she had died and then he talks about the two bullies that he that they all grew up with and how uh they took over when um victor left and then victor actually uh kills them so we see some emotion in him when mark who tells victor about the death of his mother how she passed about a year after he left when he was a child so there is some um it's the same kind of probably the same kind of emotion that you saw when he was forced to um kill sergey when well actually when he realizes that sergey is going to kill him and that he was sent to kill him 
And so it's that same kind of emotion. No, no real tear coming down his uh, face in the same way that it came down when he was talking to Sergey. But there's emotion nonetheless. And so uh, there's a kindness that he shows to Marku. Um, he trusts Marku. It, it's interesting enough. If he ever, if he ever did decide to have his own mob business, I'm quite sure that he would trust Marku. Um, but there is a kindness to him um, in terms of looking at him, holding his face, and then he's going to have to leave. So he takes his gun. And we haven't really seen him use his gun in a, in a while. And he's going to now go and shoot the bullies who used to bully him. And so they are in this room. Uh, he shoots them. And then we see the back of him. And he's actually entering the restaurant to visit with trafficking. And so he's going through a door. He's going, he's going into this uh, cafe, rather. And um, um, and the back of him, we see, we have ex we know what he has just done, right? But this back of him says it still says a lot about where he has been as well. So entering this cafe comes with a purpose, and um, he says something to trafficking about Franco. Franco is still alive. Whether he stays that way is up to uh, him. Trafficking is a father. And uh, so we didn't know, we don't know that uh, Victor has um, kidnapped Franco. We don't get that storyline. We only get the statement that Victor makes to trafficking at this at the table that uh, Franco is alive and whether he stays that way, it is up to you. So trafficking here is that former boss who found out that he was he was still alive from Alex from Alexi and then Alexi is the one who got the information from Bethesda that we didn't that we will find out much later. So they are having their conversation, and um, Victor uh, is essentially asking, "How did you find out?" And um, trafficking is saying, "I'm surprised." Um, um, surprises you the kind of reach that we have. And he talks about how Alexi is working for Interpol and basically he's the one who kind of um, discovers that Victor is still alive. So they continue to have their conversation, uh, especially about Franco. And um, Frank, uh, Traffic in here is saying that Victor was more like a son to him than Franco. And he's basically appealing to Victor in like a father-son way. But it's also, it's also an act as well. Because if he was much more like a son to him, why send someone to kill him? Why send Cesar to kill Victor? If Victor was more like a son to him than his own son, Franco, then why send someone to kill him? But he does go into into detail about how Franco was weak and um, lacked any discipline and uh, he didn't have strength. And Franco is no different than the guy that we see with the second boss man, Kovacs, um, the, the second lieutenant. He's exactly the same way, weak, lacks any real discipline, no real uh, strength. And so... Uh, um, trafficking is saying that we share the same kind of he's basically suggesting that that Victor and tra uh, trafficking here they both both share the same kind of uh, wheel you know if you will um, same kind of um, loyalty uh, same kind of strength same kind of discipline and um, trafficking is saying let's bury the past and victor is saying okay what about the hit and the hit is canceled and trafficking is saying well i always knew you were special stone cold and um and he makes a point about sergey being just a foot soldier he does what he is what he is told that that victor is more of a thinker versus a doer Whereas Sergey is more of a doer versus a thinker. And you kind of see that when you see Sergey um, 
And even his attempt to wear a suit and look important, he's still much more of a doer than he is uh, a thinker. And that's why Victor was asking, so how did you get Sergei to do it, right? Uh, he's the one that brought Victor up, raised him up. So how were you able to get Sergei to do it? And and it's trafficking who basically says that that Sergei was no different than a foot soldier. And so um, Victor, Victor, you know, as much as you know someone is full of crap and that they're lying and you can't trust them, there's a part of you that still throws off this kind of uh, look. Like part of you kind of believes what they're saying, but part of you wants to give off this face that you don't believe what they're saying, right? And so here... There's some anger behind his eyes. There's some anger in even his cheekbones, even in his ears. And um, trafficking's soft words are getting to him. But he has to force himself to remember that he's sitting in this seat, in this seat simply because trafficking is the one who sends Cesar to kill him. And so he has to uh, uh, put on the type of face that is still stone cold stone face so he can get the job done now here he 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 is not under an assignment to kill trafficking he has to put himself under assignment and when he's when he does kill trafficking under the table that's the outsider that's the the word enough that he uses in the kitchen that is still perpetuating itself and shifting the narrative and shifted and creating a whole narrative history for himself that he just doesn't want to participate anymore in this mob business. And this is uh, the lighter. So, uh, and it's, I think the lighter from Franco and it's essentially the same type of lighter um, that Sergey sends Victor's mother in the envelope with the money basically telling uh, her that her husband is dead. And this lighter is no different. Um, he says to Trafficant that uh, he will stay alive and it's up to him. But I'm assuming that if he took the lighter uh, from Franco, that means that Franco is actually really dead. So we have the gun come out and uh, Victor is about to shoot him. And Victor actually does shoot Trafficant, which is um, shocking to him. And Trafficant, just before he is shot, he's saying one cannot change one's nature. And that's a counter argument to Victor, who, who now wants to, who has framed himself as an out outsider and actually wants to exit the business. So it's almost like Trafficant discerned something in Victor that wanted to be out, that wanted to get out. But in making the statement, one cannot change one's nature, trafficking is basically suggesting you can't get out, right? You can't get out. And so um, um, who proves, who, who is the one who proves out in, in the end? You know, it's kind of hard to say because even though Victor kills the interviewer, but uh, Bethesda kills Victor, and so we don't really know in the end what he would have become, especially if he ever would have become a good father or a good family man. So he kills him uh, with a real intent here and um, keeps his eye on him, and then uh, he leaves. So trafficking uh, is sitting there shot. Victor... Um, gets up and walks out and then uh, there's a cut to Alexi. Alexi, remember, is one of his childhood friends as well and so um, Alexi is the one who works for Interpol. He's the one who received the video feed uh, from Bethesda and Alexi decides to, to give that over to trafficking as a way for him to get out as, as a way for, um, um, he said that I could sell you to buy my way out. I could sell you, Victor, to buy my way out. 
So uh, Victor tells him here um, to use his left hand because it's not his dominant hand, right? And um, and then he talks about how he sold him to traffic it. And um, he's he's also making the exact same statement that Sergey and Cesar made that I didn't want to. I hated it, but I figure I could have so I could sell you to buy my way out. You know, trafficking is the only one of the whole group who said who who doesn't say I didn't have a choice. That I didn't want to do it. I uh, I had no choice. I had to do it. Right? Trafficking isn't the one who says this, but it is Sergey, is Cesar, Alexi. These are the three people who are saying I had no other choice. Even uh, Bethesda at the end. Uh, says she doesn't even say I didn't have a choice I didn't want to do it I hated to do it she doesn't even say that so Bethesda and trafficking are somewhat the same in their character so Victor is um, basically going to allow Alexi to leave because he looks at the picture of his family and his wife and kids and so he wants to let him live now remember this is the same victor who who let the journalist uh live that he cares so much about the journalist and and her willingness to parent her own child that he was willing to let her go and it would have been interesting if if all of the other people around him did him the exact same way right but they didn't and so um knowing that he has a family and knowing that he has uh, a narrative history with Bethesda and a possible narrative future with her, he lets Alexi uh, go, right? And he says, essentially, if I have to come back here, I'm going. I will kill you. So here's the picture of he of of Alexi and his family, his uh, wife with the child, and then there's a cut back to the interview and so uh we are now finishing the interview and um they have their conversation then victor is going to get up and give the interview of the ring and then bring back um bethesda so um this the face that you get here with victor for an interview that likely lasted a couple hours, his face is still clear. His face is still focused. His face is um, one of real, it looks like sincere intent, but like the interviewer, he doesn't know he's about to die. The interviewer doesn't know he's about to die. Victor doesn't know he's about to die. The only person who knows each of these characters is about to die is Bethesda. So the interview is finished. Looks like a looks like it is productive. The interviewer is um, uh, smiling. Looks like he might have the type of interview that's going to bring back um, um, his reputation from being disgraced. And we don't know why he is is disgraced. I mentioned this at the beginning of this film analysis, but we know enough to know that he seems to be satisfied with the interview. He seems to be um, um, willing to move forward. And so Victor gets up and gives the man the ring and the man and the interviewer knows that ring that is an identification in the same way that it was an identification on his brother's hand and it was noticeable uh, it, it is an identification in his hand right now that it's going to holding that ring is holding narrative history without even saying anything victor didn't even have to say i got your brother's ring i killed your brother in the same way that the lighter that sergey puts in an envelope for victor's mother and the lighter that uh victor puts on the table for trafficking it's already understood that I got the lighter, I got the ring, your family member is dead. 
right? So he's looking at this ring, he's observing it, and then um, uh, it's going to spook him. And so he understands that what that ring possibly means, which shows the fear in his face, and in his eyes and in his mouth. And then Victor and Bethesda uh, come through the door or come into the apartment. And so he's holding a gun. Now he's been holding a gun. He had a gun in the ankle, then he pulled out the gun while he was in a car. And so he's been holding his gun. Now, we don't know if the gun is, is uh, loaded because remember, he woke up in this place. But it's like they have, it's like Victor and Bethesda have come to a party. You know, she's dressed for the occasion. She has the necklace on, she has on a fancy dress and uh, and the scars in her back. And so he's asking about the ring, holding them sort of um, uh, hostage, right? We see the scars on her back and he's asking about the ring and where did you get the ring? And uh, Victor is basically going to, uh, uh, what well, he asks, did you kill my brother? And um, he did. And so Victor uh, takes his, you know, it's interesting, Victor takes his position behind Bethesda. He's walking behind her and Bethesda is looking directly at him. So now she's conducting the meeting. The interviewer thought he was in charge. And then Victor thought all this time that he was in charge. But Bethesda has been the has been the real person, the real culprit who has been in charge. So now that Bethesda is actually in charge, and I forgot to mention in a previous frame that uh, when Victor walks behind her, he gives the gun that belonged to the interviewer to Bethesda. And so he walks behind her and uh, she goes and sits on the couch and she begins to facilitate a discussion with the interviewer. And she tells her narrative history in the form of a parable, essentially. And um, what she talks about is she talks about this cruel king who ruled his, his domain and the farmer owed a debt to the king but he didn't have anything to pay. He didn't have any money to pay the king. So the uh, king um, decided to take his two precious daughters as payment. The farmer tried to get in the way, intervene and um, um, try to refuse, but the king killed the farmer. And the two girls were uh, instantly put to work uh, and that was essentially put to service for the sexual appetites of men. They were both 10 or, or they were around at age uh, 10 years old. She was 10 and I don't know what uh, age her sister was. And she's talking about their, the, that the sisters were two different types of sisters. One was weak, one was strong. And the weak one, her sister, um, could not withstand the sexual appetites of men, but she she was, and she labels herself as strong, as being able to learn the um, ways of men. And so she was able to endure, and, um, and she makes a note of um, saying why he's here and that it, it was all an illusion to get him to trip up so that she could be the one to take it all away. And the interesting thing is Victor doesn't really detect or even really consider that the parable uh, about her that she is facilitating and, and discussing relates also to him. That he he isn't he wasn't a king, but he was a person who took away his uh who took away her family because Victor is the one who shoots. He's the one who shoots his uh, her uh, mother and her father. And when she's talking to this uh, interviewer, uh, she's basically kind of labeling him as a king, but that's only because he represents the client. And so uh, part of this larger mob system. So this parable, this narrative history 
this is where we get her narrative history. It's told in the form of a parable and then she reveals herself. So it's interesting how the mob enforcer who started out as a child isn't able to recognize the child, the woman who was a child uh, when he first met her. And uh, he is standing between the product and the client. And he is the mob enforcer that is between them, um, them both. And it's interesting, this image of a mob enforcer who started out as a child in a big t-shirt who, who is now wearing a suit with a collared shirt and is in love with the woman whose family he killed and and um, and supports a system that sort of praises the client, right? So she gets into the parable, she talks about it, she, um, in some ways she's putting her hands behind her neck, but I think it's, I think it's her way of holding on to her scars to kind of push her forward. Because when you are confronted with the person who hurt you as a child when you were 10, when she says, I'm surprised you don't remember me. I'm surprised uh, that you don't remember me, but I was only 10. That he was one of the uh, people that she had to endure as a child, his sexual appetite. But I think when she puts her hand behind her neck, it's a way for her to kind of control her emotions so that she can get out what she needs to get out, uh, hold on to her scars or remember her scars because she knows the she knows those scars are at the back of her. And um, just say what it is she needs to say before Victor shoots him. So here are, are, are her scars, right? And he's looking at her, he's listening to her, and he's still very confused about the whole situation because he's holding on to this ring. He knows his brother is dead, uh, but he's holding on to this ring as if one thing doesn't have, that the person who is sitting before him, whose sexual appetite uh, he sort of expressed or projected onto her, is confusing to him. It's almost like it's almost like he has cognitive dissonance that he did a deed so many years ago, but he has distanced himself so far from it that it that it makes no sense that the person that he raped as a child is now sitting before him and explaining her narrative history. It's like, why do you want to tell me that now? Why didn't you tell me that when you were ten? But of course, she couldn't tell him that because she was the product and she had to act like a product and she had to learn the dictates of men i mean uh the ways of men and take it and so he doesn't seem to understand because he thought he was there he had a goal in mind to revive his career revive his reputation and he used and he wanted to use this interview with the hitman as a way to do that uh not understanding the the illogical aspect of interviewing a hitman it doesn't even make any sense to do that because then he would have to bring himself out of the shadows. It's not like the person was formerly in prison as maybe a murderer and then um, you decided that you wanted to interview him, right? If he's a hitman, he's going to be a hitman. He's, it's not like the title of the movie is not interview with a former hitman. And no hitman would really come uh, to light with never really come to the forefront and reveal to people that he was a hitman. So he was so blinded by his desire to revive his career and re and uh, bring him out, bring himself out of this, you know, this disgraced social position, economic position that he didn't, that he just missed completely the obvious, right? Um, but he's holding his ring as if one thing doesn't have anything to, to do with the other. He doesn't really understand her purpose and why she's here and what it relates to and how uh, she was she was the woman as as a ten year old that he raped. So he looks back at Victor because it's that's what male energy does. It's trying to understand why do why do you have me here doing this? Why am I entertaining this woman? Uh, he's not saying as much, but it's like it's it's I don't understand what's going on because he's still stuck in the interview. 
he's still stuck in his original purpose for for why he decided to do an interview and he can't make sense of the fact that uh, that that the narrative is shifting on him and that whatever narrative he put in his head to justify many of the decisions that he made uh it no longer uh suits him and and actually his narrative history has is now confronting her narrative history the worlds are colliding they met each other when she was 10 years old and however old he was and now their worlds their narrative histories are colliding and it's like he is is doesn't make any sense right for him and so Victor is preparing to do what he does, which is um, uh, he's going to assassinate him. She is finishing her story. And right now he is pleading for some kind of mercy, you know, because again, when you get to a certain age and you start to feel your mortality, whatever you've done in your 20s and 30s, you just don't feel like it should matter now that you're in your 50s and your 60s. But those decisions, they come to haunt you. They they catch up with you. She was 10. So many years later, if she's, let's say she's eight, uh, 18, 19, 20. Well, it took 10 years later for it to catch up. 10 years on his time, 10 years on her time, right? And so uh, uh, those decisions, whether you like it or not, whether you you know try to uh, distance yourself from them or not they're still going to come back and haunt you in the same way that the consequence of Ho of victor killing her family members uh is now going to uh, haunt him as well and so he gets ready to uh, pull out his gun and just before that she says again that it was all an illusion to get you to trip up so that you can see it was me who took it all away. And then Victor shoots him. She looks at him on the ground. Um, you know, I think she is moved by it. I don't think there's real happiness for it. I think it's just the completion of the setup, the complete what well, the completion of one part of the setup. And it's it's that part that is done, right? And remember, she's still holding a gun that Victor gave her from the uh, from the interviewer. And I, maybe he just didn't think about it or whatever. And you wonder why didn't she shoot the man who helped, uh, who hurt her all those years ago, but she got Victor to do it. Victor is actually unsettled about it. For the first time, we see a person who has just shot someone else actually be bothered by it except for when he was with sergey but that's a different type of um sergey wasn't an assassination target sergey was a betrayer that he had to eliminate that he was forced to eliminate um the interviewer was considered an assassination target and um not so much for Victor, but mainly for Bethesda, but because he loves Bethesda, uh, the interviewer became an assassination target for Victor. So he goes and sits back down on the couch. On really, he didn't really know uh, what she was up to, of course, because after all, it just seems like, you know, the task is done. He thought it was all about that task to kill the interviewer, set him up and kill him. But when she raises the gun, he's actually shocked. And she came dressed well for it, hair and all, with the necklace, like she was going to a fancy event. So she holds the gun, holds him at gunpoint, and then she goes into her speech with him. So she shoots him and um, and she's very careful in how she says her words. She doesn't yell, she doesn't talk fast. She uh, just says what she needs to say and uh, basically tell, tells him first, don't die yet, right? So then she asks, why go, go to all these lengths? And then uh, to make you fall in love with me, to have a life together, uh, the pain, and then she reveals she's the one who sold him to traffic him. So that kitchen fight scene that we see is, that was a setup, right? 
And then um, she talks about how uh, it's a boy, your boy, the boy you've always dreamed of. When he grows up, he will despise you. And she makes a statement that Sergey uh, made that sometimes a simple bullet is not enough. So the very thing that Sergey told Victor about the guy that they were holding hostage and bringing that woman in who had the hood on her uh, head is the same thing that she's saying. Because remember, she learned the ways of men. So he's looking at his wound. Um, that wound says a lot. You know, how many wounds has has he um, has he given to other people, and now he is actually wounded. But the wound is more than the than the bullet in the chest. The wound is in his heart as well. The wound is in his mind. The wound is in his own confusion. And in the same way that the interviewer is confused about the whole setup, Victor is just as confused too. He's just as confused. And so uh, she goes through her uh, speech where she's talking about it and how um, um, she went through uh, all these um, lengths. And she basically says that I didn't want you to miss out. And so this is where uh, the flashback uh, comes where uh, Alexi is receiving a package in the mail with a video, a CD, uh, CD or DVD, and he watches it. This is Alexi here, who works for Interpol, who Victor let go. And he's watching the scene that Victor was in. And so she lying on the ground is part of, to me, is part of the whole ploy. That she wasn't as hurt as uh, she made her step out to be. Remember when I said that little cut on her lip just seemed odd? Just one cut? All these men who, who are trying to attack her and she only has that one cut. She don't even have handprints on her neck. And so this is Alexi watching uh, Victor fight the very man who had his hand around Bethesda's uh, mouth. This is how he knew. And this is how he uh, justifies selling Victor out to get out of the game, uh, the mob. And so then Trafficant receives that very video, right? Because Alexi is still part of the mob. And there you see Caesar and Trafficant is gonna send Caesar to kill Victor. But we already know that Victor kills Caesar. And then um, uh, she finishes her speech. She basically finishes uh, uh, what she wanted him to know about the fact that she has a boy and and that the fact that uh, she sold him out and that that to bring a man to his knees a simple bullet is not enough and so she's re um, there's a flashback victor is not having a flashback but when she makes the statement that it's a boy your boy the boy you've always dreamed of when he grows up, he will despise you, right? That it is the writer director who is inserting this as a as a pseudo flashback, right? That Victor always had some kind of longing for something else. That as a boy, he gets up off the bed, he looks out the window and he hopes. Now he goes about it by becoming a mob enforcer and making a life changing decision that is now going to catch up to him, meaning that he's going to be killed. But it is this boy here, the boy, the boyness of him that she's going to raise and that she's going to show him the video of the interview and that uh, um, and she's going to encourage him to despise Victor. Victor is going to be dead. However, to me, that is not as effective as a strategy. Uh, it would have been better to leave Victor alive and keep the child away from him. And that be actually a way to, uh, to, you know, sort of bring him to his knees to the point that he can't have a relationship with his child. But I do understand what she is doing here. 
uh, in terms of uh, channeling the boy in him that wanted better uh, and connecting that to the boy in her belly that is going to grow up without his father. And so we have this juxtaposition of when he makes that decision, that initial decision to become a mob enforcer to when he's holding uh, um, her at gunpoint as a child. And this is her face that we see, same kind of hair coloring. Um, that that same girl that he was holding hostage is the same, I mean, uh, holding at gunpoint and about to pull the trigger and was stopped by Sergey is the same girl who is standing before him now. So he finally uh, gives in to his wound. He dies. And um, he, he is basically, um, he just dies. And so that very boy in him looks out the window hoping for better. Um, the one who became something before his time, uh, who, because if he, if, if being a mob enforcer was the thing he was supposed to do, then he wouldn't have had to frame himself as an outsider. But sometimes you make decisions because you feel like you have to make certain types of decisions. So let's recap Victor's setbacks, how the character's narrative history frames plot setbacks. Well, remember, we looked at uh, different narrative histories, and we're looking at how uh, their narrative history helps us to sort of see how the plot is framed in terms of setbacks. So let's look at the um, narrative timelines. We have Victor's childhood. Then we have Victor's role as an enforcer from childhood to adulthood. Then we have Victor's role as a lover, as an adult. Victor's flashbacks to childhood toxic family life, Victor's role as a friend of a friendship group from childhood to adulthood. So they were friends on the um, in the courtyard, but they became enemies with the exception of Mark, who as, as uh, adults 20 years later. And then Victor's dual role as an enforcer. So he is a mob assassin, but he's also someone who confronts the mob system later after he has been betrayed because once he is betrayed, he considers himself as an outsider. Um, and so using uh, that term with the second boss. Let's look at his assignments and I call them task management. So Victor is assigned and sent to collect money owed to the mafia. So that's his main uh, job. Victor is assigned to work a drug purchase with Franco, the son of trafficking, who kills the man they are making a deal with. Victor is assigned to cover up the murder, not realizing that he's actually going to be killed himself, uh, scapegoated and killed. Victor is assigned to kill a British police officer by the second boss who cannot be bought. He pours liquid nicotine into, into his coffee, inducing heart failure. Victor is assigned to kill a female reporter writing an article about his uh, mob boss, but he abandons that assignment and does not uh, kill her and lets her go. And then Victor is, a, is implicitly assigned to set up the interviewer by Bethesda, even though we don't know that it is Bethesda who is setting up the whole thing. So these are his different assignments. There are assignments that he give himself but I'm only looking at the assignments that that uh, he is expected to uh, complete via instruction. So these are accumulation of Victor's setbacks. So Victor becomes an enforcer for Sergey as a child. So I, I'm using that as a set, uh, setback because he's supposed to be in school. He's not supposed to be making decisions that are too big for him to make. Um, don't forget that larger t-shirt that he was wearing. And then when he comes back into the house and, and he's engaging with his father or, or his father is engaging with him, he has on a child's t-shirt. 
Victor experiences a setback when Franco messes up a deal, leaving Trafficant to order Sergey to kill Victor instead of Franco. So even though Franco is the one who created the problem, he's not admonished. He's not reprimanded. He's not really scolded, right? Uh, Victor is the one who is scapegoated, which creates a betrayal on, beha on behalf of Sergey. Victor kills Sergey when Sergey attempts to kill Victor, but is unsuccessful. Uh, instead, Victor kills Sergey, the man who raised him, leaving him to fake his death and leave Romania for London, England. So this is a setback for Victor because Sergey was his surrogate father. Sergey was the one who was his instructor, his teacher, uh, everything that he felt like he needed and everything that Sergey felt like he needed. Uh, he was to Victor. Victor petitions to become an enforcer for another boss, but is set back when his second lieutenant tries to have the boss killed. So um, even though Victor is successful in killing that cop, cop who won't be bought, uh, the, the second lieutenant is the one who tries to have his own boss killed, which sets back Victor because then he could have joined the uh, crew the organization, but he decides not to because he can't take the risk. Victor meets Bethesda, drops his guard, falls in love, and is killed by the woman who, as a child, he had a gun to, held a gun to, and killed her family. So that's a setback for him because it is knowledge that he is not privy to. Had he been privy to that knowledge and recognized the girl, and you know, she says, just like the interviewer, I'm, I'm not surprised that you don't recognize me because I was only 10. Well, in some ways she was talking to Victor at the same time, that I'm not surprised you don't recognize me because I was only 10. So that's a setback for him because that's knowledge that that he is not privy to, that that is not revealed to him and that he does not discern. Because had he discerned it, the very gun that he just shot the interviewer with, he would have uh, shot Bethesda with. Victor straddles the roles of enforcer as assassin and moral dictator. So when he frames himself as an outsider because of that betrayal from uh, Sergey, then he sort of becomes this moral dictator, you know, fighting the men in the kitchen, um, in that restaurant, letting uh, uh, the reporter go, letting um, Alexi go. So now he's become sort of like a moral, moral dictator. When he says enough, to the men who are hurting Bethesda, uh, he's he's trying to uh, go by some sort of moral code. So let's look at the narrative history. So there are multiple narrative histories explored within the film. So we have Victor's narrative history, which goes back and forth in flashback mode. Then we have mob narrative history, meaning the things that they teach you how to do, which uh, uh, is, uh, Prepare, eavesdrop, learn about your enemies, blend into the environment. Um, don't miss. Um, um, eliminate your enemy, right? Assassinate. So there's mob narrative history. And that mob narrative history also includes hierarchy. You know, you have a mob boss and then you have a first lieutenant or Second lieutenant, then you have foot soldiers, right? You have the types of people that Trafficant says of, of Sergey that they do what they're told. Um, and then you have other people in places that you uh, um, you put, sort of like Alexi. Alexi works for Interpol, but he's also really connected to Trafficant because Trafficant at, at any time could could uh, have Alexi killed. So mob narrative history is explored in different ways from the perceptions of different characters as well as, as um, th the dialogue of characters. But narrative history also includes, mob, mob narrative history also includes betrayal and scapegoating and uh, no consequences. And you can be killed at any time, right? That it is not as safe and protected and covered as you would think it uh, would be, especially if you are doing much of the hard work in terms of assassinating uh, targets. 
women and young children narrative history. So the women are beaten, they are abused, they have no real voice. Only at the end of the film do we see women have a voice with Bethesda as she recounts her narrative. She takes control of her own narrative history and uh, recounts it before the interviewer and by default before Victor. And then she uh, uh, solves her narrative history, the violence of it by shooting, by shooting Victor because Victor was always the target. Uh, in many ways, Bethesda is the one who gets Victor to kill everybody, essentially. Sergey, trafficking, all of them, even if, even if, even if some of the kills are not necessarily related, uh, she's really the one controlling the whole narrative history of the film, the plot development, because uh, we wouldn't, we really wouldn't have the film without her setting things up. So young children are sold into service. Women can be sold into service, put to service for the sexual appetites of men. So they are product. And sure, uh, you don't want to, sure, you might see her uh, scarred in her back, but now we can answer that question why she only had a little bit of a uh, cut on her lip because you don't want to scar your product's face. No one wants to have sex with someone whose face is beaten up, whose uh, uh, eye is punched out or something like that, right? You still want to maintain a product that is um, commercial, that is appealable, that is desirable. So women and child, young children narrative, the young children, the men, they go, they are also put to service, not necessarily sexually as we uh, might um, conclude, but they are put to service to, uh, they learn how to shoot very early and they learn how to shoot people and assassinate people very, very early. They usually have a mentor like Sergei uh, to Victor. So women and young children, narrative history. Then the enforcer narrative history. So I put that in, I put the S in parentheses because I'm talking, um, I'm mainly uh, discussing Victor and how he starts out as a mob assassin and then how he and how he basically ends up as an outsider but then you can look at um Cesar's uh enforcer narrative history that his narrative history is connected to victor on the in the courtyard but his narrative history also extends to uh having to kill or be sent to kill victor as well you can also look at the enforcer narrative history where he's uh, where Victor is supporting the larger system of mob and mafia and criminal activity and violence, but then has as a change of heart when he's fighting the man in the kitchen and he's taking him and he's hitting him from from both the side and the back as 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 if he's coming to the um, coming to the mob in a sense to. Um, coming from the side and the back um, and from the neck as well. And then um, maybe the mob, I mean, the enforcer narrative history where you have Sergey who uh, must collect the money from people old. And if he can't collect the money, he must kill them. So the enforcer narrative history, uh, you can examine it from uh, from different uh, viewpoints and then to then the interviewers narrative history and so the interviewer uh, is does not at any point perceive his mortality he comes to an interview um, or he or or he uh, commissions an interview to try to get his life back to get his reputation back not knowing that it's really a trap and that the person that he raped when she was 10 years old is the person that he's going to have to confront on his journey to death. So the interviewer narrative history has interesting um, implications. You know, Victor doesn't really, quote unquote, interview Bethesda. You know, he is moved by the emotional aspect of her being attacked. And so he is so he is operating from a place of emotion when he continues to engage her. And even when he's conflicted about 
you know, developing a life with her and becoming a father to their unborn child, there's really still no interviewing. We don't see him interviewing the scars on her back, even though he's rubbing them, he's looking at them, and they remind him of the hand that he put on his mother's back, uh, her scars, but there's no interviewing, there's no dialogue. There's only the dialogue of, this is hard for me, I've never had to do this, and her dialogue, you don't know how to love, um, and, and his dialogue, I don't want you to go. It's more along the lines of, of dialogue, which basically suggests that, that Victor was, is missing something. He's missing the emotional uh, capacity of himself to care about someone, to love someone. So he does an interview. You know, uh, Vic, uh, Victor interviews Cesar just before he uh, kills him. Uh, maybe a little bit of interviewing with Mark, who maybe some interviewing uh, with Alexi to, to, to figure out uh, how they discovered he was alive and who sold him out and things like that. But the main interviewer is the one who's actually conducting the interview with Victor. And everything else is, is, is basically sub interviews. So let's look at Victor's narrative history. So Victor is raised in an abusive home. His father beats his mother. His father also owes money to Sergei, who later kills the father, leaving the mother some money and the lighter in an envelope. Victor becomes an enforcer, faithful, loyal, supportive, skilled, and trusting. Victor desires to, to escape his fate. Victor never believes that the people he supports would betray him. Victor changes his views on being an enforcer as well as the purpose of the mob and using the language outsider. Victor struggles with loving Beth uh, Bethesda, finally letting down his guard to embrace her and their unborn child, but only realizing that she set him up to die. So that is a simple narrative history. There are some, um, some sub examples um, for which you would need to rewatch the, the movie, but that's the, that's the base of it, of his narrative history. So mob narrative history, never miss, blend into your environment, learn the secrets of your enemies, prepare, eavesdrop, infiltrate, eliminate when necessary to bring a man to his knees, actually break him, a simple bullet is not enough, and then a long career ahead. Because it is assumed that you can't get out. And, and Alexin thinking that he could send that video to uh, Trafficant with the hopes of getting out, eventually Trafficant, if left alive, would have probably tried to kill Alexi because you don't get out of this. And it is Sergey who says that Victor has a long career ahead of him. So there's the expectation that you will die being a mob assassin. You, there's nothing, there's... Um, uh, no way you can get out. That's why you hear trafficking in the uh, cafe said, you cannot change your nature. A man cannot change his nature, right? Uh, and so all he's basically doing is countering the ideals in Victor's head about wanting to get out. Women, children, women, young children, narrative history. So Sergey says to Victor's father, Regarding the money owed, if you don't get me my money, I'm going to put your wife to work. When Victor shoots Bethesda's family, Sergei, Trafficant, and another man take the two young girls and put them to work. Bethesda, as an older woman speaking to the interviewer, talks about her sister not enduring the sexual appetites of men. Bethesda was able to endure the sexual appetites of men and learn the ways of men. And then this allows Bethesda to get her vengeance. So in the same way that uh, Sergey taught Victor to essentially gain intel on their enemy, Bethesda became who she needed to become in order to gain intel on Victor and, and as well as the, the larger mob system. So Vic, uh, the enforcer narrative history, so Victor's Two out of three friends become enforcers, so Alexi and Cesar. 
Marku does not become an enforcer. His life is motherfucked, according to Cesar, because Marku is fat, overweight, married, and not purposeful, like being an, an enforcer brings. Victor's bullies are also enforcers, but they must bow to Victor, whom Victor later kills. Uh, and they basically kill, um, he basically kills him 20 years later. And then there are no friendships. Caesar is sent by trafficking to track and kill Victor, but he is unsuccessful because Victor detects him and kills him instead. And we still don't know how Victor uh, found out that trafficking learned about him. It could be that, um, I don't know. I just, I don't know how that came about. And it's hard to look at the implications of the movie other than to think maybe, maybe on some level, uh, Bethesda revealed herself in terms of uh, telling Victor enough in order for him to be able to shoot the interviewer and then maybe connecting that to somehow uh, revealing that they know Victor is alive. Other than that, I don't know how he learns that they have learned that he is alive. We know how they have learned it, but we don't know how he has learned it. So the interviewer's narrative history, the interviewer's narrative history is reported through Bethesda. And at the end of the film, it is Bethesda who reveals who the interviewer is, along with his brother, whom Victor kills, and how she was put to service for the interviewer and his brother. The interviewer's narrative history begins and ends the film since he commissions the interview and is later commissioned to be killed. So then does uh, this begs the question, who puts it in his mind? Who puts it in the interviewer's mind to commission an interviewer with a hitman? Um, so when we know that it can't be Bethesda, because when she comes in at the end, the interviewer doesn't recognize her. So it can't be her. So someone put it in his mind uh, to do so. I don't know how that come about. So we don't have access to that information. But he commissions this interview because it's not like Victor uh, appeals to the man, to the interviewer and says, I want you to interview me. Or that could have been how this happened. That Victor uh, might have said to the interviewer, I want to get out, but I want to tell my story. And, you know, I know that you, you know, tell certain stories. He, he wouldn't say, I know that you were disgraced and so I could help you out or something like that. He's not going to say it like that. But it could be that Victor was the one who, who said, okay, I want to tell my story as a hitman, which would still be odd, you know. Regardless, though, the film begins and ends uh, with the interviewer commissioning the interviewing interview uh, interview, and later he is commissioned to be killed. So somewhere in the narrative, uh, Bethesda takes over. And since she is still behind the whole thing, uh, she must still be the one who really is the one in the shadows who commissions the interview. So understanding how the narrative histories frame plot setbacks, let's look at timelines. So the writer-director shifts narratives and timelines through flashbacks and sequences. So uh, present day between Victor and the interviewer and the interviewer's brother, past between Victor and his family, mother and father, past again between Victor and his friends, between Victor and his mob associates, leading to present day decision-making, and then from past to present day between Victor and Bethesda. And so if you were looking at ways to sort of study the plot development of the writer director, these might be instances where you can you could do that. So understanding how the narrative histories frame plot setbacks in terms of choices. So the interview, Victor sits for an interview to discuss his choice and roles as an assassin. Victor's choice, Victor becomes a mob enforcer. The setup, Bethesda sets up the interviewer, his brother and Victor. And um, the betrayals, Victor is betrayed by Sergei, trafficking, and two of his childhood friends. 
And then the ultimate betrayal that ends the film, Victor is betrayed by Bethesda. Again, if uh, these may be different ways that you could focus your attention on how to study uh, the film. Then understanding how the narrative histories frame plot setbacks. So in terms of plot development, the plot and narrative and the movie overall hangs really on Bethesda's setup. And so she sets up Victor, she sets up the interviewer, she sets up the interviewer's brother, and then any related member of the mob responsible for putting women and children to service. We are only watching the film and the actors at play because Bethesda set up all the encounters. Therefore, it is arguable that the movie is solely about Victor, meaning that uh, the, movie's, the movie's title is uh, Interview with the Hitman. But, you know, in many cases, uh, Bethesda becomes a hitman at the end. When you think about it, she, uh, uh, she, she sort of permits Victor, uh, she assigns Victor to kill the interviewer in the same way that Sergey and Trafficant assign Victor to assassinate, right? Um, but in shooting Victor, she becomes him. She becomes a hitman. Now she's a mother with an unborn child, uh, despises the father of that child and, and, and is going to deprive that father of ever knowing his child, but she becomes him. So that's why I wonder if, if the true film is about her and less about Victor. So let's look at the seven stages of setback, um, the definitions and what the stages suggest for a character's narrative history. And so we're gonna look at both uh, Victor and Bethesda and maybe any other character that kind of comes to mind. So uh, the following represent the seven stages of setback explored within Overcoming Setback, my book, which will be available August 2021. So missed opportunity, punishment, pain, correction, recovery, restoration, and advanced. So uh, advanced. So if you think about the common uh, course analogy, if you fail the course, it's your missed opportunity, meaning that there's something in that course you did not learn. And so you have failed it. And now you're gonna have to take that course over again. One, um, if, we, if we were looking at a sample course, like a math course, we all know it is common universal global knowledge that when you are um, solving a math problem, you have to show your work. You are never permitted just to put down an answer. You may have a, have a scantron where you circle an answer on the scantron, but you are expected to couple that with showing your work. So if you fail to do that and the teacher um, you know, decided to fail you because you didn't show how you arrived at the problem, uh, at the solution rather, then that's your missed opportunity. So then the punishment would be to require you to take that course over. And there are certain courses that if you want, that, you ha that if you're gonna graduate, you have to complete. And any of your core courses, English, science, history, math, you have to complete those courses to graduate, whether you are graduating from high school or college, or even trade school. Even trade school has uh, core courses that you still have to uh, take and complete in order to graduate. So then the punishment would be that you have to take that course over. And the pain is having to take that course over and learn everything that you were supposed to learn while also taking new courses that have their own individual demands. It's an inconvenience. The pain is inconvenient. So then the correction would be um, to do the things that you were supposed to do, which is for every problem on every quiz, every test, every in-class activity, you have to show your work, period. I remember an instructor grading assignments while we were in the teacher's lounge. And uh, and I noticed she was a math professor and I noticed how when she was checking the students' work, she was checking their work line by line. And and it's not like she gave, took, uh, she gave them um, sort of like some grace if they missed a line 
but she was sort of every line it was either a check mark or an x and i was so you know fascinated i teach english so i check my students work line by line as well in terms of their writing but i just thought that was so fascinating that she was checking it line by line and she was telling them that this line is incorrect and so that if one line is incorrect you're going to arrive at the wrong solution right so that correction is doing the things that you were supposed to do in the previous course now then recovery is recovering from a bad thinking about how to uh, uh, set a goal endure a goal complete a goal right that one bad thinking could be, I'm just going to skip ahead. I don't need to do it the way that the teacher wants me to do it. I'm just going to skip and do what I'm going to do, and I can still put the answer down and pass the class, right? Or the bad thinking is, I don't really need a an A in this course. I mean, I can do just fine with a passing grade, which is a C. Okay, that's kind of bad thinking because then eventually it's going to affect your GPA. And we're still on the course analogy. Then restoration usually requires a mentor someone to mentor you in your thinking to sort of usher you towards advance and advance is that is that forward and continuous movement so you don't run a race just to get to uh, the finish line and stop there you're supposed to cross the finish line that's why i say uh, people oftentimes uh, live in setback or they live in survivor's mode and they have no vision for actually overcoming. So these are the seven stages of setback using a course analogy. And now we're gonna look at it in terms of the context of the film. So the very first stage of setback, uh, as you know, is a missed opportunity. And so now we're going to apply uh, the seven stages of setback to the film. So to miss something is to fail to notice hear or understand something that was crucial for you to know. And that is essentially, uh, we have all said, man, I missed that. I, I can't believe I missed that. I can't believe I, I, you know, ignored that warning, right? So to, I consider that a missed opportunity. So in terms of the film, the narrative histories of the film, what was Victor's missed opportunity? what was Bethesda's missed opportunity, what was the writer's, director's missed opportunity, and then how does the writer-director use missed opportunity? And remember, the writer-director is not using the stages of setback or the theme of setback in the film. He's, he, he or she is just writing the film. And, and in this case, Perry Bandall is both the writer and director for um, this film. But I am applying the theme of setback and I'm calling attention to those areas where I feel like the writer director uh, is using missed opportunity. So let's look at it. In terms of Victor, I feel like uh, the obvious missed opportunity for Victor is he didn't attend school. We don't see Victor and his friends in the courtyard attending any school. Now, we don't know if it's summertime or something like that, uh, but we definitely don't see them attending school. Um, instead, he chose to join the mob. So that's going to be an obvious missed opportunity because he's not heeding the warnings in the sense that his father borrowed some money from the mob and look what they did to him. He He's standing outside that door, looking at them um, beat up his father and slap his mother. And that alone should be enough warning, okay, I should not join the mob. Even his father didn't join the mob, right? Because if they if he did, uh, we would have seen him assassinate someone. So not attending school, choosing to join the mob is basically missing those obvious warning signs. Victor didn't surveil Bethesda. Instead, he took Bethesda at her word. And mainly he took her at her emotions, right? That um, this person coming in to the restaurant, sitting down, and something is happening to her at the back of the restaurant and um then somehow they get into a relationship he didn't surveil her that's his pattern that's his standard no she's not necessarily an an assassination target but when he goes and 
uh, finds out that she's pregnant and then he and then he puts the gun to her head. It's a little too late now, right? And so um, um, there's no sense in having some kind of skepticism or some kind of fear of her or some suspicion of her. It's too late. You've impregnated her. So his missed opportunity was in not surveilling her and also taking her emotions at at face value. Sure, if a woman has been attacked, we automatically assume that we should go in and try to help that person and rescue that person. But there are situations where a woman is setting up a man to be attacked or to be uh, killed. There have been news reports of a woman luring a man uh, to a destination only for her boyfriend to be standing in a wood somewhere, come out and then rob the man. And so he took her at her emotions. Victor also followed his emotions and his desire to rescue Bethesda. Rescuing Bethesda was not just that one moment in the kitchen. Rescuing Bethesda was that whole step-by-step uh, -step process um, till about six months and, and some months after that, where he's following his emotions. He's not thinking logically. The moment called for logic. It didn't call for emotions. It, well, actually, every moment when he is operating as an assassin, and he's really never not operating as an assassin. He's not taking breaks. He's not taking vacations. He's always an assassin. So that means if he's always an assassin, he's always on point. He's always sober. He's always mindful of his surroundings. He's always uh, uh, critical of the people that, that he engaged. Who are these people? Uh, what sort of purpose are they going to serve in my life? So he, um, I feel like he followed his emotions. He, he did not uh, use the logical thinking of his brain when it came to uh, Bethesda. Okay, so with Bethesda, her missed opportunity is, of course, she doesn't forgive Victor. Both Victor and Bethesda are kids. They are both being used by the same system. And so, yes, he kills her parents, but he's, he's, he's um, in the language of all the other modern forces, he had no other choice but to do it. He, um, he had to do it. Either he do it or he's killed that's what Sergei says to Victor. And so she doesn't forgive Victor. She doesn't have any compassion on him in the same way that they they both come from the same neighborhood or from the same economic background or from the same economically depressed areas or whatever. And they're both being put to work. So she doesn't forgive him. But that's a, doesn't give herself an opportunity of um, sustaining a family. So she lost the family, sure, at Victor's hands, but this would have been the opportunity for her and Victor to create a family, not just have an unborn child, but but birth the child and raise the child together and have a family together, leave the country, start a whole new life. So she really, um, she really deprives herself of having, of 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 giving herself a family again. And then Bethesda takes on her father's debt, but she had no choice, which is a strange thing. But I say it in this way because she had she was involuntarily forced to take on her father's debt by being put to work. But then she shifts her narrative when um, she recognizes her uh, sister is not is too weak for the sexual appetites of men, and that she's uh, strong enough to withstand. And she shifts her narrative when she says, I learned the ways of men. So then her missed opportunity would be to uh, learn the ways of men, but not use it to her advantage in terms of taking vengeance, right? That learning the ways of men could have led to a multitude of things. It could have led to her becoming a cop. It could have led to her um, getting into politics or something like that. And I feel like there was a missed opportunity to really learn the ways of men. She's talking about in my, in my uh, understanding or in my uh, way of thinking, she's talking about learning the ways of men in terms of, uh, you know, sexually, 
in um, how they engage in business or whatever. And somewhere she learned about uh, sometimes a uh, sometimes to bring a man to his uh, knees. A simple bullet is not enough. So he she heard that, but she gained a lot of intel from ten years old being put to work. She learned she she was moved up the system from 10, 10 years old, 11, 12, 13, or whatever. And she learned a lot about that whole mob system that she could have taken. Instead of setting up Victor to be killed, she could have learned all of that information and took it and, um, and told someone, became a cop, became a regulatory uh, person. So that's what I feel like she missed her opportunity. So the writer-director misses opportunities to provide clarity on narrative histories between the characters. So there's a lot of gaps. Uh, the writer-director does not provide a clear line of development regarding how Bethesda sets up Victor. In terms of the steps, we get pieces of it. We get it in flashback or we get it in uh, a reverse sequence. We get a number of ways of how we find out. but it would have been better to give us a sort of line by line. It would have been interesting to see, it would have been interesting to see um, Bethesda go back into the same restaurant, talk to uh, the person in charge, get the, uh, the tape from that person, and then navigate how that looks in terms of how she gives it to Alexi or, or if she mails it to somebody or whatever. So there's, there are some sort of gaps. We do not know if Bethesda's sister is still alive. So um, she's talking about her sister being too weak, but we don't really, is that a, a continued motivating factor for why she uh, uh, decides to, uh, to, to, uh, to set up Victor and all, all, all of the parties involved? And then we are missing some background information on characters. And sometimes it's necessary, sometimes it's not necessary. But I do feel like there are some, there's some background characters that would be interesting. I mean, background information that would be interesting to know regarding certain characters. So that's your missed opportunity for Victor, Bethesda, and then writer-director. So let's look at punishment. Punishment, the purpose of punishment is to address negative and or bad behavior. To punish is to inflict a penalty, discipline, and then of course correction. So what was Victor's punishment? What was Bethesda's punishment? And then how does the writer director use punishment and or punish characters? Now, he may not, the writer director may not necessarily uh, think punishment in mind, but characters are punished. And so it will be interesting to see how that works out. So Victor, Victor is punished for being loyal. Strange enough, Franco is not the one punished. He's the one who messes up a drug deal, but he's not punished. Um, sure, his father is not going to kill him. His father is not going to scapegoat Franco. His father is not going to tell Sergey no, um, no traces. I want you to kill my son. Of course not. But he doesn't punish him either. Uh, he sort of skates by and we don't hear much more about Franco until uh, Victor goes into the cafe when he has returned back to his country and he goes and talks to trafficking and um, and he says to a trafficking that he's alive and he will stay that way based upon you. But other than that, Franco is not punished. It's Victor who is punished. Victor was doing his job as a mob enforcer. Right, but then he has to be punished because Franco uh, purposely messed up that drug deal, and so then Victor is punished at the end of the film film for his choices. So that one choice to jo join the mob uh, catches up with him as an adult when Bethesda shoots him. So in the same way that you would say people who join gangs who uh, become criminals, who do a certain number of things, they, it catches up with you. There's, uh, it's, it's just as true if you live by the uh, sword, you die by the sword, right? And so eventually your choice is going to catch up with you unless you allow yourself to go through a correction process and, and sort of repair your broken thinking and let someone 
um, um, mentor you and then you advance from there. Other than that, Victor is punished basically at the end of the film for his choices because he's not uh, allowed, the writer director doesn't allow him to live nor does um, Bethesda. And then Bethesda kills him because he killed her family. So that's basically a punishment. That is really her vengeance. That's her way of uh, taking vengeance, but that's how he is also punished. So Bethesda, like all women in the film, are punished for being women. They are abused by men, which is, uh, I know that sounds weird to say, but they are the ones who are beaten. Uh, like I said with Franco, Franco messed up a major deal, uh, um, sort of uh, killed the son of a major boss. And why isn't he hit upside the head? Why isn't a belt taken to his back, right? Why isn't um, um, he reprimanded? Why isn't a gun put to his face? But it's all the women in the film who are punished just just for being women because you have the women who are standing up for their uh, men like Victor's mom and one of the uh, foot soldiers slaps her and then uh, Victor's uh, father beats her in the back, right? And then you have Victor going in to collect money from that father and uh, it's the wife who actually sort of sides with Victor about the money uh, uh, he owes, but it's Victor who kills the wife, right? L leaving the two girls who then have to be put to work and they are also abused and scarred. If you look at Bethesda's back, there, there's a narrative history to, to those scars. So it's all the women in the, uh, the film who are actually uh, punished. Bethesda, for, um, facilitates punishment of Victor and all men involved. So any men that are connected to um, Victor killing her family, she facilitates uh, the punishment of Victor and all those men involved. So then the writer director allows women to be punished, but not men when they make bad choices. Trafficking does not punish his son. So that's now we know it's kind of obvious that that it is the prerogative of the writer director to uh, ensure that women are consistently punished within this film. There's no rhyme or reason to it. Uh, I said at the beginning it's, it's uh, because uh, they are women, because they are powerless. Uh, you don't see a woman in the film joining the mob to, um, to get power. You do see Bethesda at the end sort of um, operating as a pseudo assassin, right? Regaining her uh, her her power, uh, taking her power, but mainly women um, at the prerogative of the writer director. These are the women who are being punished in the film. So let's look at pain. The pain reminds you that you have done something wrong. You have made the wrong move and you need to undergo a process to let the pain ride itself out until the fever breaks. So what pain did Victor experience? What pain did Bethesda experience? How does the writer director use pain? And again, he may not be using pain in a direct sense, but it is clear that um, characters are in some form of pain. So Victor numbs himself to the pain of a toxic family environment. So the only time that we see Victor and and we don't even get an image of him. We just get an image of his hand reaching out uh, from one, one side of the frame and touching his mother's back. But the, but the majority of his childhood is with a blank, spa, uh, blank face. Uh, he doesn't say much. He doesn't voice much. He doesn't talk to his father. Uh, the toxic family environment, he just numbs himself to it. There's no there's no need to sort of engage it or cry uh, from it or anything like that. I don't remember us ever seeing him cry, Victor, as a child. And the only time that he does uh, really cry is when uh, Sergei is attempting to kill him. Other than that, um, 
there are some moments where his face gives off this idea that he may be uh, crying or there's some sort of uh, tears about the form. Um, and then I can't remember really if he cries when Bethesda shoots him. He's more shocked than anything, but he numbs himself to the pain of a toxic family environment as a child. He only begins feeling when he becomes an adult. And Victor experiences the pain of betrayal from Sergey and the mob. So this is a major pain from him. You can't say that he's experiencing pain when um, Bethesda shoots him because it, he's too much in, in the shock of it for him to really experience pain. The bullet hitting his chest is going to be painful. It's obvious. But the pain from the betrayal, her betrayal, is not as... Uh, uh, clear initially it would be it would be clearer if he survived that bullet wound and then you could see him lying up in a in a hospital bed um, um, shifting himself in the same way that he he turned off turned to uh, turned to his side when his father was beating his mother and then we could see the pain in his eyes and then tears forming or if she had let him live, or she didn't shoot him enough, uh, shoot him in such a way that he he died, uh, we could see the pain of him seeing a child, his child playing on the play, uh, playground, but not being able to engage the child. Right? That would be like really, really true pain for him. But um, the shot that she gives him is just is is too much of a shock. For her, for him to recognize it as pain, other than the uh, the feeling evoked from being shot, right? But we definitely see his uh, his face as pain when um, Sergey comes to kill him. But but that's the experiences the pain of losing her family. But we only see her immediately feel that pain when they are shot and the men are taking her out of the apartment with, along with her sister. But when she's talking to the interviewer at the end of the movie, um, we don't see pain in her eyes. We see her uh, presenting her argument, presenting her spiel, presenting her narrative history. And she is doing it as, as, as almost if she is giving testimony in court. There's pain behind her eyes, and 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 we have to assume that she's feeling pain every time she looks at Victor, whether she's at the table or whether she's in bed with him. But um, we don't. She experiences the pain of losing her family, but she's kind of numb to it as well. But there's the let's pain guide her decision making. So that pain from losing her family has guided her decision-making about taking vengeance and setting up Victor and then eventually killing Victor. Writer-director reveals the pain of mob enforcers who feel compelled to stay in the system and kill people they have worked with. So Sergei to Victor, Cesar to Victor, and then likely Alexei to Victor. And so that's why you hear them say, um, I had to do it, I had no other choice. Uh, it was either kill you or kill myself, right? Or or they would kill me. So they feel compelled to stay in the very system that they chose, that they're sort of uh, criticizing now because they have gone on to get families, get a wife uh, and have kids. And they realize now that they don't want their own family and kids a part of that system. So they'll sell, they feel compelled to sell each other out so they can get out. That's what Lexi basically uh, says uh, to Victor. Writer-director reveals the pain of enforcers who want to leave the mob and who will do anything to accomplish that goal, even if it means selling out a fellow comrade. And so uh, that's where you see Alexi in the office basically say, if I, I felt like I had to sell you out in order for me to get out. That's why you have Victor uh, framing himself now as an outsider and telling the men in the kitchen uh, enough because he basically wants to get out. You also have Victor 
letting the journalists go and um, letting Alexi go, right? Knowing that they could easily come back and reveal that Victor is still alive and that and that he let them go. So this is, uh, I, I just thought it was interesting that every mob enforcer had the same statement. So that lets you know they really did not want to be in the mob, but they felt like they were compelled to uh, to to join it and stay in it. So now let's look at correction. So the purpose of correction is to get you back on the original path set for you or you set for yourself. Correction is defined as the returning of something to its former place or condition. So was Victor corrected? Was Bethesda corrected? Was there any other character corrected? And then how does the writer director use correction? So let's look at Victor. Victor's decision as a child is corrected as an adult when Bethesda kills him. Strange enough, but Victor is unable to make the clean break he might want, even if he does not voice it. So uh, even though he started using uh, sort of exiting language, he's not able, he, he sort of corrects himself uh, in using that uh, language but he's not able to kind of overcome his setback fully, right? Because Bethesda kills him. So he's not really able to make the, make the clean break that, that he might be considering. When he puts the gun in the drawer, I felt like it was his way of wanting to say, it's time to put away childish things. Because after all, he, he came in as a child. Uh, and he shot a gun as a child and moved and transitioned from childhood to adulthood using the gun as a solution. And so um, uh, even if he was thinking, I don't want to do this anymore and I want out, and that uh, when he's talking to Alexi that we're basically the same, we want the same things, he's not able to get through the rest of the steps of uh, the, uh, the stages of setback. He can't move uh really into recovery or restoration or advance right in some ways he might be able to move into recovery in terms of recovering from the bad thinking uh but that takes that's a process unto itself as well so he, he his that decision to uh choose to become a mob enforcer is basically corrected when bethesda kills him uh, it is corrected as an adult, meaning that it should not have been the thing that he, he chose to do. And so now the universe, in a way, is basically correcting that decision. And so uh, death, is basic, ba death is essentially that perpetual setback. He will never be able to uh, come back alive and, and address the rest of his issues so that he overcomes setback for good. Victor corrects the betrayal by killing the people who put a hit on him. So that, that includes trafficking. Uh, and, and we have to assume that he has taken Franco hostage, right? But when he first leaves, when he, uh, when Sergei first comes and tries to kill him and then Victor kills him in return, Victor fakes his death. And, and when he fakes his death and leaves and uh, travels to London, England, that's not actually resolving the problem. That's just um, putting things on hold, setting things back, um, and, and, and essentially, you know, skipping ahead steps. The real issue, the real solution would have been to confront the people who were trying to put a hit on him. Now he corrects the betrayal by killing the people who put a hit on him, meaning that he, that uh, that was a course he kind of missed, and so now he had to come back and resolve the very thing that he ran away from. Victor self-corrects by reframing himself as an outsider and fighting the system. So remember when when he's fighting in the kitchen and he's hitting a man in the back. To me, that's coming from both the side and the back to fight the very system that he's been enforcing. And so once he does that, whether he's trying to protect someone or not, it doesn't matter. It's beside the point. You don't, you're not supposed to be 
disloyal to the system, even though the system can be disloyal to you and put a hit out on you. So uh, framing himself as an uh, as an outsider, meaning that uh, he no longer wants to be part of this system as a as a mob enforcer. Now, whether he decides to uh, become something else, become his own mob boss, or or uh, just leave the system altogether, we don't know yet, right? Um, and we definitely know that's not going to happen by the time Bethesda kills him. So Bethesda implicitly self-corrects her belief that all men are good. Instead, she learns the ways of men. So is she saying that her that her sister was too weak to endure the sexual appetites of men and that she was stronger? Then they're implicit in that is uh, the idea that the men around you are going to not treat you wrong. We may not say that they're going to treat you right or treat you well, but we don't but we don't expect an older gentleman to take a 10-year-old and sexually rape her. We don't expect that, right? She would never have expected. She hasn't been exposed to that. So, she is looking at uh the men through the lens of her own mother or or her own father who are both dead in the film, but she's looking at the world through their lens and anyone they bring into the house. It's interesting too that, that her father doesn't answer the door when he's head of house, but of course he assigns that task to the mother. But it's interesting, had he been a true protector of his family, he would have opened the door and then he would have uh, been the kind of guard for the family and recognize who uh, Victor was and solved that problem um, uh, immediately. But she self she self corrects her belief that all men are good. Instead, she learns the ways of men. So the learning the ways of men is the opposite of what might be implied um, uh, positively in that statement. Writer director corrects Victor by having him retake his course with the mob and finish what he started. So this time he can't fake his death again, right? But he has to confront the very mob that is out to uh, kill him. And so um, out, out to completely destroy him. So that was his way. Uh, that's how I feel like the writer director in exposing Victor and having the other... Um, um, well, exposing Victor and having the other ca uh, characters uh, discover that he is still alive, he is forced to come back and readdress uh, what he ran away from. And so uh, in each instance, he confronts each uh, character uh, responsible for scapegoating him, putting a hit out on him until he gets to trafficking, and then he basically kills trafficking. So recovery, to recover is to return to a state of health, mind, and strength. Without sound, soundness of mind, it would be difficult to accomplish or achieve anything. So did Victor recover? Did Bethesda recover? How does the writer, director recover characters or use recovery? So Victor recovers his reputation in returning to handle the people who, who betrayed him. So forced to come back and confront uh, the people who initially put a hit out on him. He, he recovers his reputation as um, a mob enforcer and also as basically regaining power. You know, they had the power in the situation and he and they doled out power to him as a mob enforcer, but they took that power away when they put a hit out on him. So he recovers his reputation in that way. Their bad thinking included scapegoating Victor for Franco's mistake. So um, he moves himself out of the out of the condition of being a scapegoat and takes his power back and recovers and shoots and kills them. Victor doesn't get a chance to recover his life outside of the mob because Bethesda takes his life. And so um, re recovery can be perceived in different ways. And so in this way, um, he cannot, he doesn't get to the point where he can actually recover. Had he made it through that shot in the chest, he could possibly recover. But once he is dead, there is no 
no opportunity to recover. But Bethesda recovers the reputation of her family, albeit falsely, because her father still owed money that she pays involuntarily with her life and body. So she recovers her reputation of her family in a sense of uh, being the only one left to make good on her own promise to set up and kill Victor. Bethesda is used to pay her father's debt, while Victor elects not to pay his father's debt. And so... Um, why that's significant it is it's significant because um although she is used to pay the father's debt um it doesn't really quite recover her right she's just being used however victor in some ways um when he decides not to pay his father's debt it is his way of kind of recovering himself Strange statements, but um, it's involuntary. But there's the doesn't recover from her thinking about vengeance. So vengeance is something that we don't know when she she decided to take vengeance. We do know that she started to learn the dictates of men. I mean, learn the ways of men, and maybe on some level, vengeance is forming in her thinking. Uh, but she doesn't quite recover from it because she actually takes vengeance. Writer-director recovers the bad thinking of characters using, I had no other choice, I had to do it, right? And trafficking says to Victor in the cafe, one cannot change one's nature. So you can't say uh, that you had no choice because you, because you still took the choice. You still made the choice to be a mob enforcer. Uh, you still made the choice to slip into Victor's apartment and kill him. And so the uh, trafficking statement, one cannot change one's nature, is sort of like a counter argument to those individuals who say, I had no other choice. Now, that is actually your nature. So you actually did have a choice. However, there is an attempt by Victor to, to change his nature by not killing the journalist or, or Alexi, letting them both go. So... Uh, that reframing himself as an outsider is then um, uh, exemplified in his new decision making by about not killing Bethesda, not killing the journalist, not killing Alexi. Victor is willing to change. So, so that disputes the whole idea. I had no other choice because there is a willingness on his part to actually change and and adopt a choice. Restoration. So restoration requires mentorship and mentorship is predicated on learning from someone who has walked out the process. So how does Victor restore himself? How does Bethesda restore herself? Did the writer director restore Victor? Did the writer director restore Bethesda? And how does the writer director use restoration? So Victor is personally restored. He mentors himself, framing himself as an outsider and using the word enough. So it wasn't every time that he shot someone previously uh, to him using that word, it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. He didn't even he didn't even use that term when he heard his father hit his mom, you know, beat his mom. So all the way up into the kitchen scene when he's trying to help Bethesda, it was never uh, enough. He never used the term enough, right? And he had been exposed to a lot of different types of violence at, at multiple levels. But it isn't until he uh, is willing to rescue Bethesda that, that he frames himself as an outsider and that enough becomes part of his vocabulary. Victor restores the people he, he doesn't kill. So the reporter and the uh, Alexa, meaning that they get a chance to get out. And Victor said to Alexa, if I have to come back here, I will kill you, right? So uh, the reporter basically is um, a fake death, right? Leave this apartment, don't come back. You are essentially dead. And also Alexa, so he restores them back to their former Whatever their former condition was, he, he restores them by letting them go. 
Bethesda mentors herself in learning the ways of men, understanding their sexual appetites. So instead of being, say, the victim who is consistently raped or feeling like a victim consistently raped, every rape or every sexual uh, experience, she is strategizing in her head learning the ways of men, understanding their sexual appetites. That's why she's able to take down Victor because she learned the ways, the sexual appetites of uh, men. So we don't, we don't see them having sex. We only see them in a bed, but he, but he is clearly satisfied with her. And that's enough for her to keep him on, on the hook. And then Bethesda gives herself power in setting up Victor and the interviewer. And so she restores, she was powerless when she was a child, taken and put into service, and Victor killing her parents, meaning killing her covering, um, her protection. She was powerless. She was powerless throughout the experience of being raped from, from 10 years old. But in strategizing under the weight of men, she gives herself power. And then she focused all of her attention on Victor and the interviewer. Writer-director restores Victor with personal power, especially in taking his life back. So when he makes the decision with the second boss uh, who, who wants to bring him into the fold, Victor says, I can't risk it. He's not going to do it. I can't risk it. And so that is his way of making a personal decision not to continue in the mob. Even if even if the language is still not there, he may be still searching for the exact language. But when he says to that mob boss, I can't risk it, uh, that to me begins like um, uh, the stages towards him exiting that this setback of choosing to become a mob enforcer as a child. Writer-director restores power to women and their plight in the film. Not all the women, but maybe Bethesda stands for all the women in the film when she is the one who sets up Victor and kills him in the end. So it's like, if you think about uh, Bethesda as all of the women standing behind her, all of the women in the film who were abused, standing behind her and shooting that gun at the same time. Uh, holding her up, holding her arm up and shooting a gun. And so the writer-director ends on the woman as powerful, um, shockingly, and uh, shooting her aggressor. All right, so this is the last stage of setback, advance. To advance is to move forward in a purposeful way and make or cause progress. Advancing is a forward and continuous movement. So did Victor advance? Did Bethesda advance? Does the writer, the director advance any other character? So Victor advances his understanding about the mob business, but not in keeping his life. So of course, uh, uh, he attended Sergey's university in a sense, right? And so he advances his understanding about the mob business so much to the point that he uses many of the tools that he learned with Sergey to kind of infiltrate um, the second mob business, uh, find out where that Rafa the snitch was, bring him to that second mob boss, and then carry on from there. So, so it's like, what he learned with um, Sergey was really more, uh, more or less theory and practice. But then, uh, apart from Sergey leaving the University of Sergey, he he sort of implemented and applied that understanding in a new environment. And so that does represent some kind of advance based upon your initial development, how you endured, and then how you overcame. And then he loses access to family. So uh, this means that he can't advance. Once he is shot in the chest and he dies, he, he, there is no advancement after that. But uh, Bethesda advances in understanding, but not in keeping her life, meaning that um, she advances in understanding about the ways of men, but she doesn't really uh, keep her life because she leaves herself without a family. 
for herself or for her child. She's going to be the mother of her son, but it's, it's, it's going to be, I believe, a strained existence because she's going to show this tape to her son about her father. And so this is going to poison her son uh, against a father who is dead. So her life is not going to be as um, peaceful as she is suggesting. Writer director advances the plot using setbacks. So throughout the film, uh, this is the strategy of the writer director is to advance by using setback. That's why we see the 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 character um, Victor going back and forth in flashback, or we see us uh, um, Victor outlining his work as a mob enforcer and then returning to the interviewer or we see sort of like the uh, the change from light to dark, right? So the, so the writer director is advancing the plot using setback. Writer director advances the plot by having Bethesda overcome her setback. So that is important that, that, you know, it is important. I don't really agree with her shooting Victor in the end because it's not a good idea to take vengeance, but to see her in a powerful position from, from the way we get her uh, sitting on the floor on her knees with Victor holding the gun to her head to her then uh, as an adult standing in front of the camera uh, shooting Victor and you know all dolled up a dolled up with her hair done and, and, and nice dress or whatever and in a powerful position does seem to sort of help us to see how she overcame her setback and uh, and overcoming her setback is by way of learning the uh, the dictates of men, the uh, ways of men. So now that we have finished applying the seven stages of setback, let's look at a, a special consideration. So the reason why I want to focus on attachment is actually due to Sergey. Sergey is the one who uses the word attachment when referring to uh, Victor and basically suggesting that he doesn't have any uh, attachment. Um, so Sergey's perception of Victor's attachment, Victor's insecure attachment, and then Victor's pursuit of secure attachment. So remember, Victor grows up in a toxic family dynamic, so it's insecure. You can tell it's insecure because his whatever is going on in that family, he's blank faced about it. Uh, he makes he doesn't make an emotional decision uh, when he goes and chooses to become a mob enforcer. He just looks at his father and he says, I don't want to become that, essentially. And so he makes a logical decision. So that's a really insecure attachment. But when he reframes himself as an outsider and says enough to the men in the kitchen, that is uh, his pursuit of se uh, secure attachment. Uh, when he engages with uh, Bethesda uh, initially feeling sort of conflicted with it, but then she gets pregnant and he feels even more conflicted with it and almost kills her, but decides against it. That is his way of pursuing secure attachment. Then you see the other characters, you know, who uh, who chose to become mob enforcers, uh, but then uh, basically want to get out of it. That is their way of moving or transitioning from insecure to secure attachment. So let's look at attachment theory. So what is attachment theory? Attachment theory is a psychology, evolutionary and ethological theory that characterizes the relationships caregivers, caregivers have to their infants particularly when caregivers are responsive to the needs of infants. Attachment theory was formulated by John Bowlby, a psychiatrist and psychoanalyst who characterized attachment as reflected in infant behavior, seeking proximity to an attachment figure during stressful times. Bowlby argued that infants become attached to sensitive and responsive adults, Infants use caregivers as a secure base from which they can explore and return. So just consider a sort of uh, a living room in a house and, and the parent is sitting on the couch and the baby uh, wiggles 
out of the mother's lap and decides to crawl against the room. What what you might see with the baby is the mother is a secure base. So the baby will crawl so many steps or so many crawls and then turn and sit on his bottom and look at the mother or look at the father or look at the caregiver, right? Like the caregiver could be a nanny or something like that. And then, um, and then once he feels, once the baby, the infant feels uh, secure enough and knows that the mother is there or the caregiver is there or the father is there, he turns back around and continues to crawl again. And he does this, the infant does this multiple times, uh, stopping, turning, stopping, turning, stopping, turning. And then uh, uh, during stressful times, the infant knows it can crawl to the caregiver, the mother or the father, and the mother and father will be responsive by uh, picking the baby up or, or um, you know, giving the baby a bottle or giving the baby uh, the breast or just uh, holding the baby, rocking the baby. That's responsiveness. So attachment theory is based on that. So developmental psychologist Mary Ainsworth's 1960s to 1970s research on secure base forms our understanding of, uh, of attachment patterns. Ainsworth introduced the concept of secure base to, to study attachment patterns in infants, which include the following. So there's secure attachment, then there is insecure attachment, anxious uh, ambivalent, and then insecure attachment, anxious avoidant. In the 1980s, the theory was later extended to adult attachment. Now, now these are not the only categories of uh, attachment. Uh, it's always a standard of secure or insecure, but there may be other types of extensions uh, or subcategories that are different from anxious uh, ambivalent or anxious avoided. So all you basically have to do is type in the term as a keyword search attachment theory, and you will see different types of attachment uh, patterns. So here's secure attachment characteristics. Uh, a securely attached child exhibits the following characteristics. So explores surroundings with enthusiasm, checking back with secure base, mother, father, or caregiver, engages with stranger if caregiver is nearby, cries when caregiver leaves the room, but is happy to reunite when caregiver returns. Then behavior, develop sense of security to cope with problems and adapt to unfamiliar situations. Parents of a securely attached child are responsive and sensitive. Infants have positive close relationships with parents, caregivers. The child is both comfortable and confident. Now, if you think about um, um, Victor, all throughout his toxic family dynamic, you know, I find it's very interesting that he stands behind the door while um, Sergey is beating his father and the mother is pleading with Sergey not to beat his father, right? And that he doesn't open the door. And then he only comes through the door, he opens the door and walks through it once Sergey and his other foot soldier leaves. And then, um, and then he walks past his mother and uh, his father on the, on the floor while she appeals to him to help. And so there is no secure attachment. Um, that means he has no positive or close relationship with his parent or caregiver. Uh, he doesn't feel like his parents would be responsive and sensitive to him. So therefore, he's not going to be responsive and sensitive towards them. Uh, whether they leave or not, it's, it's Victor who actually leaves the family. So the family doesn't even leave uh, him. And then when his father is assassinated and killed, he's not, there's nothing on the inside of him that cries out, I, my father is gone, right? So we know that Victor does not exhibit secure attachment. So uh, types of attachment, insecure, anxious, ambivalent. So an insecurely attached child exhibits the following characteristics. So expresses distress when strangers nearby or in unfamiliar settings, whether the caregiver is present or not. 
exhibits extreme anxiety, distress when the parent departs, often resistant to, re to reuniting when the parent returns. And then behavior, parents respond to the child on their uh, own parent schedule. So, you know, you might think that Franco is actually an insecure uh, child. You you will, you would say that he's more secure because his parent because trafficking doesn't kill him, right? When he messes up that drug deal, but he's also a little insecure because he 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 is able to express distress when he says his papa I've been hit. He calls out his name, Papa. I've been hit, and so he expresses distress. He ex he exhibit exhibits uh, extreme anxiety. Uh, but he's not necessarily resistant to re to reuniting when the parent returns. But because he's not really sorry for his mistake, he it it can be interpreted as him uh, resistant to reuniting, meaning that uh, he's not willing to still go the right way. And then uh, parents respond to the child on their own parent schedule. So we don't see uh, Victor's mom having a conversation with Victor only when uh, the father is beaten by Sergey and he's on the, on the ground and Victor walks past him and the mother is saying, help your father. But, but we don't see her coming into his room and having a conversation with him. We don't see him see uh, her dressing him, laying out his clothes. You know, Victor as an adult lays out his clothes. Where did he learn that? He didn't learn it from his parents, right? But somehow he, he, he learned to lay out his clothes, but we don't see the mother doing that. So we know that, that this is uh, an, um, an um, insecure, anxious, ambivalent, but I don't think Victor is really anxious and ambivalent because he doesn't express distress. He doesn't express distress as, as the other characters do. So I then believe that Victor is anxious avoidant. So an insecurely attached child exhibits the following characteristics. Infants show little behavior indicating interest in the adults in the room, regardless of adult present. Avoid or ignore parents and primary caregivers, whether strangers are nearby or not. Strangers are not treated any differently than parents or primary caregivers. So the behavior infants studied lack effect, meaning that um, the conclusions of a study revealed that many infants lack um, mood or, or response in terms of emotional effect. Infants do not believe that the adults in their lives will respond to their distresses. And children believe that communicating their needs is futile and makes no difference. So we see this illustrated and, and, and exhibited in Victor. That's why I believe he is an insecure attachment type, anxious, avoided, because it doesn't make any, he doesn't feel like it makes any difference to go in and tell his family or his mother and father, I'm hurting. I'm a child uh, living within a toxic family environment where I continue to hear my father beat my mother, beat you mom, and I'm stressed. I'm distressed about that. But the only way that I can handle it is to basically lie down in the bed, turn, so turn in such a way, um, turn over in the bed as, in such a way that I don't, I don't really hear it as what I'm hearing it. And so then my only option, I, the only option I'm going to give myself is, is to essentially join, join the mob as a child, right? So that's why I feel like he's more anxious avoided. So Sergey's perception of Victor's attachment, it is Sergey who mentions attachment referring to Victor's behavior and attitude towards being a natural born killer. Sergey says that Victor has no attachment, but Victor pulls out the Romanian bill Sergey first gave him as a child, child, which suggests that Victor had an attachment to Sergey. And then since Sergey believed that Victor had no attachment, it made it possible to attempt to kill, saying that he had no choice but to do it. And so, uh, uh, the people in the film really have Victor uh, wrong. They think they truly know Victor. The only person in the film who knows Victor is the one who has spent time with him sexually, learning the way, learning his ways, right? And that is Bethesda. 
because she knows him so well to the point that he lets down his guard so low that he doesn't see the shot coming. But it is Sergey that I thought that was interesting that he's saying that uh, he's saying that Victor has no attachment, but but never really on never realized that he kept that same bill, and he really wouldn't know that he kept that same bill. But it's also interesting that Victor never told him that he kept that bill either. Victor's insecure attachment, so Victor is insecurely attached to his toxic home environment, his parents, and to his immediate childhood environment. When Sergey beats his father, Victor does not intervene. Victor listens to his father beat his mother, and he still does not intervene. Instead of going to school, he, he decides to become a mob enforcer. Although he considers Alexei, Marku, and Cesar as friends, it has been 20 years since he has last seen them. So it's interesting that he doesn't know that they are part of the uh, mob enforcing group, right? That it isn't until they come and hunt for him and sell him out 20 years later that he realizes that uh, they are part of, um, that they are also mob enforcers. Throughout the relationship, Victor struggles with insecure attachment to Bethesda, wanting to kill her, but cannot because she is carrying his child. So we're looking at his insecure uh, attachment. And then now let's look at his pursuit of secure attachment. So Victor's desire to get out of the mob business represents his pursuit of secure attachment. Victor's desire to stay with Bethesda and, and embrace their child represents his pursuit of secure attachment because he believes he could be the father that his father wasn't to him. He even says to the interviewer that I will be a good one. And Victor's desire to let the journalist flee and permit Alexi to remain with his family represents his pursuit of secure attachment. Seeing that there is value in family and relationships despite the toxicity of his background. And that's why I say that that he is making a transition in the film from uh, insecure to secure attachment, but he's not going to be able to make good on that desire uh, because Bethesda is actually going to kill him. So, conclusion, what can we learn from Victor's setbacks? What can we learn from Sergei's setbacks? What can we learn from the interviewer's setbacks? And then what can we learn from Bethesda's setbacks? So Victor, what, what we can learn from Victor's setback is, is that, that that initial choice uh, to join the mob when he really wasn't pushed or pulled to join the mob is the one that, uh, is his uh, ultimate undoing. No matter what he decides to do throughout the film and towards the end, he cannot get away from that one choice. And basically that one choice comes back around to haunt, uh, uh, to haunt him. And he comes full circle when um, it is Bethesda who is holding him at gunpoint and then essentially shooting him. So whereas he wouldn't shoot Bethesda, even though he pulled the trigger and Sergey stopped him, there was there was more uh, enthusiasm or um, eagerness on his part to shoot her father and shoot the mother without much thought or consideration. But there was um, um, he was holding himself back when he was in the process of pulling the trigger to shoot um, Bethesda. So. That that one decision to join the mob and uh, basically to shoot her family and not shoot her uh, came back around when he was an adult and she's now turning the tables on him and shooting him. What can we learn from Sergey's setback? Sergey is weak. He's he's um, not as discipline or strong he's more disciplined than franco but he he is what trafficking says he is he does what he is told he's a foot soldier and that alone is a setback because there is no ambition in him of course right there isn't anything in him there's no sort of moral code and it it, w it would be difficult to have a moral code in a way within this um particular mob dynamic 
but somewhere Sergei gave up. We don't have the narrative history of Sergei in terms of when he joined to become a mob enforcer, but we do see um, sort of like uh, the pattern of him lowering his head, not feeling much into the whole environment, right? Um, the only time that we see him active really is when he's training Victor. And it's almost like, it's almost like Victor comes at the right time for him so that he doesn't have to be as engaged anymore like he had to be prior to Victor coming. What can we learn from the interviewer setback? The interviewer is just really clueless in a sense that why would any hitman desire to have an interview with you? Whatever the reasoning behind you wanting to do the interview, why would a, hit, a hitman come out of hiding or come out of the shadows and say, I want to be interviewed and I want to tell everybody about why I chose to be a hitman and what I've done. That's exposure. That's legal and criminal exposure. And so the fact that the interviewer didn't think beyond the few minutes of his desire to want to interview this person, and his desire wasn't based on interviewing him. His desire was based upon wanting to regain his reputation. Well, he set himself up to fail, essentially, right? And so I think that was the major setback for him. Everything else is gravy, right? But that was the major setback, not thinking logically about the fact that someone is contacting me to be interviewed and the person is a hitman. It's not like the person is a politician or something. And then what can we learn from Bethesda's setbacks? So Bethesda is... Um, to me, Bethesda really loses in the end. As much as she takes her power back, and as much as the writer-director gives her power to take back, she's really the one who loses in the end because she could have had a family. Uh, she, knew, she knows that Victor is in love with her because she says it. Why do all of this make you fall in love with me, uh, et cetera? And so she knows that he is in love with her and that she w that he would protect her, right? He is proving his loyalty towards her in killing the interviewer. And so her major setback is not really regaining a family unit, right? That when she kills him, She's going to keep the unborn child, but she's going to also poison her son against uh, his father, which is then going to really turn her son against him. And she can't really understand that right now because the child is unborn and maybe she's uh, refusing to develop a emotional connection to the son. But once she births that baby, once that baby is out in the free world, uh, it's completely different. Uh, the mindset. And then once she is raising that child, especially a boy who's not going to have a father figure, um, uh, she will begin to uh, rethink her particular um, choice in killing Victor. She can't see that right now because she's looking at Victor through the lens of vengeance. So her major setback is in strategizing to take vengeance, but also in leaving herself and her son without a family unit. All right, so the reference here is uh, theories of attachment. So if you're interested in attachment theory, you can always um, use this as a reference, but you can always type in attachment theory as a keyword search and find out any additional references. All right, so hopefully you were able to gain some insight from this lecture. Uh, please like, subscribe, and visit. Like the video, subscribe to the channel. You can visit my website, um, reginawhyfavors.com. You can always send me an email. Uh, please purchase the book when it comes out. It's going to come out approximately uh, August 2021. I needed to make some changes to it and do some final editing. So the book title is Overcoming Setback, Five Keys for Entering and Exiting Correction. Thank you for listening to this audio. Have a great day.